Section Zero of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Penny Witt. Voiceover with P. Dot com. Modern Magic by Maximilian Schiele de Vere. Preface. The main purpose of our existence on earth, aside from the sacred and paramount duty of securing our salvation, is undoubtedly to make ourselves master of the tangible world around us, as it stands revealed to our senses and as it was expressly made subject to our will by the Creator. We are, however, at the same time, not left without information about the existence of certain laws and the occurrence of certain phenomena which belong to a world not accessible to us by any means of our ordinary senses and which yet affects seriously our intercourse with nature and our personal welfare this knowledge we obtain sometimes by special favor as direct revelation and at other times, for reasons as yet unknown, at the expense of our health and much suffering. By whatever means it may reach us, it cannot be rejected. To treat it with ridicule or to decline examining it would be as unwise as unprofitable. The least that we can do is to ascertain the precise nature of these laws and, after stripping these phenomena of all that can be proved to be merely incidental or delusive, to compare them with each other, and to arrange them carefully according to some standard of classification. The main interest in such a task lies in the discovery of the grain of truth, which is often found concealed in a mass of rubbish, and which, when thus brought to light, serves to enlarge our knowledge and to increase our power. The difficulty lies in the absence of all scientific investigation and in the innate tendency of man to give way, wantonly or unconsciously, to mental as well as sensual delusion. The aim of this little work is, therefore, limited to the gathering of such facts and phenomena as may serve to throw light upon the nature of the magic powers with which man is undoubtedly endowed. Its end will be attained if it succeeds in showing that he actually does possess powers which are not subject to the general laws of nature, but more or less independent of space and time, and which yet make themselves known partly by appeals to the ordinary senses and partly by a peculiar phenomena, the result of their activity. These higher powers, operating exclusively through the spirit of man, are part of his nature, which has much in common with that of the deity. Since he was created by God, quote, in his own image, end quote, and the Lord, Quote, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. End quote. This soul is not, as materialists maintain, merely the sum of all perceptions obtained by the collective activity of bodily organs, a conclusion which would finally make it the product of mere material atoms, subject to constant physical and chemical changes. Even if it were possible, which we deny, to reduce our whole inner life, including memory, imagination, and reason, to a system of purely physical laws, and thus to admit its destruction at the moment of death, there would still remain the living soul, coming directly from the Most High, and destined to continue throughout eternity. This soul is, hence, independent of time. Nor is it bound by space, except so far as it can commune with the outer world only by means of the body, with which it is united in this life. The nature of this union is a mystery as yet unfathomable. 
but precisely because it is such a mystery, we have no right to assume that it is altogether indissoluble during life, or that it ceases entirely at the moment of death. There is, on the contrary, overwhelming evidence that the soul may, at times, act independently of the body, and the forces developed on such occasions we have, for the sake of convenience rather than on account of the special fitness of the term, preferred to call magic powers. There is no evidence whatever before us as to the mutual relations of soul and body after death. Here, necessarily, all must be mere speculation. Nothing more, therefore, will be claimed for the following suggestions. When the body becomes unfit to serve any longer as an abode and an instrument to the soul, the tie which was formed before or at the moment of birth is gradually loosened. The soul no longer receives impressions from the outer world such as the body heretofore conveyed to it, and with this cessation of mutual action ends also a community of sensation. The living soul, in all probability, becomes conscious of its separation from the dead body and from the world. It continues to exist, but in loneliness and self-dependence. Its life, however, becomes only the more active and the more self-conscious as it is no longer consumed by intercourse with the world nor disturbed by bodily disorders and infirmities. The soul recalls with ease all long forgotten or much dimmed sensations. What it feels most deeply at first is, we may presume, the double grief at being separated from the body, with which it has so long been closely connected, and at the sins it has committed during life. This repentance will be naturally all the heartier, as it is no longer interrupted by sensual impressions. After a while, this grief, like all sorrows, begins to moderate, and the soul returns to a state of peace. Sooner, of course, in the case of persons who in their earthly life already had secured peace by the only means revealed to man, later by those who had given themselves entirely up to the world and their passions. At the same time, the living soul enters into communion with other souls, retaining, however, its individuality in sex, character, and temper, and possibly proceeds on a course of gradual purification till it reaches the desired heaven in perfect reconciliation with God. During this intermediate time, there is nothing known to us which would absolutely forbid the idea that these living souls continue to maintain some kind of intercourse with the souls of men on earth with whom they share all that constitutes their essential nature, save only the one fact of bondage to the body. Nor is there any reason why the soul in a man should not be able, by its higher powers, to perceive and to consort with souls detached from mortal bodies, although this intercourse most needs be limited and imperfect because of the vast difference between a free soul and one bound to an earthly, sinful body. For man, when he dies, leaves behind in this world the body, dead and powerless, a corpse. He continues, however, to live a soul, with all the peculiar powers which make up our spiritual organism. That is to say, the true man, in the higher sense of the word, exists still, though he dwell in another world. This soul has now no longer earthly organs of sense to do its bidding, but it still controls nature which was made subject to its will. It has, moreover, a new set of powers which represent in the higher world its higher body, and the character of its new active life will be all the more elevated as these organs are more spiritual. 
men cannot but continue to develop, to grow, and to ripen in the next world as he did in this. His nature and his destiny are alike incompatible with sudden transitions and with absolute rest. The soul must become purer and more useful, its organs more subtle and more powerful. And it is of this life of gradual improvement and purification that we may occasionally obtain glimpses by that communion which no doubt still exists between earthbound souls and souls freed from such bondage. There are, it is well known, many theologians who sternly deny any such further development of man's spiritual part and insist upon looking at this life as the only time of probation accorded to him, at the end of which immediate and eternal judgment is rendered. Their views are entitled to the utmost consideration and respect, but different opinions are entertained by some of their brethren, not less eminent in piety, profound learning, and critical acume, and hence at least equally deserving of being attentively listened to and carefully regarded. So it is also with the belief in the possibility of holding intercourse with disembodied spirits. Superficial observers are ready to doubt or to deny, to sneer haughtily or to scoff contemptuously. But men of great eminence from time immemorial treated the question with great attention and deep interest. Melanchthon wrote, Quote, I have myself seen ghosts and know many trustworthy people who affirm that they have not only seen them, but even carried on conversations with them. End quote. D. Nima Recognin Wit Emb, 1595, page 317. And Luther said nearly the same. Calvin and Knox also expressed similar convictions. A faith which has lasted through all ages of man's history and has such supporters cannot but have some foundation and deserves full investigation. Alchemy, with its visionary hopes, contained nevertheless the germ of modern chemistry, and astrology taught already much that constitutes the astronomy of our day. The same is no doubt the case with modern magic, and here also we may safely expect to find that, quote, out of darkness cometh light, end quote. End of section zero. Recording by Penny Witt. Voiceover with P dot com. End of modern magic by Maximilian Schiel de Vere. Section 1 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heather Eney. Modern Magic by Maximilian Schiel de Vere. Witchcraft. Witchcraft is an illegitimate miracle. A miracle is legitimate witchcraft. Jacob Burma. Perhaps in no direction has the human mind ever shown greater weakness than in the opinions entertained of witchcraft. If Hecate, the oldest patroness of witches, wandered about at night with a gruesome following and frightened lovers at their stealthy meeting or lonely wanderers on open heaths and in dark forests, her appearance was at least in keeping with the whole system of Greek mythology. Tacitus does not frighten us by telling us that witches used to meet at salt springs, nor the Edda when speaking of the bearers of witches' kettles, against whom even the Salic law warns all good Christians. But when the Council of Ancyra in the 5th century fulminates its edicts against women riding at night upon weird animals in company with Diana and Herodias, the strange combination of names and the dread penalties threatened make us almost think of witches as real and most marvelous beings. 
and when wise counselors of french parliaments and grey dignitaries of the holy german empire sit in judgment over a handful of poor old women when great english bishops and zealous new england divines condemn little children to death because they have made pacts with the devil attended his sabbaths and bewitched their peaceful neighbors then we stand amazed at the delusions to which the wisest and the best among us are liable christianity it is true shed for a time such a bright light over the earth that the works of darkness were abhorred and the power of the evil one seemed to be broken according to the sacred promises that the seed of woman should bruise the serpent's head thus charlemagne in his fierce edict issued after the defeat of the saxons ordered that death should be inflicted on all who after pagan manner gave way to devilish delusions and believed that men or women could be witches persecuted and killed them or even went so far as to consume their flesh and give it to others for like purposes but almost at the same time the belief in the devil distinctly maintained in holy writ spread far and wide and as early as the fourth century diseases were ascribed not to organic causes but to demoniac influences and the devil was once more seen bodily walking to and fro on the earth accompanied by a host of smaller demons it was but rarely that a truly enlightened man dared to combat the universal superstition thus agobard archbishop of lyons shines like a bright star on the dark sky of the ninth century by his open denunciation of all belief in possession in the control of the weather or the decision of difficulties by ordeal for like reasons we ought to revere the memory of john of salisbury who in the twelfth century declared the stories of knightly assemblies of witches with all their attending circumstances to be mere delusions of poor women and simple men who fancied they saw bodily what existed only in their imagination the church hesitated now requiring her children to believe in a devil and demons and now denouncing all faith in supernatural beings the thirteenth century by leibniz called the darkest of all developed the worship of the evil one to its fullest perfection the writings of st augustine were quoted as confirming the fact that demons and men could and did intermarry and the jinns of the east were mentioned as spirits who sought the daughters of men for wives the first trace of a witch's dance is found in the records of a fearful auto da fe held in toulouse in the year thirteen fifty three and about a century later the dominican monk jacquier published the first complete work on witches and witchcraft he represented them as organized after the prevailing fashion of the day in a regular guild with apprentices companions and masters who practised a special art for a definite purpose it is certainly most remarkable that the same opinion in all its details has been entertained in this century even and by one of the most famous german philosophers eschenmayer while the zeal and madness of devil worshippers were growing on one side persecution became more violent and cruel on the other side till the trials of witches assumed gigantic proportions and the proceedings were carried on according to a regular method these trials originated invariably with theologians and although the system was not begun by the papal government it obtained soon the pope's legal sanction by the famous bull of innocent the eighth sumus desiradantes dated december four fourteen eighty four and decreeing the relentless persecution of all heretical witches the far-famed malleus malefactum written by the two celebrated judges of witches sprenger and gremper and full of the most extraordinary views and statements reduced the whole to a regular method and obtained a vast influence over the minds of that age 
the rules and forms it prescribed were not only observed in almost all parts of christendom but actually retained their force and legality till the end of the seventeenth century nor were these views and practices confined to catholic countries a hundred and fifty years after the reformation a great german jurist and protestant Karpzan, published his praxis criminalis in which precisely the same opinions were taught and the same measures were prescribed the puritans it is well known pursued a similar plan and the new world has not been more fortunate in avoiding these errors than the old world a curious feature in the above-mentioned works is the fact that both abound in expressions of hatred against the female sex and still more curious though disgraceful in the extreme that the special animosity shown by judges of witchcraft against women is solely based upon the weight which they attached to the purport of the mosaic inhibition thou shalt not suffer a witch to live these are dark pages in the history of christendom blackened by the smoke of funeral piles and stained with the blood of countless victims of cruel superstition for here the peculiarity was that in the majority of cases not the humble sufferers whose lives were sacrificed but the haughty judges were the true criminals the madness seems to have been contagious for protestant authorities were as bloodthirsty as catholics the inquisition waged for generations unceasing war against this new class of heretics among the nations of the romanic race germany saw great numbers sacrificed in a short space of time and in sober england even three thousand lost their lives during the long parliament alone while according to barrington the whole number who perished amounted to not less than thirty thousand if only few were sacrificed in new england the exception was due more to the sparse population than to moderation in south america on the contrary the persecution was carried on with relentless cruelty and all this happened while fierce war was raging on almost everywhere so that while the sword destroyed the men the fire consumed the women occasionally most startling contrasts would be exhibited by different governments in the north james i claiming to be as wise as solomon and more learned than any man in christendom imagined that he was persecuted by the evil one on account of his great religious zeal and saw in every catholic an instrument of his adversary his wild fancy was cunningly encouraged by those who profited by his tyranny and catholics were represented as being one and all given up to the devil the mass and witchcraft the three unholy allies opposed to the trinity in the south the republic of venice with all its petty tyranny and proverbial political cruelty stood almost alone in all christendom as opposed to persecutions of wizards and witches and fought the battle manfully on the side of enlightenment and christian charity the horrors of witch trials soon reached a height which makes us blush for humanity the accused were tortured till they confessed their guilt so that they might lose not only life upon earth but also hope for eternity if under torture they declared themselves innocent but ready to confess their guilt and to die they were told that in such a case they would die with a falsehood on their lips and thus forfeit salvation some of the sufferers were found to have a stigma on their bodies a place where the nerves had been paralyzed and no pain was consequently felt this was a sure sign of their being witches and they were forthwith burnt if they had no such stigma the judge decided that the devil marked only his doubtful adherents and left his trusty followers unmarked the terror became so great that in the seventeenth century repentant witches abounded because it had become customary merely to hang or to decapitate those who confessed while all others were burned alive hundreds suffering of painful diseases or succumbing to unbearable privations 
forthwith fancied themselves bewitched or actually sought relief from the ills of this life by voluntarily appearing before the numerous tribunals for the trial of witchcraft the minds of men were so thoroughly blinded that even when husbands testified the impossibility of their wives having attended the witch's sabbath because they had been lying all night by their side in bed they were told and quite ready to believe that a phantom had taken the place of their absent wives in one of the most famous trials five women confessed after suffering unspeakable torture that they had disinterred an infant the child of one of their number and supped upon it with the devil the father of the child persevered till the grave was opened and behold the child's body was there unharmed but the judges declared it to be a phantom sent by the evil one since the confession of the criminals was worth more than mere ocular proof and the women were burnt accordingly the most signal proof of the absurdity of all such charges was obtained in our own country here the number of those who complained of being plagued and injured by demoniac agencies became larger in precise proportion as trials increased and condemnations succeeded but when nineteen of the accused had been executed and the judges becoming appalled at the daily growing number of complaints set some of the prisoners free and declined to arrest others there was suddenly an end of these grievances no more accounts of enchantment and witchcraft were heard and soon the evil disappeared entirely it was a similar return to reason which at last led in europe also to a reaction the doge of venice and the great council appealed to the pope leo x to put a curb upon the intemperate zeal of his ministers and he saw himself forced to check the merciless persecution occasionally voices had been raised already before that public appeal condemning such wholesale slaughter among these were men like bacon of verulam reginald scotus and marvel of marvels two famous jesuits tanner and spee and yet even these merciful and enlightened men never for a moment doubted the genuineness of witchcraft and its fatal effects father spee a most learned man writing against the ceaseless persecutions of pretended witches nevertheless declared in sixteen thirty one in his renowned cautio criminalis by far the best work written on that side of the question that there are in the world some few wizards and enchanters which could not be denied by any body without frivolity and great ignorance and even bale while condemning the cruelty of witches trials seriously proposes to punish witches for their ill will vade the well-known librarian of cardinal mazarin wrote an able work as an apology of all the great men who had been suspected of witchcraft including even clemens v sylvester the second and other popes and a renowned capuchin monk d'autun pursued the same subject with infinite subtlety of thought and great happiness of diction in his l'incrédulité savante et la crédulité ignorante a witch was however still condemned to be burned in sixteen ninety eight in germany fortunately the judge a distinguished jurist of the university of hall was remonstrated with by an esteemed colleague and thus induced to examine himself as well as the whole grievous subject with unsparing candor this led him to see clearly the error involved in trials of witchcraft and he wrote in seventeen o one a most valuable and influential work against the crime of magic he succeeded especially in destroying the enormous prestige heretofore enjoyed by del rio's great work disquisitions magicae the favorite handbook of judges of all lands which was even adopted though from the pen of a jesuit by the protestants of germany 
In no case, however, were the personal existence of the devil and his activity upon earth denied by these writers. On the contrary, it is well known that Luther, Melanchthon, and even Calvin continued always to speak of Satan as having a corporeal existence and as being perceptible to human senses. The negation contended for applied only to his direct agency in the physical world. His moral influence was ever readily admitted. Sporadic cases of witchcraft and their trial by high courts of justice have continued to occur down to our day. Maria Theresa was the first peremptorily to forbid any further persecutions on account of beneficium, as it had become the fashion to call the acts of magic by which men or beasts were said to be injured. There are, however, writers who maintain in this century, and in our generation even, the direct agency of the devil in daily life and see in demoniac sufferings the punishment of the wicked in this life already. The question of how much truth there may have been in this belief in witchcraft, held by so many nations and persevered in during so many centuries, has never yet been fully answered. It is hardly to be presumed that during this long period all men, even the wisest and subtlest, should have been completely blinded or utterly demented. Many historians as well as philosophers have looked upon witchcraft as a mere creation of the Inquisition. Rome, they argue, was in great danger. She had no new dogma to proclaim which would give food to inquiring minds and increase the prestige of her power. She was growing unpopular in many countries heretofore considered most faithful and submissive, and she was engaged in various dangerous conflicts with the secular powers. In this embarrassment, her inquisitors looked around for some means of escape, and thought a remedy might be found in this new combination of the two traditional crimes of heresy and enchantment. Witchcraft as a crime because of the deeds of violence with which it was almost invariably associated belonged before the tribunal of the secular judge. As a sin, it was to be punished by the bishop, but as heresy it fell, according to the custom of the day, to share of neither judge nor bishop, but into the hands of the Inquisition. The extreme uniformity of witchcraft from the Tagus to the Vistula, and in New England as in Old England, is adduced as an additional evidence of its having been manufactured by the Inquisition. Nothing is gained, however, by looking upon it as a mere invention, nor would such an explanation apply to the wizards and witches who are repeatedly mentioned and condemned in Holy Writ. Witchcraft was nearly purely artificial, a mere delusion, nor can it be accounted for upon a purely natural basis. The essential part in it is the magic force, which does not belong to the natural but to the spiritual part of a man. Hence it is not so very surprising, as many authors have thought it, that thousands of poor women should have done their best to obtain visions which only led to imprisonment, torture, and death by fire, while they procured for them apparently neither comfort nor wealth, but only pain, horror, and disgrace. For there was a mixed up with all this a sensation of pleasure, vague and wild though it was in conformity with the rude and coarse habits of the age. It is the same with the opium eater and hashish smoker, only in a more moderate manner. The delight these pernicious drugs afford is not seen, but the disease, the suffering, and the wretched death they produce are visible enough. The stories of witches' sabbaths taking place on certain days of the year arose no doubt from the fact that the prevailing superstition of the times regarded some seasons as peculiarly favorable for the ceremony of anointing one's self with narcotic salves, and this led to a kind of spiritual community on such nights, which to the poor deluded people appeared as a real meeting at appointed places. In like manner, there was nothing absolutely absurd or impossible in the idea of a compact with the devil. 
Satan presented himself to the minds of men in those ages as the bodily incarnation of all that is evil and sinful, and hence, when they fancied they made a league with him, they only aroused the evil principle within themselves to its fullest energy and activity. It was in fact the selfish, covetous nature of man ever in arms against moral laws and the commandments of God, which in these cases became distinctly visible and presented itself in the form of a vision. This evil principle, now relieved from all constraint and able to develop its power against a feebly resisting soul, would naturally destroy the poor deluded victim in body and in spirit. Hence the trials of witchcraft had at least some justification, however unwise their form and however atrocious their abuses. The majority of the crimes with which the so-called witches were charged were no doubt imaginary, but many of the accused had also taken real delight in their evil practices and in the grievous injury they had done to those they hated or envied. Nor must it be forgotten that the age in which these trials mainly occurred was emphatically an age of superstition. From the prince on his throne to the clown in his hut, everybody learnt and practiced some kind of magic. The ablest statesmen and the subtlest philosophers, the wisest divines and the most learned physicians, all were more or less adepts of the black art, and many among them became eminently dangerous to their fellow beings. Others, ceaselessly meditating and brooding over charms and demoniac influences, finally came to believe in their own powers of enchantment and confessed their guilt, although they had sinned only by volition, without ever being able really to call forth and command magic powers. Still, others labored under a regular panic and saw witchcraft in the simplest events as well as in all more unusual phenomena in nature. A violent tempest, a sudden hailstorm, or an unusual rise in rivers, all were at once attributed to magic influences, and the authorities urged and importuned to prevent a recurrence with all its disastrous consequences by punishing the guilty authors. Has not the same insane fury been frequently shown in contagious diseases when the common people believed their fountains poisoned and their daily bread infected by Jews or other suspected classes? and promptly took justice into their own hands? It ought also to be borne in mind as an apology for the horrible crimes committed by judges and priests in condemning witches, that in their eyes the crime was too enormous and the danger too pressing and universal to admit of delay in investigation or mercy in judgment. The severe laws of those semi-barbarous times were immediately applied and all means considered fair in eliciting the truth. Torture was by no means limited to trials of witches, for some of the greatest statesmen and the most exalted divines had alike to endure its terrors. Moreover, no age has been entirely free from similar delusions although the form under which they appear and the power by which they may be supported differ naturally according to the spirit of the times. Science alone cannot protect us against fanaticism if the heart is once led astray, and fearful crimes have been committed not only in the name of liberty, but even under the sanction of the cross. Basil the Great already restored a slave ad integrum, who said he had made a pact with the devil, but the first authentic account of such a transaction occurs in connection with an imperial officer, Theophilus of Adana, in the days of Justinian. His bishop had undeservedly humiliated him, and thus aroused in the heart of the naturally meek man intense wrath and a boundless desire of revenge. While he was in this state of uncontrollable excitement, a Jew appeared and offered to procure for him all he wanted if he would pledge his soul to Satan. 
The unhappy man consented, and was at once led to the circus where he saw a great number of torch-bearers in white robes, the costume of servants of the church, and Satan seated in the midst of the assembly. He obeyed the order to renounce Christ and certified his apostasy in a written document. The next day already the bishop repented of his injustice and restored Theophilus in his office, whereupon the Jew pointed out to him how promptly his master had come to his assistance. Still, repentance comes to Theophilus also, and in a new revelation the virgin appears to the despairing man after incessant prayer of forty days and forty nights, a fit preparation for such a vision. She directs him to perform certain atoning ceremonies and promises him restoration to his Christian privileges, which he finally obtains by finding the certificate of his apostasy lying on his breast, and then he dies in a state of happy relief. After that, similar cases of a league being made with Satan occur quite frequently in the history of saints and eminent men till the belief in its efficacy gradually died out and recent efforts like those recorded by Goer have proved utterly fruitless. Among the magic phenomena connected with witchcraft, none is more curious than the so-called witch's sabbath, the formal meeting of all who are in league with Satan, for the purpose of swearing allegiance to him to enjoy unholy delights and to introduce neophytes. That no such meeting ever really took place need hardly be stated. The so-called Sabbaths were somnambulistic visions, appearing to poor deluded creatures while in a state of trance, which they had produced by narcotic ointments, vile decoctions, or even mere mental effort. For the most skillful among the witches could cause themselves to fall into the witch's sleep, as they called this trance, whenever they chose. Others had to submit to tedious and often abominable ceremonies. The knowledge of simples, which was then very general, was of great service to cunning impostors. Thus it was well known that certain herbs like aconite produce in sleep the sensation of flying, and they were, of course, diligently employed. Hyosiamus and Taxus, Hypericum and Asaphotida were great favorites, and physicians made experiments with these salves to try their effect upon the system. Laguna, for instance, physician to Pope Julius III, once applied an ointment which he had obtained from a wizard to a woman who thereupon fell into a sleep of thirty-six hours' duration, and upon being aroused, bitterly complained of his cruelty in tearing her from the embraces of her husband. The Marquis d'Agen tells us in his Lettre Juif that the celebrated Gassendi discovered a drug which a shepherd used to take whenever he wished to go to a witch's assembly. He won the man's confidence and, pretending to join him in his journey, persuaded him to swallow the medicine in his presence. After a few minutes the shepherd began to stagger like an intoxicated person and then fell into a profound sleep, during which he talked wildly. When he roused himself again many hours afterwards, he congratulated the physician on the good reception he had met at Satan's court, and recalled with delight the pleasant things they had jointly seen and enjoyed. The symptoms of the witch's sleep differ, however. While the latter is, in some cases, deep and unbroken, in other cases, the sleepers become rigid and icy cold, or they are subject to violent spasms and utter unnatural sounds in abundance. The sleep differs, moreover, from that of possessed people in the consciousness of bodily pain which bewitched people retain while the possessed become insensible. Invariably, the impression is produced that they meet kindred spirits at some great assembly, but the manner of reaching it differs greatly. Some go on foot, but as Aberus already rode on a spear given to him by Apollo, others ride on goats. In Germany, a broomstick, a club, or a distaff became suitable vehicles, provided they had been properly anointed. 
In Scotland and Sweden, the chimney is the favorite road. In other countries, no such preference is shown over doors and windows. The expedition, however joyous it may be, is always very fatiguing, and when the revelers awake, they feel like people who have been dissipated. The meetings differ in locality according to size. Whole provinces assemble on high, isolated mountains, among which the Brocken in the Hartz Mountains is by far the most renowned. Smaller companies meet near gloomy churches or under dark trees with wide-spreading branches. In the north of Europe, the favorite resort is the Blue Mountain, popularly known as Blokula in Sweden and as Blakala in Norway an isolated rock in the sea between Smoland and Åland, which seems to have had some association in the minds of the people with the ancient sea goddess Blakehill. In Italy, the witches loved to assemble under the famous walnut tree near Benevent, which was already to the Longobards an object of superstitious veneration, since here, in ancient times, the old divinities were worshipped, and afterwards the Stry were fond of meeting. In France, they had a favorite resort on the Puy de Dome near Clermont, and in Spain on the sands near Seville, where the Hechizeras held their Sabbaths. The Hecla of Iceland also passes with the Scandinavians for a great meeting place of witches, although, strangely enough, the inhabitants of the island have no such tradition. It is, however, clear that in all countries where witchcraft prospered, the favorite places of meetings were always the same as those to which, in ancient times, the heathens had made pilgrimages in large numbers in order to perform their sacrifices and to enjoy their merrymakings. In precisely the same manner, the favorite seasons for these ghastly meetings correspond almost invariably with the times of high festivals held in heathen days, and hence they were generally adopted by the early Christians with the feast and saints' days of Christendom. Thus the old Germans observed, when they were still pagans, the first of May for two reasons. As a day of solemn judgment— and as a day for rejoicing, during which prince and peasant joined in celebrating the return of summer with merry songs and gay dances around the maypole. The witches were nothing loath to adopt the day for their own festivities also, and added it to the holidays of St. John the Baptist and St. Bartholomew, on which, in like manner, anciently the holding of public courts had brought together large assemblies. The meetings, however, must always fall upon a Thursday from a determined, though yet unexplained, association of witchcraft with the old German god of thunder, Donar, who was worshipped on the Blocksburg, and to whom a goat was sacrificed. Whence also the peculiar fondness of witches for that animal. The hours of meeting are invariably from eleven o'clock at night to one or two in the morning. The assembly consists, according to circumstances, of a few hundred or of several thousands, but the female sex always largely prevails. For this fact, the famous textbook of judges of witchcraft, the Malleus, assigned not less than four weighty reasons. Women, it said, are more apt to be addicted to the fearful crime than men, because, in the first place, they are more credulous. Secondly, in their natural weakness, they are more susceptible. Thirdly, they are more imprudent and rash, and hence always ready to consult the devil. And fourthly and mainly, femina comes from fe, faith, and minus, less. Hence, they have less faith. The guests appear generally in their natural form, but at times they are represented as assuming the shape of various animals. The devil's followers have a decided preference for goats and for monkeys, although the latter is a passion of more recent date. The crowd is naturally in a state of incessant flowing and ebbing, the constant coming and going, crowding and pressing admits of not a moment's quiet, and even here it is proven that the wicked have neither rest nor peace. Among this crowd, flocks are seen, consisting of toads and watched over by boys and girls. 
In the center sits Satan on a stone, draped in weird majesty with terrible but indistinct features, and uttering short commands with an appalling voice of unnatural and unheard-of music. A queen in great splendor may sit by his side, promoted to the throne from a place among the guests, Countless demons attending to all kinds of extraordinary duties surround their master, or dash through the crowd, scattering indecent words and gestures in all directions. English witches meet also innumerable kittens on the Sabbath and show the scars of wounds inflicted by the malicious animals. Every visitor must pay his homage to the lord of the feast, which is done in an unmentionable manner, and yet they receive nothing in return, according to their unanimous confessions, except unfulfilled promises and delusive presents. Even the dishes on the table are but shams. There is neither salt nor bread to be found there. They are bound, besides, to pledge themselves to the performance of a certain number of wicked works, which are distributed over the week, so that the first days are devoted to ordinary sins and the last to crimes of special horror. Music of surpassing weirdness is heard on all sides, and countless couples whirl about in restless, obscene dances, the couples joining back to back and trying in vain to see each other's faces. Very often, young children are brought up by their mothers to be presented to the master. When this is done, they are set to attend the flocks of toads till the ninth year, when they are called up by the queen to abjure their Christian faith and are regularly enrolled among witches. The description of minor details vary, of course, according to the individual dispositions of the accused, whose confessions are invariably uniform as to the facts stated heretofore. The coarser minds naturally see nothing but the grossest indecency and the vilest indulgences, while to more refined minds the apparent occurrences appear in a light of greater delicacy. They hear sweet music and witness nothing but gentle affection and brotherly love. But in all cases, these witches' sabbaths become a passion with the poor, deluded creatures. They enjoy there a paradise of delight, whether they really indulge in sensual pleasure or surrender mind and will so completely to the unhallowed power that they cease to wish for anything else and are plunged into vague, unspeakable pleasure. And yet not even the simple satisfaction of good looks is granted them. Witches are as ugly as angels are fair. They emit an evil odor and inspire others with unconquerable repugnance. How exclusively all these descriptions of witches' sabbaths have their origin in the imagination of the deluded women is seen from the fact that they vary consistently with the prevailing notions of those by whom they are entertained. With coarse peasants, the meetings are rude feasts full of obscene enjoyments. With noble knights, they become the rovings of the wild huntsmen, or a hellish court under the guise of a Venus mountain. With ascetic monks and nuns, a subterranean convent filled with vile blasphemies of God and the saints. This only is common to all such visions, that they are always conceived in a spirit of bitter antagonism to the church. All the doctrines, not only but also the ceremonies of the latter, are here travestied. The Sabbath has its masses, but the host is desecrated, its holy water obtained from the lord of the feast, its host and its candles are black, and the ait missa est of the dismissing priest is changed into go to the devil. Here also confession is required, but the penitent confesses, having omitted to do evil and being guilty of occasional acts of mercy and goodness. The penalty imposed is to neglect one or the other of the Twelve Commandments. 
When witches were brought to trial, one of the first measures was to search for special marks which were believed to betray their true character. These were especially the so-called witches' moles, spots of the size of a pea, on which for some reason or other the nerves had lost their sensibility, and where, in consequence, no pain was felt. These were supposed to have been formed by being punctured, the evil one performing the operation with a pin of false gold with his claws or his horns. Other evidences were found in the peculiar coloring of the eyes, which was said to represent the feet of toads. In the absence of tears, when the little gland had been injured, and above all, in the specific lightness of the body. In order to ascertain the latter, the accused were bound hand and foot crosswise, tied loosely to a rope, and then three times dropped into the water. If they remained floating, their guilt was established, for either they had been endowed by their master with safety from drowning, or the water refused to receive them because they had abjured their baptism. It need not be added that the executioners soon found out ways to let their prisoners float or sink as they chose, for a consideration. Witches' trials began in the earliest days of Christianity, for the Emperor Valens ordered, as we learned from Ammianus Marcellinus, all the wizards and enchanters to be held to account who had endeavored by magic art to ascertain his successor. Several thousands were accused of witchcraft, but the charge was then as in almost every later age, in most cases nothing more than a pretext for proceedings against obnoxious persons. The next monster process, as it began to be called already in those early days, was the persecution of witches in France under the Merovingians. The child of Chilperic's wife had died suddenly and under suspicious circumstances, which led to the imprisonment of a prefect, Mumulus, whom the queen had long pursued with her hatred. He was accused of having caused her son's death by his charms and was subjected to fearful tortures in company with a number of old women. Still, he confessed nothing but that the latter had furnished him with certain drugs and ointments which were to secure him the favor of the king and the queen. A later trial of this kind, in which for a time calm reason made a firm stand against superstition, but finally succumbed ingloriously, is known as the Vaudoisie and took place in Arras in 1459. It was begun by a Count de Stamp, but was mainly conducted by a bishop and some eminent divines of his acquaintance, whose inordinate zeal and merciless cruelty have secured to the proceedings a peculiarly painful memory in the annals of the church. A large number of perfectly innocent men and women were tortured and disgracefully executed, but fortunately the death of the main persecutor, Dublas, made a sudden end to the existence of witchcraft in that province. One of the most remarkable trials of this kind was caused by a number of little children and led to most bloody proceedings. It seems that in the year 1669, several boys and girls in the parish of Mora, one of the most beautiful parts of the Swedish province of Dalarne, and famous through the memory of Gustavus Vasa and Gustavus III, were affected by a nervous fever which left them, after their partial recovery, in a state of extreme irritability and sensitiveness. They fell into fainting fits and had convulsions, symptoms which the simple but superstitious mountaineers gradually began to think inexplicable, and hence to ascribe to magic influences. The report spread that the poor children were bewitched, and soon all the usual details of satanic possession were current. The mountain called Blacula, in bad repute from old, was pointed out as the meeting place of the witches, where the annual Sabbath was celebrated, and these children were devoted to Satan. Church and state combined to bring their great power to bear on the poor little ones. 
an enormous number of women, mostly the mothers of the young people, were involved in the charges, and finally 52 of the latter with 15 children were publicly executed as witches, while 50 of the younger were condemned to severe punishment. More than 300 unfortunate children under 14 had made detailed confessions of the witches' Sabbath and the ceremonies attending their initiation into its mysteries. A similar fearful delusion took hold of German children in Württemberg when towards the end of the 17th century a large number of little boys and girls, none of whom were older than 10 years, began to state that they were every night fetched away and carried to the witches' Sabbath. Many were all the time fast asleep and could easily be roused, but a few among them fell regularly into a trance, during which their little bodies became cold and rigid. A commission of great judges and experienced divines was sent to the village to investigate the matter, and found at last that there was no imposture attempted, but that the poor children firmly believed what they stated. It became, however, evident that a few among them had listened to old women's tales about witches with eager ears, and with inflamed imaginations retailed the accounts to others, till a deep and painful nervous excitement took hold of their minds and rapidly spread through the community. Many of the children were, as was natural at their age, led by vanity to say that they had also been at the Sabbath, while others were afraid to deny what was so positively stated by their companions. Fortunately, the commission consisted for once of sensible men who took the right view of the matter, ordered a good whipping here and there, and thus saved the land from the crime of another witch's trial. Our own experiences in New England at the time when Sir William Phipps was governor of the colonies have been forcibly reported by the great Cotton Mather. Nearly every community had its young men and women who were addicted to the practices of magic. They loved to perform enchantments, to consult sieves and turning keys, and thus were gradually led to attempt more serious and more dangerous practices. In Salem, men and women of high standing and unimpeached integrity, even pious members of the church were suddenly plagued and tortured by unknown agencies, and at last a little black and yellow demon appeared to them, accompanied by a number of companions with human faces. These apparitions presented to them a book which they were summoned to sign or at least to touch and if they refused, they were fearfully twisted and turned about, pricked with pins, burnt as if with hot irons, bound hand and foot with invisible fetters, and carried away to great distances. Some were left unable to touch food or drink for many days. Others, attempting to defend themselves against the demon, snatched a distaff or tore a piece of cloth from them, and immediately these proofs of the real existence of the evil spirits became visible to the eyes of the bystanders. The magic phenomena attended the disease were of the most extraordinary character. Several men stated that they had received poison because they had declined to worship Satan, and immediately all the usual sequences of such treatment appeared, from simple vomiting to most fearful suffering, till counteracting remedies were employed and began to take effect. In other cases, the sufferers complained of burning rags being stuffed into their mouths, and although nothing was seen, burnt places and blisters appeared and the odor and smoke of smoldering rags began to fill the room. When they reported that they were branded with hot irons, the marks showed themselves, separation took place, and scars were formed which never again disappeared during life, and all these phenomena were watched by the eager eyes of hundreds. The authorities, of course, took hold of the matter, and many persons of both sexes and all ages were brought to trial. While they were tortured, they continued to have visions of demoniac beings and possessed men and women. 
when they were standing blindfolded in court felt the approach of those by whom they pretended to be witches and plagued and urgently prayed to be delivered of their presence finally many were executed not a few undoubtedly against all justice but the better sense of the authorities soon saw the futility if not the wickedness of such proceedings and an end was made promptly witchcraft disappearing as soon as persecution relaxed and the sensation subsided similar trials have nevertheless continued to be held in various parts of europe during the whole of the last century and many innocent lives have been forfeited to this apparently ineradicable belief in witchcraft even after torture was abandoned in compliance with the wiser views of our age long imprisonment with its attending sufferings and great anxiety as to the issue proved fully sufficient to extort voluntary confessions which were of course of no value in themselves but served the purpose of keeping alive the popular superstition in seventeen twenty eight a specially fearful trial of this kind took place in hungary during which nearly all the disgraceful scenes of medieval barbarity were reenacted and which ended in a number of cruel executions the last witch's trial in germany took place in seventeen forty nine when the mother superior of a convent near Würzburg in bavaria known as emma renata was condemned to be burnt but by the leniency of authorities was allowed to die by decapitation switzerland was the scene of the last of these trials ever held for with this act of justice as it was called by the good people of glarus the persecution ended even in england however the feeling itself seems to have lingered long after actual trials had ceased thus it is well known that the terrible trial of witches held at marlborough under queen elizabeth led to the establishment of a so-called witches sermon to be delivered annually at huntington and this custom was faithfully observed down to the latter part of the eighteenth century nearly about the same time in seventeen forty three an earnest effort was made in scotland to kindle once more the fire of fierce persecution in the month of february of that year the associate presbytery in a public document addressed to the presbytery of the seceded churches required for certain purposes a solemn acknowledgment of former sins and a vow to renounce them for ever among these sins that austere body enumerated the abolition of the death penalty for witchcraft since the latter was forbidden in holy writ and the leniency which had taken the place of the former severity in punishing this crime had given an opening to satan to tempt and actually seduce others by means of the same old accursed and dangerous snares end of section one recording by heather eney Section 2 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. Modern Magic by Maximilian Schell de Ver. Chapter Two, Part One, Black and White Magic. Peace, the charms wound up. Macbeth. The most startling of all scenes described in Holy Writ, as far as they represent incidents in human life, is, no doubt, the mysterious interview between unfortunate King Saul and the spirit of his former patron, the prophet Samuel. The poor monarch, abandoned by his friends and forsaken by his own heart, turns in his utter wretchedness to those whom he had but shortly before put out of the land, those godless people who, 
had familiar spirits and the wizards hard pressed by the ancient enemy of his people the philistine and unable to obtain an answer from the great god of his fathers he stoops to consult a witch a woman it seems that sedekla the daughter of the decem diabete for so philo calls her according to de Musils, had escaped by her cunning from the fate of her weird sisters and having a familiar spirit foretold the future to curious inquirers at her dwelling in endor at first she is unwilling to incur the penalty threatened in the king's decree but when the disguised monarch with a voice of authority promises her impunity she consents to bring up samuel as soon as the fearful phantom of the dread prophet appears she becomes instinctively aware of the true character of her visitor and far more afraid of the power of the living than of the appearance of the departed she cries out trembling why hast thou deceived me thou art saul then follows the appalling scene in which samuel reproves the miserable self-despairing king and foretells his death and that of his sons there can be no doubt that we have here before us an instance of genuine magic the woman was evidently capable of casting herself into a state of ecstasy in which she could at once look back into the past and forward into the future thus she beholds the great prophet not sent by god from on high as the holy fathers generally taught but according to the then prevailing belief rising from sheol the place of departed spirits and then she utters unconsciously his own words for it must not be overlooked that samuel makes no revelations but only repeats his former warnings saul learns absolutely nothing new from him he only hears the same threatenings which the prophet had pronounced twice before when the reckless king had dared to sacrifice unto god with his own hand first samuel thirteen and when he had failed to smite the amalekite as he was bidden possessed as it were by the spirit of the living samuel the woman speaks as he had spoken in his lifetime and it is only when her state of exaltation renders her capable of looking into the future also that she assumes the part of a prophetess herself and foretells the approaching doom of her royal visitor that the whole dread scene was foreordained and could take place only by the will of the almighty alters nothing in the character of the woman with the familiar spirit it is a clear case of necromancy or conjuring up of the spirits of departed persons such as has been practised among men from time immemorial among the chosen people of god persons were found from the beginning of their history who had familiar spirits and moses already fulminates his severest anathemas against these wizards leviticus twenty twenty seven they appear under various aspects as charmers as consulters of familiar spirits as wizards or as necromancers deuteronomy eighteen eleven they are charged with passing their children through the fire with observing times astrologers with using enchantments or they are said in a general way to use witchcraft 
Second Chronicles 33, 6. That other nations were not less familiar with the art of evoking spirits. We see, for instance, in the Odyssey, which mentions numerous cases of such intercourse with another world, and speaks of necromancers as forming a kind of close guild. In the Perseus of Aeschylus, the spirit of Darius, father of Xerxes, is called up and foretells all the misfortunes that are to befall poor Queen Atossa. The greatest among the stern Romans could not entirely shake off the belief in such magic, in spite of the matter-of-fact tendencies of the Roman mind and the vast superiority of their intelligence. A Cato and a Sulla, a Caesar and a Vespasian, all admitted, with clear, unfailing perception, the small grains of truth that lay concealed among the mass of rubbish then called magic. Even Christian theology has never absolutely denied the existence of such extraordinary powers over the spirits of the departed, although it has consistently attributed them to diabolic influences. In this point lies the main difference between ancient and modern magic. For the oldest magi whom we know were the wise men of Persia, called, from Ma, great, Mug, the great men of the land. They were the philosophers of their day, and if we believe the impartial evidence of Greek writers, not generally apt to overestimate the merits of other nations, they were possessed of vast and varied information. Their aim was the loftiest ever conceived by human ambition. It was, in fact, nothing less than the erection of an intellectual Tower of Babel. They devoted the labors of a lifetime and the full, well-trained vigor of their intelligence to the study of the forces of nature and the true character of all created beings. Among the latter, they included disembodied spirits, as well as those still bound up with bodies made of earth, considering with a wisdom and boldness of conception never yet surpassed, both classes as one and the same eternal creation. The knowledge thus acquired, they were, moreover, not disposed merely to store away in their memory, or to record in unattractive manuscripts. They were men of the world as well as philosophers, and looked for practical results. Here, the pagan spirit shone forth unrestrained, the end and aim of all their restless labors was power. Their ambition was to control, by the superior prestige of their knowledge, not only the mechanical forces of nature, but also the lesser capacities of other created beings, and finally fate itself. Truly, a lofty and noble aim, if we view it, as in equity we are bound to do, from their standpoint, as men, possessing, with all the wisdom of the earth, as yet not a particle of revealed religion. It was only at a much later period that a distinction was made between white magic and black magic. This arose from the error which gradually overspread the minds of men, that such extraordinary powers, based originally only upon extraordinary knowledge, were not naturally given to men, but could only be obtained by the special favor of higher beings, with whom the owner must needs enter into a perilous league. If these were benevolent deities, 
The results obtained by their assistance were called white magic. If they were gods of ill repute, they granted the power to perform feats of black magic, acts of wickedness, and crimes. Christianity, though it abolished the gods of paganism, maintained, nevertheless, the belief in extraordinary powers accorded by supernatural beings, and the same distinction continued to be made. Pious men and women performed miracles by the aid of angels and saints. Wicked sinners did as much by an unholy league with the evil one. The Egyptian charmer of Apulegus, who declared that no miracle was too difficult for his art, since he exercised the blind power of deities who were subject to his will, only expressed what the Iazzarone of Naples feels in our day, when he whips his saint with a bundle of reeds in order to compel him to do his bidding. Magicians did not change their doctrine. They hardly even modified their ceremonies. Their allegiance only was transferred from Jupiter to Jehovah, even as the same column that once bore the great thunderer on Olympus is now crowned by a statue of Peter Boanerges. Nor has the race of magicians ever entirely died out. We find enough notices in classic authors, whose evidence is unimpeachable, to know that the Greeks were apt scholars of the ancient magi and transferred the knowledge they had thus obtained, and long jealously guarded, to the priests of Egypt, who in their turn became the masters of the two mightiest nations on earth. First Moses sat at their feet, till, at the age of forty, he, quote, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, end quote and could successfully cope with their magicians and sorcerers. Then the land of the Nile fell into the hands of the Romans, and poverty and neglect drove the wise men of Egypt to seek refuge in the capital of the world, where they either lived upon the minor arts and cunning tricks of their false fate, or being converted to Christianity, infected the pure faith with their ill-applied knowledge. Certain portions of true magic survived through all persecutions and revolutions. Some precious secrets were preserved by the philosophers of later ages, and have, if we believe the statements made by trustworthy writers of every century, ever since continued into possession of Freemasons and Rosicrucians. Others became mixed up with vile superstitions and impious practices, and only exist now as the black art of so-called magicians and witches. Wherever magic found a fertile soil among the people, it became a science, handed down from father to son, and such we find it still in the East Indies and the Orient generally, when it fell into the hands of skeptics, or weak, feeble-minded men, it degenerated with amazing speed into imposture and common jugglery. What is evident about magic is the well-established fact that its ceremonies, forms, and all other accessories are almost infinite in variety, since they are merely accidental vehicles for the will of man, and real magicians know very well that the importance of such external aids is not only overrated, but altogether fallacious. The sole purpose of the burning of perfumes, of imposing ceremonies and awe-inspiring procedures, 
is to aid in producing the two conditions which are indispensable for all magic phenomena. The magician must be excited till his condition is one resembling mental intoxication, or becomes a genuine trance. And the passive subject must be made susceptible to the control of the superior mind. For it need not be added that the latter will all the more readily be affected, the feebler his will, and the more imperfect his mental vision may be by nature, or may have been rendered by training and careful preparation. Hence it is that the magic table of the dervish, the enchanted drum of the shaman, the medicine bag of the Indian, are all used for precisely the same purpose as the ring of Hecate, the divining rod and the magic wand of the enchanter. Legend and amulet, mummy and wax figure, herb and stone, drug and elixir, incense and ointment, are all but the means which the strong will of the gifted master uses in order to influence and finally to control the weaker mind. Thus, powerful perfumes, narcotic odors, and anesthetic salves are employed to produce enervation and often actual and complete loss of self-control. In other cases, the neophyte has to turn round and round within the magic circle, from east to west, till he becomes giddy and utterly exhausted. It is very curious to observe how, as far as these preparations go, in the most distant countries and among the most different forms of society, the same means are employed for the same purpose. The whirling dance of the fanatic dervish is perfectly analogous to the wild raving of our Indian medicine man, who ties himself with a rope to a post, and then whirls around it in fierce fury. Thus also, the oldest magicians speak with profound reverence of the powers of a little herb known to botanists as Hypericum Perforatum L. And behold, in the year 1860, a German author of eminence, Justinus Kerner, still taught seriously that the leaves of that plant were the best means to banish evil spirits. Mandrake and Elder have held their own in the false faith of nations from the oldest times to our day, and even now Germans, as well as slaves, love to plant the latter everywhere in their graveyards, as suggestive of the realm of spirits. White magic, though strictly forbidden by the church in all ages, seems, nevertheless, to have had irresistible attractions for wise and learned men of every country. This charm it owes to the many elements of truth which are mixed up with the final error, for it aims at a thorough understanding of the mysteries of nature, and so far its purpose is legitimate and very tempting to superior minds, but only in order to obtain by such knowledge a power which holy writ expressly denies to man. When it prescribes the study of nature as being the outer temple of God and represents all the parts of this vast edifice, from the central sun of the universe to the minutest living creation as bound up by a common sympathy, no objection can be made to its doctrines, and even the greatest minds may fairly enroll themselves here as its pupils. But when it ascribes to this sympathy an active power, 
and attributes the secret names of the deity, to certain natural products, or to mechanically regulated combinations of the stars, a peculiar and supernatural effect, it sinks into contemptible superstition. Hence, the constant aim of all white magic, the successful summoning of superior spirits, for the purpose of learning from them what is purposely kept concealed from the mind of man, has never yet been reached. For it is sin, the same sin that craved to eat from the tree of knowledge. Hence also, no beneficial end has ever yet been obtained by the practices of magic, although wise and learned men of every age have spent their lives and risked the salvation of their souls in restless efforts to lift the veil of Isis. Black magic, the Kishof of the Hebrews, avows openly its purpose of forming a league with evil spirits in order to attain selfish ends, which are invariably fatal to others. And yet it is exactly here that we meet with great numbers of well-authenticated cases of success, which preclude all doubt and force us to admit the occasional efficiency of such sinful alliances. The art flourishes naturally best among the lowest races of mankind, where gross ignorance is allied with blind faith, and the absence of inspiration leaves the mind in natural darkness. We cannot help being struck here also with the fact that the means employed for such purposes have been the same in almost all ages. Readers of classic writers are familiar with the drum of Sibel. The Laplanders have from time immemorial, had the same drum, on which heaven, hell, and earth are painted in bright colors, and reproduce in pictorial writing the letters of the modern spiritualist. A ring is placed upon the tightly stretched skin, which slight blows with a hammer cause to vibrate, and according to the apparently erratic motions of the ring over the varied figures of gods, men, and beasts, the future is revealed. The consulting savage lies on his knees, and as the pendulum between our fingers and the pencil of planchette in our hand write apparently at haphazard, but in reality under the pressure of our muscles, acting through the unconscious influence of our will. So here also the beats of the hammer only seem to be fortuitous, but in reality are guided by the ecstatic owner. For already Olaf Magnus, History Goth L3, Chapter 26, tells us that the incessant beating of the drum and the wild, exulting singing of the magician for hours before the actual ceremony begins cause him to fall into a state of exaltation without which he would be unable to see the future. That the drum is a mere accident in the ceremony was strikingly proved by a Laplander who delivered up his instrument of witchcraft to the pious missionary, Ternias, by whom he had been converted, and who soon came to complain that even without his drum he could not help seeing hidden things, an assertion which he proved by reciting to the amazed minister all the minute details of his recent journey. Who can help? while reading of these savage magicians, recalling the familiar ring and drumstick 
in the left hand of the Roman Isis. Statues with a drum above the head, or the rarely missing ring and hammer, in the hands of the Egyptian Isis. It need hardly be added that the Indians of our continent have practiced the art with more or less success from the day of discovery to our own times. Already, Wafer, in his Description of the Isthmus of Darien, 1699, describes how Indian sorcerers, after careful preparation, were able to inform him of a number of future events, every one of which came to pass in the succeeding days. The Prince of Neuwied again met a famous medicine man among the Crea Indians, whose prophecies were readily accepted by the whites, even, and of whose power he witnessed unmistakable evidence. Bonduel, a well-known and generally perfectly trustworthy writer, affirms, from personal knowledge, that among the Menominees, the medicine men not only practice magic, but are able to produce most astounding results. After beating their drum, Bonduel used to hear a heavy fall and a faint inarticulate voice, whereupon the tent of the charmer, though fifteen feet high, rose in the air and inclined first on one and then on the other side. This was the time of the interview between the medicine man and the evil spirit. Small, doll-like figures of men also were used, barely two inches long, and tied to medicine bags. They served mainly to inflame women with loving ardor, and when efficient, could drive the poor creatures to pursue their beloved for days and nights through the wild forests. Other missionaries also affirm that these medicine men must have been able to read the signs and perhaps to feel in advance the effects of the weather with amazing accuracy, since they frequently engaged to procure storms for special purposes and never failed. It is interesting to notice that according to the unanimous testimony of all writers on Indian affairs, these medicine men almost invariably find a violent and wretched death. It is not without interest to recall that the prevailing forms of the magic of our day, as far as they consist of table moving, spirit rapping, and the like, have their origin among the natives of our continent. The earliest notice of these strange performances appeared in the great journal of Augsburg in Germany, Algemein Zeitung, where André mentioned their occurrence among Western Indians. Sargent gave us next a more detailed description of the manner in which many a wigwam or log cabin in Iowa became the scene of startling revelations by means of a clumsy table which hopped merrily about, or a half-drunk, red-skinned medium from whose lips fell uncouth words. Spicer, Lights and Sounds, page 190. It was only in 1847 that the famous Fox family brought these phenomena within the pale of civilization. Having rented a house in Hydeville, New York, already ill-reputed on account of mysterious noises, they reduced these knockings to a kind of system, and, by means of an alphabet, obtained the important information that they were the work of a spirit, and that his name was Charles Ray. Margaret Fox transplanted the wrappings to Rochester. Catherine, only twelve years old, to Auburn, 
and from these two central places the new magic spread rapidly throughout the Union. Opposition and persecutions served, as they are apt to do, only to increase the interest of the public. A Mrs. Norman Culver proved, it is true, that wrappings could easily be produced by certain muscular movements of the knee and the ankle, and a committee of investigation, of which Fenimore Cooper was a member, obtained ample evidence of such a method being used, but the faith of the believers was not shaken. The moving of tables, especially, furnished to their minds new evidence of the actual presence of spirits, and soon circles were established in nearly all the northern and western states formed by persons of education without regard to confession who called themselves spiritualists or spiritists, and their most favored associates, media. A number of men whose intelligence and candor were alike unimpeachable, became members of the new sect, among them a judge, a governor of a state, and a professor of chemistry. They organized societies and circles. They published journals and several works of interest and value, and produced results which more and more strengthened their convictions. The new art met, naturally, with much opposition, especially among the ministers and members of the different churches. Some of the opponents laughed at the whole as a clever jugglery, which deserved its great success on account of the smartness of the performers. Others denounced it as a heresy and a crime. The former, of course, saw in it nothing but the hand of man, while the latter admitted the agency of spirits, but of spirits from below and not from above. An amusing feature connected with public opinion on this subject was that when trade was prosperous and money abundant, spiritualism also flourished and found numerous adherents. But when business was slow, or a crisis took place, all minds turned away from the favorite pastime, and instinctively joined once more with the pious believers in the denunciation of the new magic. Thus, a kind of antagonism has gradually arisen between orthodox Christians and enthusiastic spiritualists. The controversy is carried on with great energy on both sides, and alas, to the eye of the general observer, magic is gaining ground every day. At least, its adherents increase steadily in numbers, and even in social weight. Tuttle, Arena of Nature Not long ago, the National Convention of Spiritualists at their great meeting at Rochester, New York, August 1868, laid down 19 fundamental principles of their new creed. Their doctrines are based upon the fact that we are constantly surrounded by an invisible host of spirits who desire to help us in returning once more to the Father of all things, the Great Spirit. Modern magic met with the same opposition in Europe. The French Academy, claiming, as usually, to be supreme authority in all matters of science, declined, nevertheless, to decide the question. Arago, who read the official report before the august body, closed with the words, I do not believe a word of it but his colleagues remembered, perhaps, that their predecessors had once or twice before committed themselves grievously. Had not the same academy pronounced 
against the use of quinine and vaccination, against lightning rods and steam engines. Had not Reamur suppressed Pisonel's essay on corals, because he thought it was madness to maintain their animal nature. Had not his learned brethren decreed, in 1802, that there were no meteors, although a short time later two thousand fell in one department alone. And had they not, more recently still, received the news of ether being useful as an anesthetic, with scorn and unanimous condemnation. Perhaps they recalled Dr. Hare's assertion that our own society for the advancement of useful knowledge had, in 1855, refused to hear a report on spiritualism, preferring to discuss the important question, why do roosters always crow between midnight and one o'clock? At all events, they heard the report and remained silent. In the same manner, Alexander von Humboldt refused to examine the question. This indifference did not, however, check the growth of spiritualism in France, but its followers divided into two parties. Spiritualists, under Reveil, who called himself Allan Kardec, and spiritists under Pierre. The former died in 1869 after having seen his Livre de l'Esprit reappear in fifteen editions. To seal his mission, he sent, immediately after his death, his spirit to inform his eager pupils, who crowded round the dead body of their leader, of his first impressions in the spirit world. If the style is the man, the style c'est l'homme, no one could doubt that it was his spirit who spoke. Perhaps the most estimable high priest of this branch of modern magic is a well-known professor of Geneva, Rosinger, a physician of great renown and much beloved by all who know him. He is, however, a rock of offense to American spiritualists because he has ever remained firmly attached to his religious faith and admits no spiritual revelations as genuine which do not entirely harmonize with the doctrines of Christ and the statements of the Bible. Unfortunately, this leads him to believe that his favorite medium, a young lady enjoying the mystic name of Libna, speaks under the direct inspiration of God himself. In England, the new magic has not only numerous, but also influential adherents, like Lord Lytton and the Darwinian Wallace, papers like the Star and journals like the Cornhill Magazine support it with ability, and names like Home in former years, and Newton in our day, who not only reveal secrets, but actually heal the sick, have given a new prestige to the young science. The works of Howitt and Dr. Ashburner, of Mrs. Morgan and Mrs. Crossland, have treated the subject under various aspects, and in the year 1871, Crooks, a well-known chemist, investigated the phenomena of Holmes' revelations by means of an apparatus specially devised for the purpose. The result was the conviction that if not spiritual, they were at least not produced by any power now known to science. Quarterly Journal of Science, July 1871. In Germany, the new magic has been far less popular than elsewhere, but in return it has been there most thoroughly investigated. Men of great eminence in science and in philosophy have published extensive works on the subject, which are, however, more remarkable for zeal and industry 
than for acute judgment. Gerster, in Regensburg, claimed to have invented the psychography, but Zapari in Paris and Kohnfeld in Berlin discovered at the same time the curious instrument known to us as planchette. The most practical measure taken in Germany for the purpose of ascertaining the truth was probably the formation of a society for spirit studies, which met for the first time in Dresden in 1869, and purposes to obtain an insight into those laws of nature which are reported to make it possible to hold direct and constant intercourse with the world of spirits. Here, as in the whole tendency of this branch of magic, we see the workings not merely of idle curiosity, but of that ardent longing after a knowledge of the future and a certainty of personal eternity which dwells in the hearts of all men. The phenomena of modern magic were first imperfect wrappings against the wall, the legs of a table or a chair, accompanied by the motion of tables. Then followed spirit writing by the aid of a psychograph or a simple pencil, and finally came direct spirit writings, drawings by the media, together with musical and poetical inspirations, the whole reaching a climax in spirit photographs, the ringing of bells, the dancing of detached hands in the air, the raising up of the entire body of a man, and the musical performances without human aid were only accomplished in a few cases by specially favored individuals. Two facts alone are fully established in connection with all these phenomena. One, that some of the latter, at least, are not produced by the ordinary forces of nature, and the other, that the performers are generally, in the medium always, in a more or less complete state of trance. In this condition, they forget themselves, give their mind up entirely into the hands of others, the media, and candidly believe they see and hear what they are told by the latter is taking place in their presence. Hence also the well-established fact that the spirits have never yet revealed a single secret, nor ever made known to us anything really new. Their style is invariably the same as that in which ecstatic and somnambulistic persons are apt to speak. A famous German spiritualist, Hornung, whose faith was well known, once laid his hands upon his planchette, together with his wife, and then asked if there really was a world of spirits. To the utter astonishment of all present, the psychograph replied no and when questioned again and again, became troublesome. The fact was simply that the would-be magician's wife did not believe in spirits, and as hers was the stronger will, the answer came from her mind, and not from her husband's. On the other hand, it cannot be denied that media, most frequently delicate women of high nervous sensibility, and almost always leading lives of constant and wearying excitement, become, on such occasions, wrought up to a degree which resembles somnambulism, and may really enable them, occasionally, in a state of clairvoyance, to see what is hidden to others. It is they who are vitalized as they call it, and not the knocking table or the writing planchette, and hence arises the necessity of a medium for all such communications. That there are no spirits at work in these phenomena requires hardly to be stated. 
even the most ardent and enthusiastic adherents of the new magic cannot deny that no original revelation concerning the world of spirits has yet been made but that all that is told is but an echo of the more or less familiar views of men it is far more interesting to notice with coleman the electric and hygroscopic condition of the atmosphere which has evidently much to do with such exhibitions the visions of hands arms and heads which move about in the air and may occasionally even be felt are either mere hallucinations or real objective appearances due to a peculiar condition of the air and favorably interpreted by the predisposed mind hence also our own continent is for its superior dryness of atmosphere much more favorable to the development of such phenomena than that of europe spiritualists in the old as in the new world are hopeful that the new magic will produce a new universal religion in a better social order in this direction however no substantial success has yet been obtained outsiders had expected that at least an intercourse with departed spirits might be secured and thus the immortality of man might be practically demonstrated but this also has not yet been done what then can we learn from modern magic only this that there are evidently forces in nature with whose character and precise intent we are not yet acquainted and which yet deserve to be studied and carefully analyzed modern magic exhibits certain phenomena in man which are not subject to the known laws of nature and thus proves that man possesses certain powers which he fails or does not know how to exert in ordinary life where these powers appear in consequence of special preparation or an exceptional condition of mind they are comparatively worthless because they are in such cases merely the result of physical or mental disease and we can hope to profit only by powers employed by sound men but where these powers become manifest by spontaneous action apparently as the result of special endowment they deserve careful study in all the respect due to a new and unknown branch of knowledge nor must it be overlooked that although modern magic as a science is new most of the phenomena upon which it is based were well known to the oldest nations the chinese who seem to have possessed all the knowledge of mankind ages before it could be useful to them or to others and to have lost it as soon as there was a call for it had centuries ago not only moving tables but even writing spirits their modern planchette is a small board which they let float upon the water with the legs upward they rest their hands upon the ladder and watch the gyrations it makes in the water or they hold a small basket with a camel's hair brush attached to one end suspended over a table upon which they have strewn a layer of flour the brush begins to move through the flower and to draw characters in it which they interpret according to their alphabet the priests of buddha in mongolia also have long since employed moving tables and for a good purpose usually to detect thieves the lama 
who is appealed to for the purpose, sits down before a small, four-legged table, upon which he rests his hands, whilst reading a book of devotion. After perhaps half an hour, he rises, and as he does so, holding his hand steadily upon the table, the table also rises and follows his hand, which he raises till hand and table are both level with his eyes. Then the priest advances, the table precedes him, and soon begins to move at such a rate that it seems to fly through the air, and the lama can hardly follow. Sometimes it falls down upon the very spot where the stolen goods are hidden. At other times, it only indicates the direction in which they are to be sought for, and not unfrequently it refuses altogether to move, in which event the priest abandons the case as hopeless. Nord Bien, April 27, 1853 here also it is evident that the table is not the controlling agent, but the will of the lama, whom it obeys by one of those mysterious powers, which we call magic. It is the same force which acts in the divining rod, the pendulum, and similar phenomena. The name of medium is an American invention and is based upon the assumption that only a few favored persons are able to enter into direct communication with spirits, who may then convey the revelations they receive to others. They are generally children and young persons, but among grown men also certain constitutions seem to be better adapted to such purposes than others. In almost all cases, it has been observed that the electric condition of the medium is a feature of greatest importance. The more electricity he possesses, the better is he able to produce magic phenomena, and when his supply is exhausted by a long session, his power also ceases. Hence, perhaps, the peculiar qualification of children while, on the other hand, the fact that they not unfrequently are able to answer questions in languages of which they are ignorant proves that they also do not themselves give the reply, but only receive it from the questioner and state it as it exists in the mind of the latter. Hence also the utter absurdity of so-called spirit paintings and still worse, of poetical effusions like Mr. Harris's Lyric of the Golden Age, in eleven thousand four hundred and thirty wretched verses. For what the circle does not know, individually or collectively, the medium also is not able to produce. This truth is made still more evident by the latest phenomena developed in spiritualistic circles, the so-called trance-speaking, which may be heard occasionally in New York circles, and which requires no interposition of a medium. For here also we are struck by the utter absence of usefulness in all these revelations. The inspired believers speak, they recite poetry, but it remains literally vox et preteria nihil, and we are forcibly reminded of the words of Aeschylus, who already said in his Agamemnon, verse 1127, quote, Did ever seers afford delight, the long-practiced art of all the seers whom ever the gods inspired, revealed not but horrors, and a wretched fate. End quote. Among the media of our day, home is naturally facile princeps. A Scotchman by birth, he claims that his mother 
already possess the gift of second sight, and that in their home near Edinburgh similar endowments were frequent among their neighbors. At the age of three years he saw the death of a cousin, who lived in a distant town, and named the persons who were standing around her couch. He conversed constantly in his childish way with spirits and heard heavenly music. His cradle was rocked by invisible hands, and his toys came unaided into his hands. When ten years old, he was taken to an aunt in America, in whose house he had no sooner been installed than chairs and tables, beds and utensils, began to move about in wild disorder, till the terrified lady sent the unlucky boy away. Attending once an exhibition of table-moving, he fell into fits, and suddenly became cataleptic. During the paroxysm he heard a summoning. Then the spirits announced the wrecking of two sailors. The table began to rock as in a storm. The whistling of the wind through the tackle, the creaking of the vessel, and the dull, heavy thud of the waves against her bows all were distinctly heard, and finally the table was upset, while the spirits announced the name and the age of the perishing seamen. From that day, Home carefully cultivated his strange gifts, and developed what he considered a decided talent for reading the future. As a young man, he returned to Europe, and soon became famous. Florence was, for a time, the principal stage of his successes. Here he not only summoned the spirits of the departed, but was raised by invisible powers from the ground, and hovered for some time above the heads of his visitors. The superstitious Italians finally became excited and threatened him with death, from which a Count Branici saved him at great personal peril. In Naples, the spirits suddenly declared their intention to leave him on February 10, 1856, and to remain absent for a whole year. They did so, and during the interval, Home enjoyed better health than ever in his life. In Rome, he became a Catholic, and good Pio Nonno himself offered him his crucifix to kiss, with the words, That is the only true magic wand. Unfortunately, this was not Holmes' view always. At least, we find him in 1864, in the same city, in conflict with the papal police, who ordered him to seize all intercourse, quote, with higher as well as with lower spirits, end quote, and finally compelled him to leave the Eternal City. He then claimed publicly what, it must not be forgotten, he had consistently maintained from the beginning of his marvelous career that he was the unwilling agent of higher powers, which affected him at irregular times, independent of his will, and often contrary to his dearest wishes. It must be added that he gave the strongest proof of his sincerity by never accepting from the public pecuniary compensation for the exhibition of peculiar powers. End of Section 2 Section 3 of Modern Magic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina 
Modern Magic by Maximilian Schell de Vere. Chapter 2 Part 2 Black and White Magic His exterior is winning. He is of medium height, light-haired and light-complexioned, of slender figure, simple and well-bred in his manners, and of irreproachable morale. The highest circles of society have always been open to him, and his marriage with a daughter of the Russian general Stroll has given him wealth and an agreeable position in the world. As the spirits had predicted, they returned on the 10th of February, 1857, and announced themselves by repeated gentle knockings. In other words, Holmes' former nervous disease returned, and with it his exceptionable powers. He was then in Paris, and soon excited the attention of the fair but superstitious empress, whose favor he speedily obtained by a revelation concerning the Emperor de l'Avenir, as the spirits had the gallantry to call her infant son. Napoleon also began to take an interest in the clever, talented man, whose special gifts did not prevent him from being a pliant courtier and a cunning observer. He showed himself grateful for the kindness with which Eugenie provided for his sister's education by exerting his powers to the utmost at the Tuileries, and by revealing to the emperor the secrets he had skillfully elicited during his spiritual sessions from statesmen and generals. At the house of Prince Murat, he performed perhaps the most surprising feats he has ever accomplished. Seated quietly in his armchair, he caused tables to whirl around, the clocks in two rooms to stand still or to go at will, all the bells in the house to ring together or separately, and handkerchiefs to escape irresistibly from the hands and the pockets of several persons, the emperor included. Then the floor seemed to sink. All the doors of the house were slammed to and opened again. The gas lights became extinct, and when they as suddenly blazed up again, home had disappeared without saying goodbye. The guests left the house quietly, and in a state of great and painful excitement. At another exhibition in Prince Napoleon's house, a renowned juggler was present by invitation to watch home, but he declared soon that there was no jugglery, such as he knew, in what he saw, and the meeting during which the most startling phenomena were exhibited, ended by Holmes falling into a state of fearful catalepsy. Perhaps nothing can speak more clearly of the deep interest felt in the modern magician by the highest in the land than the fact that more than once private sessions were held at the Tuileries, at which, besides himself, the emperor and the empress, only one person was allowed to be present, the duke of Montebello. It is said, though not by home himself, that at one of these meetings the sad fate of the empire was clearly predicted, and even the time of the emperor's death ascertained. One achievement of modern magic, in which home is unique, is the raising of his body into the air, no other person having as yet even attempted the same exploit. He is lifted up in a horizontal position, sometimes only to a short distance from the floor, but not unfrequently, also nearly to the ceiling. On one occasion 
and Bordeaux, he remained thus suspended in the sight of several persons for five minutes. Another specialty of his is the lengthening of his body, according to a statement deserving full credit. Human Nature, December 1868, he can, when in a state of trance, add four inches to his stature. Finally, he has been repeatedly seen passing in the air out of one window of the room in which his visitors were assembled, and returning through another window, an exhibition which almost always ended in the complete exhaustion and apparent illness of the magician. Holm himself maintains that he performs no miracles, and is not able to cause the laws of nature to be suspended for a moment, but that he is gifted with an exceptional power to employ faculties which he possesses in common with all his brethren. In him they are active. In the vast majority of men they lie dormant, because man is no longer conscious of the full and absolute control over nature with which he has been endowed by the Creator. He adds that it is faith alone, without the aid of spirits, which enables him to cause mysterious lights to be seen, or heavy pieces of furniture to move about in the air, and to produce strange sounds and peculiar visions in the mind of his friends. On the other hand, when he is lifted up into the air, or enabled to read the future, and to reveal what absent persons are doing at the moment, he professes to act as a willingless instrument of spirits, having neither the power to provoke his ability to perform these feats, nor to lay it aside at will. Occasionally he professes to be conscious of an electric current which he is able to produce at certain times and in a certain state of mind. This emanation protects his body against influences fatal to others and enables him, for instance, to hold live coals in his hand and to thrust his whole head into the chimney fire. This certain state of mind, as he calls it, is simply a state of trance. Hence, the extremely variable nature of his performances, and his great reluctance to appear as a magician at the request of others. Nor is he himself always quite sure of his own condition. Thus, in the winter of 1870, when he wished to exhibit some of the simplest phenomena in the presence of a number of savants in St. Petersburg, he failed so completely in every effort that the committee reported him virtually, though not in terms, an impostor. The same happened to him at a first examination held by Mr. Crookes, a well-known professor of chemistry, in company with Messrs. Cox and Huggins. They did not abandon their purpose, however, and at the next meeting, when certain antipathic spectators were no longer present, Holm displayed the most remarkable phenomena. The committee came to the conclusion that he was enabled to perform these feats by means of a new psychic force, which it was all important for men of science to investigate thoroughly. The number of men and women who possess similar endowments, though generally in an inferior degree only, is very great, especially in the United States. Only one feature is common to them all, the state of trance in which they are enabled to produce such startling phenomena. In all other respects, they differ widely, both 
as to the nature of their performances and as to their credibility. For, from the first appearance of media in spiritualistic circles, in fact, probably already in the exhibitions of the Fox family, delusion and willful deception have been mixed up with actual magic. Tables have been moved by clever legerdemain. Spirit wrappings have been produced by cunning efforts of muscles and sinews. Ventriloquists have used their art to cause extraordinary noises in the air, and Pepper's famous ghosts have shown the facility with which the eye may be deceived and the other senses be taken captive. The most successful deception was practiced by the so-called Davenport brothers, whose well-known exhibitions excited universal interest, as long as the impression lasted that they were the work of invisible spirits. While they became even more popular and attractive, when their true nature had been discovered, on account of the exquisite skill with which these juggling tricks were performed. The masters of physical science have amply proved that table-moving is a simple mechanical art. Faraday and Babinet already called attention to the fact that the smallest muscles of the human body can produce great effects when judiciously employed, and cited, among other instances, the so-called electric girl, exhibited in Paris, who hurled a chair on which she had been sitting, by muscular power alone, to a great distance. The same feat, it is well known, has been repeatedly accomplished by other persons also. Like muscular efforts are made, no doubt, often quite unconsciously, by persons whose will acts energetically, and when several men cooperate, the force of vibrations produced in a kind of rhythmical tact becomes truly astounding. We need only remember that the rolling of a heavily laden cart in the streets may shake a vast, well-built edifice from roof to cellar, and that the regular tramp of a detachment of men has more than once caused suspension bridges of great and well-tried strength to break and to bury hundreds of men under their ruins. Thus, a few children and delicate women alone can, by an hour's steady work and undivided attention, move tables of such weight that a number of strong men can lift them only with difficulty. The only really new force which has ever appeared in this branch of modern magic is the odd of Baron Reichenbach. Its presence and efficacy cannot be denied, although the manner in which it operates is still a mystery. In the summer of 1861, the German baron found himself in a company of table movers at the house of Lord William Cowper, the son-in-law of Lord Palmerston. To prove his faith, he crept under the heavy dining table resting with his full weight on one of the three solid feet and grasping the other two firmly with his hands. The wood began to emit low electric sounds. Then came louder noises, as when furniture cracks in extremely dry weather. And finally, the table began to move. Reichenbach did his best to prevent the movement, but the table rushed down the room, dragging the unlucky baron with it, to the intense amusement of all the persons present. 
the German savant maintains that this power, possessed only by the privileged few who are peculiarly sensitive, emanates from the tips of the fingers, becomes luminous in the dark, and acts like a lever upon all obstacles that come in its way. As the existence of odd is established beyond all doubt, and its effects are admitted by all who have studied the subject, we are forced to look upon it as at least one of the mysterious elements of modern magic. The odd is, as far as we know, a magnetic force, for as soon as certain persons are magnetized, they become conscious of peculiar sensations, heat or cold, headache or other pains, and if predisposed, of a startling increase of power in all their senses. They see lights of every kind, can distinguish even minute objects in a dark room, and behold beautiful white flames upon the poles of magnets. Reichenbach obtained, as he believed, two remarkable results from these first phenomena. He concluded that polar lights, aurora borealis, etc., were identical with the magnetic light of the earth, and he discovered that sensitive, sickly persons who were peculiarly susceptible to magnetic influences ought to lie with the head to the north and the feet to the south in order to obtain refreshing sleep. The next step was an effort to identify the odd with animal magnetism. Reichenbach found that cataleptic patients who perceived the presence of magnets with exquisite accuracy and followed them like mesmerized persons were affected alike by his own hands or those of other perfectly sound but strongly magnetic men. He could attract such unfortunate persons by his outstretched fingers and force them to follow him in a state of unconsciousness wherever he led them. According to his theory, the two sides of man are of opposite electric nature, and a magnetic current passes continually from one side to the other. Sensitive persons, though blindfolded, know perfectly well on which side they approach others. Gradually, Baron Reichenbach extended the range of his experiments, employing for that purpose, besides his own daughter, especially a Miss Nawatney, a sad sufferer from cataleptic attacks. She was able to distinguish, by the sensations which were excited in her whole system, more than six hundred chemicals, and arranged them under his guidance according to their electrochemical force. Another sick woman, Miss Mice, felt a cool wind whenever certain substances were brought near her, and by these and similar efforts, in which the baron was aided by many friends, he ascertained the fact that there is in nature a force which passes through all substances, the human body included, and is inherent in the whole material world. This force he calls the odd. Like electricity and magnetism, this odd is a polar force, and here also opposite poles attract, like poles repel each other. The whole subject, although as yet only in its infancy, is well deserving of careful study and thorough investigation. The manifestations of so-called spirits have naturally excited much attention, and given rise to the bitterest attacks. 
in England, especially, the learned world is all on one side, and the spiritualists all on the other. Nor do they hesitate to say very bitter things of each other. The Saturday Review, more forcibly than courteously, speaks of American spiritualists thus, quote, If this is the spirit world, and if this is spiritual intelligence, and if all the spirits can do is to whisk about in dark rooms and pinch people's legs under the table and play home sweet home on the accordion and kiss folks in the dark and paint baby pictures and write such sentimental namby-pamby as Mr. Coleman copies out from their dictation, it is much better to be a respectable pig and accept annihilation than to be cursed with such an immortality as this. End quote. To which the Spiritual Magazine, January 1862, does not hesitate to reply, quote, We shall not eat breakfast bacon for some time for fear of getting a slice of the editor of the Saturday Review in his self-sought appropriate metempsychosis. End quote. It must be borne in mind, however, that spiritualists everywhere appeal to their own reason as the highest tribunal before which such questions can be decided, and to the laws of nature because, as they say, they are identical with the laws of practical reason. They believe, as a body, neither in angels nor in demons. Their spirits are simply the purified souls of departed men. Protestant theologians, who admit of no purgatory, see in these exhibitions nothing but the deeds of Satan. Catholic divines, on the other hand, and Protestant mystics, who, like the German Schubert, believe that there exist what they curiously enough call a more peaceful infernal spirit, ascribe them to the agency of evil spirits. In the great majority of cases, however, the spirits have clearly shown themselves nothing else but the product of the medium. The latter, invariably either of diseased mind by nature, or overexcited for the occasion, believe they see and hear manifestations in the outer world, which, in reality, exist only in their own consciousness. A Catholic medium is thus visited by spirits from heaven and hell, while the Protestant medium never meets souls from purgatory. Nothing has ever been revealed concerning the future state of man that was not already well known upon earth. Most diverting are the jealousies of great spirits, of Solomon and Socrates, Moses and Plato, when the media happen to be jealous of each other. A somewhat satirical writer on the subject explains even the fact that spirits so often contradict each other and say vile things of sacred subjects by the inner wickedness of the media, which comes to light on such occasions while they carefully conceal it in ordinary life. If these spirits are really the creations of the inner magic life, of which we are just learning to know the first elementary signs, then the powers which are hidden within us may well terrify us as they appear in such exhibitions, while we will not be surprised at the manner in which many an ordinary mortal appears here as a poet or a prophet 
if not as a wicked demon. Nor must it be overlooked that our memory holds vast treasures of knowledge of which we are utterly unconscious, until, under certain circumstances, one or the other fact suddenly reappears before our mind's eye. The very fact that we can, by a great effort and continued appeals to our memory, recall at last what was, apparently, utterly forgotten, proves the presence of such knowledge. A state of intense excitement, of fever or of trance, is peculiarly favorable to the recovery of such hidden treasures, and there can be no doubt that many a medium honestly believes to receive a new revelation when only old, long-forgotten facts return to his consciousness. Generally, however, we repeat, nothing is in the spirit that is not in the medium. The American spiritualist conjures up only his own countrymen, and occasionally some world-renowned heroes, like Napoleon or Caesar, Shakespeare or Schiller, while the cosmopolitan German receives visits from men of all countries. Finally, it must be borne in mind that according to an old proverb, we are ever ready to believe what we wish to see or hear, and hence the amazing credulity of the majority of spiritualists. Even skeptics are not free from the influence of this tendency. When Dr. Bell, the eminent physician of Somerville, Massachusetts, investigated these phenomena of modern magic many years ago, he promptly noticed that the spirits never gave information which was not already in the possession of one or the other person present. Only in a few cases he acknowledged, with his usual candor, and at once, at the meeting itself, that a true answer was returned. But when he examined, after his return home, these few exceptional revelations, he discovered that he had been mistaken, and that these answers had been, after all, as illusory as the others. There can be no doubt, therefore, that modern magic, as far as it consists in table-moving and spirit-wrapping, with their usual accompaniments, is neither the work of mechanical jugglery exclusively, nor, on the other hand, the result of revelations made by spirits. In the mass of accumulated evidence, there remain, however, after sifting it carefully, many facts which cannot be explained according to the ordinary course of nature. The power which produces these phenomena must be classified with other well-known powers given to man under exceptional circumstances, such as the safety of somnambulists in dangerous places the cures performed by faith, and the strange exhibitions made by diseased persons, suffering of catalepsy and similar affections. If men, under the influence of mesmerism, in a state of ecstatic fervor, or under the pressure of strong and long-continued excitement, show powers which are not possessed by man naturally, then modern magic also may well be admitted as one of the means by which such extraordinary and as yet unexplored forces are brought to light. All that can be reasonably asked of those who so peremptorily challenge our admiration 
and demand our respect for the new science is that it shall be proved to be useful to man, and this proof is, as yet, altogether wanting. In Mexico, the preparation for acts of magic seems to have been downright intoxication. At least, we learn from Acosta, in his Historia Natural y Moral de los Indias, Volume 1, that the priests, before sacrificing, inhaled powerful perfumes, rubbed themselves with ointments made of venomous animals, tobacco and hemp seed, and finally drank chica mixed with various drugs. Thus they reached a state of exaltation in which they not only butchered numbers of human beings in cold blood and lost all fear of wild beasts, but were also able to reveal what was happening at a great distance or even future events. We find similar practices also nearer home. The Indians of Martha's Vineyard had, before they were converted, their skillful magicians, who stood in league with evil spirits, and as powwows discovered stolen things, injured men at a distance, and clearly foretold the coming of the whites. The pious Brainerd gives us full accounts of some of the converted Delawares, who, after baptism, felt the evil spirit depart from them, and lost the power of magic. One, a great and wicked magician, deplored bitterly his former condition, when he was a slave of the evil one, and became, in the good missionary's words, an humble, devout, hardy, and loving Christian. It is more difficult to explain the magic of the so-called Archbishop Weissel, the head of the Brotherhood at Ephrata in Pennsylvania, who, according to contemporary authorities, oppressed by his magic the father and steward of the convent, Eckerling, to such a degree that he left his brethren and sought refuge in a hermit's hut in the forest. The spirits of departed brethren and sisters returned to the refectory at this bishop's bidding. They partook of bread and meat, and even conversed with their successors. There can be no doubt that Beisel, abundantly and exceptionally gifted, possessed the power to put his unhappy subordinates, already exhausted by asceticism of every kind, into a state of ecstasy, in which they sincerely believed they saw these spirits, and were subjected to magic influences. That such power has by no means entirely departed from our continent may be seen in the atrocities perpetrated at the command of the Negroes Obi, of which well-authenticated records abound in Florida and Louisiana, as well as in Cuba. The Indo-Germanic race has known and practiced black magic from time immemorial, and the Vendidad already explains it as an act which Ariman, the evil spirit, brought forth when overshadowed by death. In Egypt it flourished for ages, and has never become entirely extinct. Yanis and Yambres, who led the priests in their opposition to Moses, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, have their successors in our day and the very miracles performed by these ancient charmers have been witnessed again and again by modern travelers. Holy writ abounds 
with instances of every kind of magic. It speaks of astrology, and prophesying from arrows, from the entrails of animals, and from dreams. But strangely enough, the charming of serpents and the evil eye are not mentioned, if we accept Balaam. The Kabbalah, on the contrary, speaks more than once of the evil eye, Ayn Hara, and all the southern nations of Europe, as well as the Slavic races, fear its weird power. The eye is, however, by no means employed only to work evil. By the side of their mal occhio, the Italians have another gift called attrativa, which enables man, apparently by the force of his eye only, to draw to himself all whom he wishes to attract. The well-known Saint Filippo Neri thus not only won all whom he wished to gain over by looking at them, but even dogs left their beloved masters and followed him everywhere. Cotton Mather tells us in his Magnolia that Quakers, frequently by the eye only, though often also by anointing or breathing upon them, compelled others to accompany them, to join their communion, and to be in all things obedient to their bidding. Tom Case, himself a Quaker, certainly possessed the power of overwhelming those at whom he looked fixedly for a while, to such a degree that they fell down as if struck with epilepsy. Once, at least, he turned even a mad bull by the force of his eye till it approached him humbly and licked his hand like a pet dog. Even in our own age, Geth has admitted the power of certain men to attract others by the strength of their will, and mentions an instance in which he himself, ardently wishing to see his beloved one, forced her unconsciously to come and meet him halfway. Ackerman 3, 201 it avails nothing to stigmatize a faith so deeply rooted and so universal as a mere superstition. Among the mass of errors which, in the course of ages, have accumulated around the creed, the little grain of truth, the indubitable power of man's mind to act through the eye, ought not to be overlooked. It is the same with the magic known as such to the two great nations of antiquity. If the Greeks saw in Plato the son of Apollo, who came to his mother, Perictione, in the shape of a serpent, and in Alexander the Great, the son of Jupiter, Ammon, they probably intended merely to pay the same compliment to their countrymen which modern nations convey by calling their rulers kings and kaisars by the grace of God. But the consistency with which higher beings came to visit earth-born man in the shape of favored animals is more than an accident. The sons of God came to see the daughters of men, though it is not said in what form they appeared, and the suggestion that they were the giants upon the earth, mentioned in holy writ, is not supported. But exactly as the gods came from Olympus in the shape of bulls and rams, so the evil spirits of the Middle Ages appeared in the shape of rams and cats. A curious instance of the mixture of truth and falsehood appears in this connection. It is well known that the Italians of the South look upon Virgil 
as one of the greatest magicians that ever lived, and ascribe to his tomb, even now, supernatural power. The poet himself had, of course, nothing whatever to do with magic, but his reputation as a magician arose from the fact that, next to the Bible, his verses became, at an early period, a favorite means of consulting the future. Sortes Virgiliana, the lines which upon accidentally opening the volume first met the eye, were a leading feature of the art known as Stichomania. The story of the greatest magician mentioned in the New Testament has been thoroughly examined, and the main features, at least, are well established. Simon Magus was a magician in the sense in which the ancients used that term, but he possessed evidently, in addition, all the powers claimed by better spiritualists, like home in our day. A native of Gitten, a small village of Samaria, he had early manifested superior intellectual gifts, accompanied by an almost marvelous control over the minds of others. By the aid of the former, he produced a lofty Gnostic system, which crumbled, however, to pieces as soon as it came into contact with the inspired system of Christianity. His influence over others led him, in the arrogance which is inherent to natural man, to consider himself as the great divine power, which appeared in different forms as Father, Son, and Spirit. He professed to be able to make himself invisible and to pass unimpeded through solid substances, precisely as was done in later ages by St. Dominic and other saints. Gerus, Mystic, 2, 576. To bind and to loosen others, as well as himself, at will, to open prison doors, and to cause trees to grow out of the bare ground. Before utterly rejecting his pretensions as mere lies and tricks, we must bear in mind two facts. First, that modern jugglers in India perform these very tricks in a manner as yet unexplained, and secondly, that he, in all probability, possessed merely the power of exciting others to a high state of exaltation, in which they candidly believed they saw all these things. At all events, his magic deeds were identical with the miracles of later saints, and as these are enthroned in shrine and statue in Rome, so the eternal city erected to Simon Magus also a statue and proclaimed him a god in the days of Claudius. Another celebrated magician of the same race was Sedecius, Gerus, Mystic, 4271, who lived in the days of St. Louis, and who once, in order to convince the skeptics of his day of the real existence of spirits, such as the Kabbalah admits, ordered them to appear in human form before the eyes of the monarch. Instantly, the whole plain around the king's tent was alive with a vast army. Long rows of bright-colored tents dotted the lowlands, and on the slopes around were encamped countless troops whilst mounted squadrons appeared in the air, performing marvelous evolutions. This was probably the first instance of those airy hosts, which have ever since been seen in various countries. 
the Christian era gave to magic phenomena a new and specific character. What was a miracle in apostolic times remained in the eyes of the multitude a miracle to our day, when performed by saints of the church. It became a crime and an abomination when the authors were laymen, and yet both differed in no single feature. The most remarkable representative of this dual nature of supernatural performances is no doubt Dr. Faust, whom the great and pious Melanchthon states to have well known as a native of the little village of Nittlingen, near his own birthplace, and as a man of dissolute habits, whom the devil carried off in person. His motto, which has been discovered under a portrait of his, Halber's Bible abbreviation, Mag abbreviation, was characteristic of his faith, omne bonum et perfectum a Deo, imperfectum a Diabolo. His vast learning, his great power over the elements, and the popular story of his pact with the evil one made him a hero among the Germans, of whose national tendencies he was then the typical representative. Unfortunately, however, nearly every Christian land has had its own Faust. Such was, for instance, in Spain, the famous Dr. Toralba, who lived in the sixteenth century and by the aid of a servile demon, read the future, healed the sick, traveled through the air, and even, when he fell into the hands of the Inquisition, obtained his release through the great admiral of Castile. Gilles de Laval, who was publicly burnt in 1440, and Lady Fowlis of Scotland, are parallel cases. One of the most absurd ceremonies belonging to black magic was the well-known Tegerm of the Scotch Highlands, a demoniac sacrifice evidently handed down from pagan times. The so-called magician procured a large number of black cats and devoted them with solemn incantations, and, while burning, offensive incense of various kinds to the evil spirits. Then the poor victims were spitted and slowly roasted over a fire of coals, one after the other, but so that not a second's pause occurred between the death of one and the sufferings of the next. This horridly absurd sacrifice had to be continued for three days and nights, during which the magician was not allowed to take any food or drink. The consequence was that if he did not drop down exhausted and perish miserably, he became fearfully excited and finally saw demons in the shape of black cats who granted him all he desired. Horst, Deuteroscopia, 2.184 It need hardly be added that in the state of clairvoyance which he had reached, he only asked for what he well knew was going to happen, and that all the fearful visions of hellish spirits existed only in his overwrought imagination but it will surprise many to learn that such dag arms were held as late as the last century, and that a place is still shown on the island of Mull, where Alan MacLean, with his assistant Lachlan MacLean, sacrificed black cats for four days and nights in succession. The elder of the two passed for a kind of high priest, and chief magician 
with the superstitious islanders. The other was a young, unmarried man of fine appearance and more than ordinary intelligence. Both survived the fearful ceremony, but sank utterly exhausted to the ground, unable to obtain the revelation which they had expected. Nevertheless, they retained the gift of second sight for their lives. It must not be imagined, finally, that the summoning of spirits is a lost art. Even in our day, men are found who are willing to call the departed from their resting place, and to exhibit them to the eyes of living men. The best explanation of this branch of magic was once given by a learned professor, whom the Prince Elector of Brandenburg, Frederick the Second, sent for from Hall, in order to learn from him how spirits could be summoned. The savant declared that nothing was easier, and supported his assertion by a number of actual performances. First, the spectator was prepared by strong beverages, such as the Egyptian sorcerers already used to employ on similar occasions, and by the burning of incense. Soon he fell into a kind of half-sleep, in which he could still understand what was said, but no longer reflect upon the sense of the words. Gradually, his brain became so disturbed, and his imagination so highly excited, that he pictured to himself images corresponding to the words which he heard, and called them up before his mind's eye as realities. The magician, protected against the effects of the incense, by a sponge filled with an alcoholic mixture, then began to converse with his visitor, and tried to learn from him all he could concerning the person the latter wished to see, his shape, his clothes, etc. Finally, the victim was conducted into a dark room, where he was suddenly asked by a stern, imperious voice, Do you not see that woman in white? or whatever the person might be, and at once his over-excited imagination led him to think that he really beheld what he expected or wished to see. This was allowed to go on till he sank down exhausted, or actually fainted away. When he recovered his consciousness, he naturally recollected, but imperfectly, what he had seen while in a state of great excitement, and his memory, impaired by the intermediate utter exhaustion and fainting, failed to recall the small errors or minute inaccuracies of his vision. All that was left of the whole proceeding was a terrifying impression on his mind that he had really seen the spirits of departed friends. Such skillful maneuvers were more than once employed for sinister purposes. Thus, it is a well-known historical fact that the men who obtained control over King Frederick, William II, after his ascension to the throne, and held it for a time, by the visions which they showed him, employed means like these to summon the spirits he wished to see. The master in this branch of black magic was undoubtedly Joseph Balsamo, the Count Cagliostro of French history. He was neither a magician in the true sense of the word, nor even a religious enthusiast, but merely an accomplished juggler and swindler, who had acquired, by natural endowment, 
patient study and consummate art a great power over the minds of others. He played upon the imagination of men as upon a familiar instrument, and the greatest philosophers were as easily victimized by him as the most clear-sighted women, in spite of the natural instinct which generally protects the latter against such imposition. His secret, as far as the summoning of the spirits of the departed is concerned, has died with him, but that enlightened, conscientious men candidly believed they had been shown disembodied spirits is too well established by memories of French and Dutch writers to be doubted. In the meetings of his Lodges of Egyptian Freemasons, he, as Grand Kaptha, or those whom he had qualified by breathing upon them, employed a boy or a girl, frequently called up at haphazard from the street, but at other times carefully prepared for the purpose, to look into the hand or a basin of water. The poor child was, however, first made half unconscious, being anointed with the oil of wisdom, no doubt an intoxicating compound, and after numerous ceremonies carried into a recess called the tabernacle, and ordered to look into the hand or a basin of water. After the assembly had prayed for some time, the dove, as they called the child, was asked what he saw. Ordinarily, he beheld first an angel or a priest, probably the image of Cagliostro himself in his sacerdotal robes, but frequently also monkeys the offspring of a skeptical imagination. Then followed more or less interesting revelations, some utterly absurd, others of real interest, and at times actual predictions of future events. Cagliostro himself, during his last trial, before the Inquisition of Rome, while readily confessing a large number of impostures, stoutly maintained the genuineness of these communications, and insisted that they were the effects of a special power granted by God. His assertion has some value, as the shrewd man knew very well how much more he was likely to gain by a prompt avowal than by such a denial. His wife also, although his accomplice in former years, and now by no means disposed to spare her quasi-husband, always stated that this was a true mystery which she had never been able to fathom. If we add to these considerations the fact that numerous masters of lodges, even in Holland and England, obtained the same results, and that they cannot all have been impostors or deluded victims, there remains enough in these well-established phenomena to ascribe them to a mysterious magic power. Compendio della Vita, etc., D. G. Balsamo, Roma, 1791. It is in fact quite evident that the unfortunate juggler possessed, in a very rare degree, a power akin to that practiced by a mesmer, a home, and other men of that class, without having the sense to understand its true nature, or the ambition to employ it for other than the lowest selfish purposes. Trials of magicians 
who have conjured up the dead and compelled them to reveal the future are still taking place every now and then. In the year 1850, not less than four men, together with their associates, were accused of this crime in enlightened Germany, and the proceedings in one case, which occurred in Munich, created no small sensation. Black magic, therefore, must also be looked upon as by no means a mere illusion, much less as the work of evil spirits. The results it obtains at times are the work of man himself, and exist only within his own conscience. But if man can produce such marvelous effects, which lie apparently beyond the range of the material world, how much more must the Creator and Preserver of all things be able to call forth events which transcend, to our mind, the limits of the tangible world? Such occurrences, when they have a higher moral or religious purpose in view, we call miracles, and they remain incomprehensible for all whose knowledge is confined to the physical world. Above the laws of nature, there rules the divine will, which can do what nature cannot do, and which we can only begin to understand when we bear in mind the fact that by the side of the visible order of the world, or above it, there exist spiritual laws as well as spiritual beings. In a miracle, powers are rendered active which ordinarily remain inactive, but which exist nonetheless permanently in the world. Hence, all great thinkers have readily admitted the existence of miracles. A Locke and a Leibniz, as well as, more recently, a Stahl and a Schopenhauer. Locke, in his Discourse of Miracles, goes so far as to call them the very credentials of a messenger sent from God, and asserts that Moses and Christ have alike authenticated the truth and the divine character of their revelations by miracles. Even their possible continuance is believed in by those who hope that men will ever continue among us who, quote, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. End quote. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 5. End of section 3. Section 4 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic by Maximilian Shell de Vere. Section 4. Chapter 3. Dreams. To sleep, perchance to dream, Hamlet. Of the two parts of our being, one, spiritual and heaven-born, is always active. The other, the bodily earth-born part, requires frequent and regular rest in sleep. During this time of repose, however, the mind also ceases apparently its operations, merely, however, because it has no longer servants at its command who are willing and able to give expression to its activity. When the senses are asleep, the mind is deprived of the usual means of communication with the outer world. But this does not necessarily condemn it to inaction. On the contrary, it has often been maintained that the mind is most active and capable of the highest achievements when released from its usual bondage to the senses. Already, Aeschylus, in his Eumenides, says, The mind of sleepers acts more cunningly, the glare of day 
conceals the fate of men. It seems, however, as if the intermediate state between the full activity of wakeful life and the complete repose of the senses in sound sleep is most favorable to the development of such magic phenomena as occur in dreams. The fact that the susceptibility of the mind is at that time particularly great is intimately connected with the statement recorded in Holy Writ that God frequently revealed his will to men in dreams. If we admit the antiquity of the book of Job, we see there the earliest known announcement of this connection. Quote, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. End quote. From chapter 33, verse 15. Next, we are told that, quote, God came to Abilamech in a dream by night. End quote. From Genesis chapter 20, verse 3. And from that time we hear of similar revelations made by night in dreams throughout the whole history of the chosen people. Frequently, however, the dreams are called visions. Thus Balaam prophesied, quote, He hath said, which heard the words of God, and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance but having his eyes open. End quote. Daniel had his secret, quote, revealed in a night vision, end quote. But such favor was denied to Saul, for, quote, The Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets, end quote. To Solomon, on the contrary, quote, The Lord appeared in a dream by night, end quote, many times. Joel was promised that, quote, Old men should dream dreams, and young men shall see visions, end quote, a pledge quoted by St. Peter as having been amply fulfilled in his day. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. For dreams did not lose their importance at the coming of Christ. To his reputed father, quote, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream, end quote, bidding him to take Mary to his wife. Again he was warned in a dream, quote, not to return to Herod, end quote, and the Lord spake, quote, to Paul in the night by a vision, end quote, more than once, as he was by a dream also sent to Macedonia. What in these and similar cases is accepted as divine inspiration is, in secular history, generally looked upon as mysterious magic revelation. But the phenomena remain the same in all instances, and those appearing in dreams are identical with the symptoms exhibited in revelations occurring during the day, when the favored recipient is wide awake. Clairvoyance by night differs in no way from clairvoyance during the day. A state of ecstasy, a trance, is necessary in either case. That prophetic dreams generally remain unknown, outside of Holy Writ, must be ascribed to the fact that they leave no recollection behind unless they are continued into a state of half-sleep from which a sudden awakening takes place, and soon, then, they are invariably clothed in some allegoric form and become liable to be erroneously, or at least imperfectly, interpreted. Thus dreams, like trances, often prefigure death under the form of a journey, and represent the dying man as an uprooted tree, a withered flower, or a drowning swimmer. The early Christians, foreseeing martyrdom, very frequently received in dreams an intimation of their impending fate under such symbolic forms, and, what was quite peculiar to their visions, was that they often extended to the pagan jailers and keepers, whose minds had been excited by witnessing the sufferings and the constancy of their victims, and who, in many cases, became, in consequence of these dreams, converts to the new faith. The facility, however, with which such symbols can be misunderstood, has been as fatal to dreams in the estimation of most men as the inaccurate manner in which the real revelation is often presented to the still half-sleeping mind. Hence the popular belief that dreams go by contraries, as vulgar slang expresses it. This faith is based upon the well-established fact that a genuine dream, in the act of impressing itself upon memory, often suffers not only mutilation, but actual reversion. Thus Rogers saw, in a dream, Heike, a small, weak man, murder a powerful giant, Caulfield. In the actual encounter, which he had really foreseen, the latter killed his puny antagonist. It is, therefore, as dangerous to believe in dreams as to deny their value altogether 
and to ascribe all realizations of dreams, with McNish, to mere accident. Men of cool judgment and clear mind have at all times been found on the side of believers, and even our great Franklin, with his eminently practical mind and well-known aversion to every kind of superstition, firmly trusted in views which he believed to have come to him in dreams. Antiquity believed in dreams, not only as means by which gods revealed their will, but as special favors accorded to fortunate men. Thus we are told that once two men were traveling together from Arcadia to Megara. When they reached the city, one of the two remained at an inn, while the other went to stay with a friend. Both, wearied by the journey, retired to rest, but the traveler, who was at a private house, dreamt in the night that his friend urged him to come to his assistance, as the innkeeper was about to murder him. Terrified by the vivid dream, he jumped up, but, upon reflection, he concluded that the whole was but an idle fancy, and lay down again. Thereupon the dream was repeated, but this time his friend added that it was too late to come to his aid now, as he had been murdered, and his body would, in the morning, be carried out of the city, concealed under a load of manure. This second dream made such an impression upon the Arcadian that he went at an early hour to the city gate, and, to his amazement, soon saw a wagon loaded with manure approaching the place where he stood. He stopped the driver and asked him what he had hidden in his wagon. The man fled, trembling. The body of the murdered friend was found, and the treacherous innkeeper paid with his life for his crime. One of the oldest of well-authenticated dreams in Christian times revealed to St. Basil the death of Julian the Apostate. It seemed to him in his sleep that he saw the martyr Mercurius receive from God the order to kill the tyrant, and after a short time return and say, O Lord, Julian is killed as thou hast commanded. The saint was so firmly convinced of having received a direct revelation from heaven that he immediately made the news known to the people, and thus gained new honor when the official information at last arrived. Here also the deep-seated hatred of the Christian priest against the emperor, who dared to renew the worship of the ancient gods of the pagans, no doubt suggested the vivid dream, while, on the other hand, the transmission of the actual revelation was so imperfect as to change the real occurrence, Julian's death by a Persian lance, according to the familiar way of thinking of St. Basil, into his execution at divine command by a holy martyr. There is no lack of renowned men of all ages who have had their remarkable dreams, and who have, fortunately for future investigation, recorded them carefully. Thus Melanchthon tells us that he was at a convent with a certain Dr. Jonas, whose letters reached him, requesting him to convey to his friend the sad news of his daughter's sudden death. The great reformer was at a loss how to discharge the painful duty, and, driven by an instinctive impulse, asked Dr. Jonas whether he had ever had any remarkable dreams. The latter replied that he had dreamt, during the preceding night, of his return home, and of the joyful welcome he had met from all his family, except his oldest daughter, who had not appeared. Thereupon Melanchthon told him that his dream had been true, and that he would never see his daughter again, as she had been summoned to her eternal home. Petrarch had a dream, which was evidently also the reflex of his thoughts of the daytime, but accompanied by a direct revelation. He had been, for some days, very anxious about the health of his patron, a Colonna, who was Bishop of Lombez, and one night he saw himself, in a dream, walking by his friend's side, but unable to keep pace with him. The bishop walked faster and faster, bidding him stay behind, and when the poet insisted upon following him, he suddenly assumed a death-like appearance, and said, No, I will not have you go with me now. During the same night in which Petrarch had this dream in Parma, the bishop died at his place in Lombez. The well-known Thomas Wotton also dreamt a short time before his death, while residing in Kent, that he saw five persons commit a robbery at Oxford. On the following day, he added a postscript to a letter which he had written to his son Henry, then a student at that university, in which he mentioned his dream, and asked if such a robbery had really taken place. The letter reached the young man on the morning after the crime had been committed, when town and university were alike in a state of intense excitement. He made the letter immediately known to the authorities, who found in the account of the dream so accurate a description of the robbers that they were enabled at once to ascertain who were the guilty persons and to have them arrested before they could escape. 
The great German poet Gustav Schwab received the first intimation of the French Revolution in 1848 through a remarkable dream which his daughter had in the night preceding the 24th of February. She had been attacked by a malignant fever and was very restless and nervously excited. During that night she saw, in her feverish dreams, the streets of Paris filled with excited crowds and was forced to witness the most fearful scenes. When her father came to her bedside next morning, she gave him a minute description of the building of barricades, the bloody encounters between the troops and the citizens, and of a number of sad tragedies which she had seen enacted in the narrow and dark streets of the great city. The father, though deeply impressed by the vivid character of the dream, ascribed it to a reminiscence of the scenes enacted during the Revolution of 1789, and dismissed the subject, although his child insisted upon the thoroughly modern character of the buildings and the costumes and manners of all she had seen. Great was, therefore, the amazement of the poet, and of all who heard of the dream, when, several days afterwards, the first news reached them of the expulsion of the Orleans family, and much greater still when the papers brought, one by one, descriptions of the scenes which the feverish dream had enabled the girl to see in minute detail, and yet with unerring accuracy. It is true that the poet, in whose biography the dream with all the attending circumstances is mentioned at full length, had for years anticipated such a revolution, and often, with the poet's graphic power, conjured up the scenes that were likely to happen whenever the day of the tempest should arrive. Thus his daughter's mind had, no doubt, long been filled with images of this kind, and was in a state peculiarly susceptible for impressions connected with the subject. There remains, however, the magic phenomenon that she saw, not a poet's fiction, but actual occurrences with all their details, and saw them in the very night during which they happened. In the papers of Sir Robert Peel was found a note concerning his journey from Antibes to Nice in 1854. He was on board the steamer, Herculano, which, on the 25th of April, so violently collided with another steamer, the Cecilia, that it sank immediately, and two-thirds of the passengers perished. Among those who were rescued were the great English statesman and the maid of two ladies, the wife and daughter of a counselor of a French court of justice at Dijon. The young girl had had a presentiment of impending evil, but her wish to postpone the journey had been overruled. The father also, though knowing nothing of the precise whereabouts of his beloved ones, had been much troubled in mind about their safety, and in the very night in which the accident happened, saw the whole occurrence in a harassing dream. He distinctly beheld the vessel disappear in the waves, and a number of victims, among whom were his wife and his child, struggling for life until they finally perished. He awoke in a state of great anguish, summoned his servants to keep him company, and told them what he had dreamt. A few hours later, the telegraph informed him of the accident and of his own grievous affliction. While in these dreams events were made known, which happened at the same time, in other dreams the future itself is revealed. Cicero, in his work on divination, and Valerius Maximus, have preserved a number of such dream visions, which were famous already in the days of antiquity. A dream concerning the tyrant Dionysius was especially well known. It seems that a woman, called Hemera, found herself in a dream among the gods on Olympus, and there saw, chained to the throne of Jupiter, a large man with red hair and spotted countenance. When she asked the divine messenger who had carried her to those regions who that man was, he told her it was the scourge of Italy and Sicily, a man who, when unchained, would destroy many cities. She related her dream on the following morning to her friends, but found no explanation till several years afterwards, when Dionysius ascended the throne. She happened to be in the crowd which had assembled to witness the triumph of the new monarch, and when she saw the tyrant, she uttered a loud cry, for she recognized in him the man in chains under Jupiter's throne. The cry attracted attention. She was brought before Dionysius, forced to relate her dream, and sent to be executed. Equally well known was the remarkable dream which Socrates had a short time before his death. His sentence had already been passed, but the day for its execution was not yet made known, when Crito, one of his friends, came to him and informed him that it would probably be ordered for the next morning. The great philosopher replied with his usual calmness, If such be the will of the gods, be it so. But I do not think it will be tomorrow. I had, just before you entered, a sweet dream. A woman of transcending beauty, and dressed in a long white robe, appeared to me, called me by name, and said, in three days you will return to your beloved Thea. 
he did not die till the third day. Alexander the Great came more than once, during his remarkable career, in peculiar contact with prophetic dreams. He was thus informed of the coming of Cassander long before he ever saw him, and even of the influence which the still unknown friend would have on his fate. When the latter at last appeared at court, Alexander looked at him long and anxiously, and recognized in him the man he had so often seen in his dreams. It so happened, however, that before his suspicions assumed a positive form, a Greek distich was mentioned to him, written to prove the utter worthlessness of all dreams, and the effect of these lines, combined with the discovery that Cassander was the son of his beloved Antipater, induced him to lay aside all apprehensions. Nevertheless, his friend subsequently poisoned him in cold blood. Not less famous was the dream which warned Caius Gracchus of his own sad fate. He saw in his sleep the shadow of his brother Tiberius, and heard him announce in a clear voice that Caius would also share his tragic end and be murdered, like himself, in the capital. The great Roman frequently related this dream, and the historian Calus records that he heard it repeated during Gracchus' lifetime. It is well known that the latter afterwards became a tribune and was killed while he held that office, in the same manner as his brother. Cicero also had his warning dream. He was escaping from his enemies, who had driven him out of Rome, and, seeking safety in his Antium villa, here he dreamt, one night, that, as he was wandering through a waste, deserted country, the consul Marius met him, accompanied by the usual retinue, and adorned with all the insignia of his rank, and asked him why he was so melancholy, and why he had fled from Rome. When he had answered the question, Marius took him by his right hand, and, summoning his chief officer to his side, ordered him to carry the great orator to the temple of Jupiter, built by Marius himself, while he assured Cicero he would there meet with new hopes. It was afterwards ascertained that at the very hour of the dream the Senate had been discussing in the temple of Jupiter the speedy return of Cicero. It would have been well for the great Caesar also, if he had deigned to listen to the warning voice of dreams, for in the night before his murder, his wife, Calphurnia, saw him in a dream fall wounded and copiously bleeding into her arms, and there end his life. She told him of her dream, and on her knees besought him not to go out that day. But Caesar, fearing he might be suspected of giving undue weight to a woman's dreams, made light of her fears, went to the Senate, and met his tragic fate. Among later Romans, the emperor Theodosius was most strikingly favored by dreams, if we may rely upon the statement of Amanius Marcellinus. Two courtiers, anxious to ascertain who should succeed the emperor Valens on the throne, employed a kind of magic instrument resembling the modern psychograph, and succeeded in deciphering the letters T-H-E-O-D. Their discovery became known to the jealous emperor, who ordered not only Theodorus, his second secretary of state, to be executed, but with him a large number of eminent personages whose names began with the ominous five letters. For some unknown reasons, Theodosius, then in Spain, escaped his suspicions, and yet it was he who, when Valens fell in the war against the Goths, was summoned home by the next emperor, Gratianus, to save the empire and assume the supreme command of the army. When the successful general returned to Byzantium to make his report to the emperor, he had himself a dream in which he saw the great patriarch of Antioch, Meletius, invest him with the purple and place the imperial crown upon his head. Gratianus, struck by the brilliancy of the victory obtained at the moment of supreme danger, made Theodosius emperor of the East and returned to Rome. During the following year, in 380, a great council was held in Constantinople, and there, amid a crowd of assembled dignitaries of the church, Theodosius instantly recognized the bishop of Antioch, whom he had never seen, except in his dream. It is not generally known that the prediction of future greatness which Shakespeare causes the three witches to convey to Macbeth rests on an historic basis. The announcement came to him, however, probably not in an actual meeting, but by means of a prophetic dream, which presented to the ambitious chieftain the appearance of an encounter with unearthly agents. The presumption is strengthened by the first notice of the mysterious event, which occurs, it is believed, in Wintonus Chronicil, where Macbeth is reported to have had a vivid dream of three weird women who foretold him his fate. Boethus derived his information from this source, and for unknown reasons added not only Banco as witness of the scene, but described it also, first of all chroniclers, as an actual meeting in a forest. 
The report that the discovery of the famous Venus de Milo was due to a dream is not improbable, but is as yet without sufficient authentication. The French consul, Brest, who was a resident of Milo, dreamed, it is stated, two nights in succession, that he had caused diggings to be made at a certain place in the island, and that his efforts had been rewarded by the discovery of a beautiful statue. He paid no attention to the dream, but it was repeated a third time, and now so distinctly that he not only saw clearly all the surroundings, but also the traces of a recent fire on the spot that had been pointed out to him before. When he went on the following day to the place, he instantly recognized the traces of fire, began his researches, and discovered not only the Venus, now the glory of the Louvre, but also several other most valuable statues. The well-known dream concerning Major André is open to the same objections, though it is quoted in good faith by Mrs. Crow. We are told that the Reverend Mr. Cunningham, a poet, saw in a dream a man who was captured by armed soldiers and hanged on a tree. To his utter consternation, he recognized on the following day, in Major André, who was then for the first time presented to him, the person he had seen in his dream. The latter was just then on the point of embarking for America, where he met with his sad fate. A large number of dreams which are looked upon as prophetic are nothing more than the result of impressions made on the mind during sleep by some bodily sensation. A swelling or an inflammation, for instance, is frequently announced beforehand by pain in the affected part of the body. The mind receives through the nerves an impression of this pain and clothes it, during sleep and in a dream, into some familiar garb, the biting of a serpent, the sting of an insect, or even the stab of a dagger. An occasional coincidence serves to lend prestige to such simple and perfectly natural dreams. Thus, Stilling records the well-known story of a young man in Padua who dreamed one night that he was bitten by one of the marble lions which stand before the church of St. Justina. Passing by the place on the following day with some companions, he recalled the dream and, putting his hand into the mouth of one of the lions, he said, defiantly, Look at this fierce lion that bit me last night! But, at the same moment, he uttered a piercing cry and drew back his hand in great terror. A scorpion, hid in the lion's mouth, had stung him, and the poor youth died of the venom. The German poet Conrad Gessner dreamed, in a similar manner, that a snake bit him in his left breast. The matter was completely forgotten, when, five days later, a slight rising appeared on the spot, which speedily developed itself into a fatal ulcer and caused his death in a short time. Far more interesting, and occasionally productive of good results, are dreams which might be called retrospective, inasmuch as they reveal dreams of the past which stand in some connection with present or impending necessities. Many of these, no doubt, arise simply from the recovery of forgotten facts in our memory. Others, however, cannot be thus explained. Justinus tells us of Dido's dream, in which she saw her departed husband, Zacchaeus, who pointed out to her his concealed treasures and advised her to seek safety in flight. St. Augustine also has an account of a father who, after death, appeared to his son and showed him the receded account, the loss of which had caused his heir much anxiety. After Dante's death, the thirteenth canto of his paradise could nowhere be found, and the apparent loss filled all Italy with grief and sorrow. His son, Pietro Alighieri, however, saw a long time afterwards, in a dream, his father, who came to his bedside and told him that the missing papers were concealed under a certain plank near the window at which he had been in the habit of writing. It was only when all other researches had proved vain that attention was paid to the dream, but when the plank was examined, the canto was found in the precise place which the dream had indicated. A similar dream, of quite recent occurrence, was accidentally more thoroughly authenticated than is generally the case with such events. The beautiful wife of Baron Alphonse de Rothschild of Paris had lost a valuable ring while hunting in the woods near her castle of Ferrières. It so happened that early associations made the jewel specially dear to her, and she felt the loss grievously. A reward of 1,500 francs was, therefore, offered at once for its recovery. The night after the hunt, the daughter of one of the keepers saw in a dream an unknown man of imposing appearance who told her to go at daybreak to a certain crossroad in the forest where she would find the ring at the foot of a beech tree, close to the highway. She awakes, dresses herself at once, and goes to the place of which she has dreamed. 
After half an hour's walk, she reaches the crossroads and almost at the same moment sees something glittering and shining like a firefly, picks it up, and behold, it is the ring. The girl had not even seen the hunt, nor did she know anything of the loss of the jewel. The whole occurrence and the place where it was lost were all pointed out to her in her dream. It has already been mentioned that the question has often been mooted whether the mind was really quite at rest during sleep or still operative in dreams. Some authors deny its activity altogether. Others admit a partial activity. The philosopher Kant went so far as to maintain that perceptions had during sleep were clearer and fuller than those of the day because of the perfect rest of the other senses. Recollection alone, he added, was missing because the mind acted in sleep without the cooperation of the body. There are, however, certain facts which seem to prove that the mind does, at least, not altogether cease its activity while the body is asleep. How else could we explain the power many persons undoubtedly possess to awake at a fixed hour, and the success with which, more than once, great mental efforts have been made during profound sleep? Of the latter, Tartini's famous sonata is a striking instance. He had endeavored in vain to finish this great work. Inspiration would not come and he had abandoned the task in despair. During the night, he had a dream in which he once more tried his best, but in vain. At the moment of despair, however, the devil appeared to him and promised to finish the work in return for his soul. The composer, nothing loath, surrenders his soul and hears his magnificent work gloriously completed on the violin. He wakes up in perfect delight, goes to his desk, and at once writes down his devil's sonata. Even children are known occasionally to be able to give intelligent answers while fast asleep. The questions, however, must be in accordance with the current of their thoughts. Otherwise, they are apt to be aroused. A case is quoted by Real of two soldiers who used, at times, to keep up an uninterrupted conversation during the whole night while they were, to all appearances, fast asleep. A lady also was unable to refuse answers to questions put to her at night, and had at last to lock herself in carefully whenever she went to sleep. Hence it is that some of the most profound thinkers who have discussed the subject of dreams, like Descartes and Leibniz, Jaufroy and Dugald Stewart, Richard and Carus, with a number of others, assert the uninterrupted wakefulness of the mind. Some authors believe that the spiritual part of man needs no sleep, but delights in the comfort of feeling that the body is in perfect repose, and of forgetting, by these means, for a time, the troubles of daily life and the responsibilities of our earthly existence. They base this view upon the fact that, as far as we can judge, the mind is, during sleep, independent of the body and the outer world. Thinking is quite possible during sleep without dreaming, and certain bodily sensations, even, are correctly perceived, as when we turn over in our sleep because lying on one side produces pain or uneasiness. We not only talk while we are asleep, but laugh or weep, sigh or groan. A slight noise, a whispered word, affect the course of our thoughts and produce new images in our dreams, as certain affections and even the pressure upon certain organs are sure to produce invariably the same dreams. Space and time disappear, however, and naturally, because we can measure them only by the aid of our senses, and these are, for the time, inactive. Hence, Dugald Stewart ascribes the manner in which a moment's dream often comprises a year or a whole lifetime to the fact that, when we are asleep, the images created by our imagination appear to be realities, while those which we form when we are awake are known to us to be mere fictions, and hence not subject to the laws of time. It will not surprise us, therefore, to find that this activity of the mind, deprived of the usual means of making itself known to others by gesture, sound, or action, seeks frequently a symbolical utterance, and this is the grain of truth here also hid under the vast amount of rubbish known as the interpretation of dreams. Troubles and difficulties may thus appear as storms, sorrow and grief as tears, troubled waters may represent pain, and smooth ice impending danger, a dry riverbed an approaching famine, and pretty flowers great joy to come, provided always we are disposed to admit a higher class of prophetic dreams. Such a view is supported by high authority, for since the days of Aristotle, great writers, divines as well as philosophers, have endeavored to classify dreams according to their nature and importance. The great reformer, Melanchthon, in his work on the soul, divided them into common dreams, void of importance, prophetic dreams, arising from the individual gifts of the sleeper, divine dreams, 
inspired by God, either directly or through the agency of angels, and finally, demonic dreams, such as the witch's Sabbath. One great difficulty attending all such classification arises, however, from the well-known fact, already alluded to, that external sensations are by far the most frequent causes of dreams. Even these have been systematically arranged by some writers, most successfully, perhaps, in the work of Maine de Biron, but he overlooks again the numerous cases in which external noises and similar accidents produce a whole train of thoughts. Thus, Pope dreamed of a Spaniard who impudently entered his library, ransacked the books on the shelves, and turned a deaf ear to all his remonstrances. The impression was so forcible that he questioned all his servants and investigated the matter thoroughly till he was finally forced to acknowledge that the whole transaction was a dream caused by the fall of a book in his library, which he heard in his sleep. A still more remarkable case occurred once in a hotel in Danzig, where not one person only, but all the guests, without exception, dreamed of the sudden arrival of a number of travelers who disturbed the whole house and took possession of their rooms with unusual clatter and noise. No one had arrived. But during the night, a violent storm had arisen, causing doors to slam and window shutters to flap against the house, noises which had aroused in more than 50 people precisely the same impressions. End of section 4. Recording by Olivia. Section 5 of Modern Magic by Maximilian Schell de Vere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic by Maximilian Schell de Vere. Chapter 4 Visions, Part 1. Concipiendus visionobis quas fantasias vocant. Quote from Quintilian. Visions, that is, the perception of apparently tangible objects in the outer world, which only exist in our imagination, have been known from time immemorial among all nations on the earth. They are, in themselves, perfectly natural, and can frequently be traced back, without difficulty, to bodily affections or a disordered state of the mind, so that many eminent physicians dispose of them curtly as mere incidental symptoms of congestion or neuralgia. They may present real men and things, known beforehand, and now reproduced in such a manner as to appear objectively. Or they may be ideal forms, the product of the moment, and incompatible with the laws of actual life. Persons who have had visions, and know nothing of their true nature, are apt to become intensely excited, as if they had been transferred to another world. The images they behold seem to them of supernatural origin, and may inspire them with lofty thoughts and noble impulses. But only too frequently they disturb their peace of mind and lead them to crime or despair. When visions extend to other senses besides sight, and the peculiar state of mind by which they are caused affects different parts of the body at once, they are called hallucinations, most frequent among insane people, of whom, according to Escarole, eighty in a hundred are thus affected they are generally quite insignificant. While visions through the eye are often accompanied by very remarkable magic phenomena, thus the visions which great men like Cromwell and Descartes, Byron or Goethe, record of their own experience, were evidently signs of the great energy of their mental life, while in others they are clearly symptoms of disease. Ascribed by the ancients to divine influence, Christianity has invariably denounced them, when not indubitably inspired by God, as in the case of the martyr Stephen and the apostle St. John, as works of the devil. At all times they have been communicated to others, either by contagion or, in rare cases, by the imposition of hands, as they have been artificially produced. Thus, extreme bodily fatigue and utter prostration after long illness are apt to cause hallucinations. Albert Smith, for instance, while ascending Mont Blanc and feeling utterly exhausted, saw all his surroundings clearly with his eyes, and yet, at the same time, beheld marvelous things with the so-called inner sense. A Swiss who, in 1848, during a severe cold, crossed from Wallace to Kandersteg by the famous Gemi Pass, 8,000 feet high, saw on his way a number of men shoveling the snow from his path, 
fellow travelers climbing up on all sides, and rolling masses of snow which changed into dogs. He heard the blows of axes and the laughing and singing of distant shepherds, while his road was utterly deserted and not a human soul within many miles. His hands and feet were found frozen when he arrived at his last quarters for the night, and ten days later he died from the effects of his exposure. During the retreat of the French from Russia, the poor sufferers, frozen and famished, were continually tormented by similar hallucinations, which increased their sufferings, at times, to such a degree as to lead them to commit suicide. Another frequent cause of visions is long-continued fasting combined with more or less ascetic devotion. This is said to explain why the prophets of the Old Testament were so vigorously forbidden to indulge in wine or rich fare. Thus Aaron was told, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle. Leviticus 10, 9. Moses remained forty days, and neither did eat bread nor drink wine, when he was on Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 9, 9. The Nazarites were ordered not to drink any liquor of grapes, nor to eat moist grapes or dried, and even to abstain from vinegar. Number 6, 3. And Daniel and his companions had nothing but pulse to eat and water to drink. Daniel 1, 12. In order to prepare them for receiving wisdom and knowledge and the understanding of dreams and visions. Narcotics also, and in our day, most of the anesthetics, can produce visions and hallucinations, but the result is, in all such cases, much less interesting than when they are produced spontaneously. Tobacco and opium, betel, hashish, and coca are the principal means employed, but Siberia has besides its narcotic mushrooms, Polynesia its ava, New Granada and the Himalayas the thorn apple, Florida its emetic apologene, and the northern regions of America and Europe have their leadum. The most effective among these narcotics seems to be the Indian hemp, since the visions it produces surpass even the marvelous effects of opium, as has been recently again most graphically described by Bayard Taylor. Laughing gas, also, has frequently similar effects, and affords, besides, the precious privilege of freedom from the painful, often excruciating consequences of other narcotics. When perfumes are employed for the express purpose of producing visions, it is difficult to ascertain how much is due to their influence and how much to the overexcited mind of the seer. Benvenuto Cellini describes, though probably not in the most trustworthy manner, the amazing effect produced upon himself and a boy by his side by the perfumes which the priest burnt in the Colosseum. The whole vast building seemed to him filled with demons, and the boy saw thousands of threatening men, four huge giants, and fire bursting out in countless places. The great artist was told at the same time that a great danger was threatening him, and that he would surely lose his beloved Angelica within the month. Both events occurred as predicted, and thus proved that in this case at least, magic phenomena had accompanied the visions. Among other external causes which are apt to produce visions must be mentioned violent motions, especially when they are revolving, as is the case with the shamans of the Laplanders and the dancing dervishes of the East. Self-inflicted wounds, such as the priests of Baal caused in order to excite their power of divination, and long-continued imprisonment, as illustrated in the well-known cases of Benvenuto Cellini and Silvio Pellico, the latter was constantly tormented by sighs or suppressed laughter which he heard in his dungeon, then by invisible hands pulling at his dress, knocking down his books, or trying to put out his light, till he became seriously to suspect that he might be the victim of invisible malignant powers. Fortunately, all these phenomena disappeared at the break of day, and thus his vigorous mind, supported by true piety, was enabled to keep his judgment uninjured. Diseases of every kind are a fruitful source of visions, and some are rarely without them, but the character of visions differs according to the nature of the affections. Persons who suffer with the liver have melancholy. Consumptive patients have cheerful visions. Epileptics often see fearful specters during their paroxysms, and persons bitten by mad dogs see the animal that has caused their sufferings. The case of the bookseller Nikolai in Berlin is well known. The disease of which he suffered is not only very common in some parts of Russia, but productive of precisely the same symptoms. 
the patients experience first a sensation of great despondency, followed by a period of profound melancholy, during which they see themselves surrounded by a number of persons with whom they converse and quarrel, half conscious of their own delusion, and yet not able to master it wholly. They are generally bled, whereupon the images become transparent and shrink into smaller and smaller space, till they finally disappear entirely. Affections of the heart and the subsequent unequal distribution of blood through the system are apt to produce peculiar sounds, which at times fashion themselves into loud and harmonious pieces. The excitement usually attendant upon specially fatal plagues and contagious diseases increases the tendency which the latter naturally have to cause hallucinations. During a plague in the reign of Justinian, men were seen walking through the crowd and touching here and there a person. The latter were at once attacked by the disease and invariably succumbed. Upon another such occasion, marks and spots appeared on the clothing of those who had caught the contagion, as if made by invisible hands. The sufferers began next to see a number of spectres and died in a short time. The same symptoms have accompanied the cholera in modern times, and more than once, strange, utterly unknown persons were not only seen, but heard, as they were conversing with others. What they said was written down in many cases, and proved to be predictions of approaching visits of the dread disease to neighboring houses. A magic power of foresight seems in these cases to be developed by the extreme excitement or deep anxiety, but the unconscious clairvoyance assumes the form of persons outside of their own mental sphere within which they alone existed. By far the most frequent causes of visions are, however, those of psychical nature. Like fixed ideas, intense passions, or deep-rooted prejudices, and concealed misdeeds. When they are produced by such causes, they have often the appearance of having led to the commission of great crimes. Thus Julian the Apostate, who had caused the image of his guardian angel to be put upon all his coins and banners, naturally had this form deeply impressed upon his mind. In the night before a decisive battle, he saw, according to Ammianus Marcellinus, this protecting genius in the act of turning away from him, and this vision made so deep an impression upon his mind that he interpreted it as an omen of his impending death. On the following day he fell in battle. The fearful penalty inflicted upon Charles the Ninth by his own conscience is well known. After the massacre of St. Bartholomew, he saw, by day and by night, the forms of his victims around him, till death made an end to his sufferings. On our own continent, one of the early conquerors gave a striking instance of the manner in which such visions are produced. He was one of the adventurers who had reached Darien, and was at the point of plundering a temple. But a few days before, an Indian woman had told him that the treasures it held were guarded by evil spirits, and if he entered it, the earth would open and swallow up the temple and the conquerors alike. Nothing daunted, he led his men to the attack, but, as they came in sight, he suddenly saw, in the evening light, how the colossal building rocked to and fro as in a tempest, and thoroughly intimidated, he rode away with his followers, leaving the temple and its treasures unharmed. That visions are apt to precede atrocious crimes is quite natural, since they are in such cases nothing but the product of the intense excitement under which murders are often committed. But it would be absurd to look upon them as motive causes. Revelac had constant visions of angels, saints, and demons while preparing his mind for the assassination of Henry IV. And the young student who attempted the murder of Napoleon at Schönbrunn repeatedly saw the genius of Germany, which appeared to him and encouraged him to free his country from the usurper. Persons who attempt to summon ghosts are very apt to see them, because their mind is highly wrought up by their proceedings, and they confidently expect to have visions. But some men possess a similar power without making any special effort or peculiar preparations, their firm volition sufficing for the purpose. Thus Talma could at all times force himself to see, in the place of the actual audience before whom he was acting, an assembly of skeletons, and he is said never to have acted better than when he gave himself up to this hallucination. Painters also frequently have the power to summon before their mind's eye the features of those whose portrait they are painting. 
Blake, for instance, was able actually to finish likenesses from images he saw sitting in the chair where the real persons had been seated. While visions are quite common, delusions of the other senses are less frequent. The insane alone hear strange conversations. Hallucinations of the taste cause patients to enjoy delightful dishes or to partake of spoiled meat and other unpalatable viands which have no existence. Sweet smells and incense are often perceived, bad odors much less frequently. The touch is, of all senses, the least likely to be deceived. Still, deranged people occasionally feel a slight touch as a severe blow, and persons suffering from certain diseases are convinced that ants, spiders, or other insects are running over their bodies. The favorite season of visions is night, mainly the hour about midnight, and in the whole year, the time of Advent, but also the nights from Christmas to New Year. This is, of course, not a feature of supernatural life, but the simple effect of the greater quiet and the more thoughtful inward life which these seasons are apt to bring to busy men. The reality of our surroundings disappears with the setting sun, and in deep night we are rendered almost wholly independent of the influence exercised in the day by friends, family, and even furniture. All standards of measurement, moreover, disappear, and we lose the correct estimate of both space and time. Turning our thoughts at such times with greater energy and perseverance inward, our imagination has free scope, and countless images appear before our mind's eye, which are not subject to the laws of real life. Darkness, stillness, and solitude are three great features of midnight seasons. All favor the full activity of our fancy, and set criticism at defiance by denying us all means of comparison with real sounds or sights. At the same time, it is asserted that under such circumstances, men are also better qualified to perceive manifestations which, during the turba of daily life, are carelessly ignored or really imperceptible to the common senses. So long as the intercourse with the world and its exigencies occupy all our thoughts, and self-interest makes us look fixedly only at some one great purpose of life, we are deaf and blind to all that does not clearly belong to this world. But when these demands are no longer made upon us, and especially when, as in the time of Advent, our thoughts are somewhat drawn from earthly natures, and our eyes are lifted heavenward, then we are enabled to give free scope to our instincts, or, if we prefer the real name, to the additional sense by which we perceive intangible things. A comparison has often been drawn between the ability to see visions and our power to distinguish the stars. In the day, the brilliancy of the sun so far outshines the latter that we see not a single one. At night, they step forth, as it were, from the dark, and the deeper the blackness of the sky, the greater their own brightness. Are they, on that account, nothing more than creatures of our imagination, set free by night and darkness? As for the favorite places where visions most frequently are seen, it seems that solitudes have already in ancient times always been looked upon as special resorts for evil spirits. The deserts of Asia, with their deep gullies and numerous caves, suggested a population of shy and weird beings, whom few saw and no one knew fully. Hence the fearful description of Babylon in her overthrow, when their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. From Isaiah 13, verse 21. The New Testament speaks in like manner of the deserts of Palestine as the abode of evil spirits, and in later days the Faroe Islands were constantly referred to as peopled with weird and unearthly beings. The deserts of Africa are full of jinns, and the vast plains of the East are peopled with weird apparitions. The solitudes of Norwegian mountain districts abound with gnomes and sprites, and waste places everywhere are no sooner abandoned by men than they are occupied by evil spirits and become the scenes of wild and gruesome visions. Well-authenticated cases of visions are recorded in unbroken succession from the times of antiquity to our own day, and leave no doubt on the mind that they are not only of common occurrence among men, but generally, also, accompanied by magic phenomena of great importance. The ancients saw, of course, most frequently, their gods. 
the pagans who had been converted to Christianity, their former idols, threatening them with dire punishment, and Christians, their saints and martyrs, their angels and demons. Thus all parties are supported by authorities in no way peculiar to one faith or another, but common to all humanity, and the battle is fought, for a time at least, between faith and faith, and between vision and vision. A famous rhetor, Aristides, who is mentioned in history as one of the mightiest champions polytheism has ever been able to raise against triumphant Christianity, saw in his hours of exaltation the great Esclepius, who gave him directions how to carry on his warfare. At such times his public addresses became so attractive that thousands of enthusiastic hearers assembled to hang upon his lips. The story of the genius of Socrates is well known. Aulus Gellius tells us how the great sage was seen standing motionless for twenty-four hours in the same place before joining the expedition to Potidaea, so absorbed in deep thought that it seemed as if his soul had left his body. Dion, Plato's most intimate friend, saw huge fury enter his house and sweep it with a broom. A conspiracy broke out, and he was murdered, after having lost his only son a few days before. The same Simonides, who, according to Valerius Maximus, had escaped from shipwreck by timely warning of a spirit, was once dining at the magnificent house of Scopus at Cranon in Thessaly, when a servant entered to inform him that two gigantic youths were standing at the door and wished to see him immediately. He went out and found no one there, but at the same moment the roof and the walls of the dining room fell down, burying all the guests under the ruins. The ancients looked upon the vision, in both cases, as merely effects of the prophetic power of the poet, which saved him from immediate death, once in the form of a spirit, and the second time in the form of the Dioscuri. For, as Simonides had shortly before written a beautiful poem in honor of Castor and Pollux, his escape and the friendly warning were naturally attributed to the heroic youths who constantly appear in history as protective genii. In Greece they were known to have fought, dressed in their purple cloaks, and seated on snow-white horses on the side of the Locri, and to have announced their victory on the same day in Olympia and Sparta in Corinth and in Athens. In Rome they were credited with the victory on the banks of Lake Regillus, and reported to have, as in Greece, dashed into the city, far ahead of all messengers, to proclaim the joyful news. During the Macedonian War, they met Publius Vatinius on his way to Rome and informed him that, on the preceding day, Emilius Paulus had captured Perseus. Delighted with the news, the prefect hastens to the Senate, but is discredited and actually sent to jail on the charge of indulging in idle gossip, unworthy of his high office. It was only when at last messengers came from the distant army and confirmed the report of Perseus' captivity that the unlucky prefect was set free again and honored with high rewards. In other cases, the warning genius was seen in visions of different nature. Thus, Hannibal was reported to have traced in his sleep the whole course and the success of all his plans by the aid of his genius, who appeared to him in the shape of a child of marvelous beauty sent by the great Jupiter himself to direct his movements and to make him master of Italy. The child asked him to follow without turning to look back, but Hannibal, yielding to the innate tendency to covet forbidden fruit, looked behind him and saw an immense serpent overthrowing all impediments in his way. Then came a violent thunderstorm with fierce lightnings, which rent the strongest walls. Hannibal asked the meaning of these portents, and was told that the storm signified the total subjection of Italy, but that he must be silent and leave the rest to fate. That the vision was not fully realized was naturally ascribed to his indiscretion. The genius of the two consuls, Publius Decius and Monlus Torcatus, assumed, on the contrary, the shape of a huge phantom which appeared at night in their camp at the foot of Vesuvius and announced the decision that one leader must fall in order to make the army victorious. Upon the strength of this vision, the two generals decided that he whose troops should first show signs of yielding should seek death by advancing alone against the Latin army. The legions of Decius, therefore, no sooner began to fall back than he threw himself 
sword in hand, upon the enemy, and not only died a glorious death for his country, but secured a brilliant victory to his brethren. At a later period, a genius saved the life of Octavian when he and Antony were camped at Philippi, on the eve of the great battle against Brutus and Cassius. The vision appeared not to himself, however, but to another person, his own physician, Arturus, who, in a dream, was ordered to advise his master to appear on the battlefield in spite of his serious indisposition. Octavian followed the advice and went out, though he had to be carried by his men in a litter. During his absence, the soldiers of Brutus entered the camp and actually searched his tent, in which he would have perished inevitably without the timely warning. Of a very different nature was the vision of Cassius, the lieutenant of Antony, who, during his flight to Athens, saw at night a huge black phantom, which informed him that he was his evil spirit. In his terror he called his servants and inquired what they had seen, but they had noticed nothing. Thus tranquilized, he fell asleep again, but the phantom returned once more and disturbed his mind so painfully that he remained awake the rest of the night, surrounded by his guards and slaves. The vision was afterwards interpreted as an omen of his impending violent death. Emperor Trajan was saved from death during a fearful earthquake by a man of colossal proportions who came to lead him out of his palace at Antioch. And Attila, who, to the surprise of the world, spared Rome and Italy at the request of Pope Leo the Great, mentioned, as the true motive of his action, the appearance of a majestic old man in priestly garments who had threatened him, drawing his sword, with instant death if he did not grant all that the Roman high priest should demand. In other cases, which are as numerous as they are striking, the genius assumes the shape of a woman. Thus, Dio Cassius, as well as Suetonius, relate that when Drusus had ravaged Germany and was on the point of crossing the Elba, the formidable shape of a gigantic woman appeared to him, who waded up to the middle of the stream and then called out, Whither, O Drusus, canst thou put no limit to thy thirst of conquest? Back! The end of thy deeds and of thy life is at hand. History records that Drusus fell back without apparent reason and that he died before he reached the banks of the Rhine. Tacitus tells us, in like manner, a vision which encouraged Curtius Rufus at the time when he, a gladiator's son and holding a most humble position, was accompanying a questor on his way to Africa. As he walked up and down a passage in deep meditation, a woman of unusual size appeared to him and said, Thou, O Rufus, shall be proconsul of this province. The young man, perhaps encouraged and supported by a vision which was the result of his own ambitious dreams, rose rapidly by his eminent ability, and after he had reached the consulate, really obtained the province of Africa. The younger Pliny, who tells the same story in his admirable letter to Sura on the subject of magic, adds that the genius appeared a second time to the great proconsul, but remained silent. The latter saw in this silence a warning of approaching death, and prepared for his end, which did not fail soon to close his career. It is very striking to see how, in these visions also, the inner life of man was invariably clearly and distinctly reflected. The ambitious youth saw his good fortune personified in the shape of a beautiful woman, which his excited imagination called Africa, and which he hoped some time or other to call his own. Brutus, on the contrary, full of anticipations of evil and suffering, and perhaps unconsciously bitter remorse on the account of Caesar's murder, saw his sad fate as a hideous demon. The army also, sharing, no doubt, their leader's dark apprehensions, looked upon the black Ethiopian who entered the camp as an evil omen. The appointed meeting at Philippi was merely an evidence of the superior ability of Brutus, who foresaw the probable course of the war and knew the great strategic importance of the famous town. In the same manner, a tradition was long cherished in Augsburg of a fanatic heroine on horseback who appeared to Attila when he attempted to cross the river Lech on his way from Italy to Pannonia. She called out to him, Back! and made a deep impression upon his mind. The picture of the giant woman was long preserved in a Minorite convent in the city and was evidently German in features and in costume. It is by no means impossible 
that the lofty but superstitious mind of the ruthless conqueror, after having long busied itself with his approaching attack upon a mighty, unknown nation, personified to himself, in a momentary trance, the genius of that race in the shape of a majestic woman. This was all the more probable, as Holy Writ also presents to us, a whole series of mighty women who exercised, at times, a lasting influence on the fate of the chosen people. And the world's history abounds with similar instances. There was Deborah, a prophetess who judged Israel at that time and went to aid in the defeat of Sisera. And there was Huldah, the prophetess, who warned Josiah, king of Judah. We have the same grand images in Greek and Roman history, and German annals mention more than one Jetta and Veleda. The series of warnings, given by the more tender-hearted sex, runs through the annals of modern races, from the oldest times to our own day. One of the latest instances happened to a king well known for his sneering skepticism and his utter disbelief of all higher powers. This was Bernadotte, who forsook his benefactor in order to mount the throne of Sweden and turned his own sword against his former master. Long years after the fall of Napoleon, he was on the point of sending his son Oscar with an army against Norway and met with much opposition in the Council of State. Full of impatience and indignation, he mounted his horse and rode out to cool his heated mind. As he approached a dark forest near Stockholm, he saw an old woman sitting by the wayside, whose quaint costume and wild disheveled hair attracted his attention. He asked her roughly what she was doing there. Her reply was, If Oscar goes into the war which you propose, he will not strike, but receive the first blow. The king was impressed by the warning and returned full of thoughts to his palace. After a sleepless night, he informed the council of state that he had changed his views and would not send the prince to Norway. Even if we accept the interview with the woman as a mere vision, the effect of the king's long and anxious preoccupation with an important plan upon the success of which the security of his throne and the continuation of his dynasty might depend, the question still remains, why a man of his tastes and haughty skepticism should have clothed his doubts in words uttered by an old woman dressed in fancy costume? The number of practical, sensible men who have, even in recent times, believed themselves under the special care and protection of a genius or guardian angel is much larger than is commonly known. The ancients looked upon a genius as part of their mythology, and modern Christians, who cherish this belief, refer to the fact that the Savior said of little children, In heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. These visions, for so they must be called, very greatly in different persons. To some men they appear only when great dangers are threatening or sublime efforts have to be made, while in others they assume, by their frequency, a more or less permanent form, and may even be inherited, becoming tutelary deities of certain houses, familiar spirits, or specially appointed guardian angels of the members of a family or single individuals. Hence, the well-known accounts of the genius of Socrates and the familiar spirits of the Bible in ancient times. Hence also, almost uninterrupted line of similar accounts through the Middle Ages down to our own day. Thus, Campanella stated that whenever he was threatened with misfortune, he fell into a state halfway between waking and sleeping, in which he heard a voice say, Campanella, Campanella, and several other words, without ever seeing a person. Calinan, Chancellor of Navarra, heard in Bern his name called three times and then received a warning from the same voice to leave the town promptly, as the plague was to rage there fearfully. He obeyed that order and escaped the ravages of the terrible disease. The Jesuit, Giovanni Carrera, had a protecting genius, whom he frequently consulted in cases of special difficulty. He became so familiar with him that he had himself waked every night for his prayers, but when at times he hesitated to rise at once, the spirit abandoned him for a time, and Carrera could only induce him to come back by long-continued praying and fasting. The Bernadots had a tradition that one of their ancestors had married a fairy, who remained the good genius of the family, and long since had predicted that one of that blood would mount a throne. The Bernadot, who became a king, never forgot the prophecy, and was largely influenced by it when the Swedish nobles offered him the throne. It is well known that Napoleon himself, 
either believed, or affected to believe, in a good genius who guided his steps and protected him from danger. He appeared, according to his own statements, sometimes in the shape of a ball of fire, which he called his star, or as a man dressed in red, who paid him occasional visits. General Rapp relates that, in the year 1806, he once found the emperor in his room, apparently absorbed in such deep meditation that he did not notice his entrance, but that, when fairly aroused, he seized Rapp by the arm and asked him if he saw that star. When the latter replied that he saw nothing, Napoleon continued, It is my star. It is standing just above you. It has never forsaken me. I see it on all important occasions. It orders me to go on, and has always been a token of success. The story, coming from General Rapp himself, is quoted here as endorsed by the great historian Amade Thierry. Desmasseaux reports the following facts upon the evidence of trustworthy personal friends. A Madame N., the daughter of a general, was constantly visited by her mother, who had died long ago, and received from her frequent information of secret things, which procured for herself the reputation of being a prophetess. At one time her mother's spirit warned her to try and prevent her husband, who would die by suicide, from carrying out his purpose. Every precaution was taken, and even the knives and forks were removed after meals. But it so happened that a soldier of the National Guard came into the house and left his loaded gun in an anteroom. The lady's husband, unfortunately, chanced to see it, took it, and blew his brains out on the spot. A particularly interesting class of visions are those to which great artists have, at times, owed their greatest triumphs. Here also, the line between mere delusion and magic phenomena is often so faint as to escape attention. For artists must need cultivate their imagination at the expense of other faculties, and naturally live more in an ideal world than in a real world. Preoccupied, as they are, by the nature of their pursuits, with images of more than earthly beauty, they come easily to form ideals in their minds, which they endeavor to fix first upon their memory, and then upon canvas, or in marble, on paper, or in rapturous words. Raphael Sanzio had long in vain tried to portray the Holy Virgin according to a vague ideal in his mind. At last he awoke one night, and saw in the place where his sketch was hanging a bright light, and in the radiance the mother of Christ in matchless beauty and with supernatural holiness in her features. The vision remained deeply impressed upon his mind and was ever after the original of which even his best Madonnas could only be imperfect copies. Benvenuto Cellini, when sick unto death, repeatedly saw an old man trying to pull him down into his boat. But as soon as his faithful servant came and touched him, the hideous vision disappeared. The artist had evidently a picture of Charon and his archerontic boat in his mind, which was thus reproduced in his feverish dreams. On another occasion, when he had long been in prison and in despair contemplated suicide, an unknown being suddenly seized him and hurled him back to a distance of four yards, where he remained lying for hours, half dead. In the following night, a fair youth appeared to him and made him bitter reproaches on account of his sinful purpose. The same youthful genius appeared to him repeatedly when a great crisis approached in his marvelously adventurous life and more than once revealed to him the mysteries of the future. Poor Tasso had fearful hallucinations during the time when his mind was disordered, but above them all hovered, as it were, a vision of a glorious virgin surrounded by a bright light, which always comforted, and probably alone, saved him from self-destruction. Like Raphael, Daneker also had long tried in vain to find a perfect expression for his ideal of a Christ on the cross. One night, however, he also saw the Savior in a dream, and at once proceeded to form his model, from which was afterwards copied the well-known statue of transcendent beauty and power. Paganini used to tell, with an amusing air of assumed awe and reverence, that his mother had seen, a few days before his birth, an angel with two wings and of such dazzling splendor that she could not bear to look at the apparition. The heavenly messenger invited her to express a wish and promised that it should be fulfilled. Thereupon she begged him on her knees to make her Niccolo a great violinist 
and was told that it should be so. The vision, perhaps nothing more than a vivid form of earnest desire and fervent prayer, had, no doubt, a serious influence on the great artist, who was himself strangely susceptible to such impressions. End of section 5《Section 6 of Modern Magic》by Maximilian Schell de Vere. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Modern Magic by Maximilian Schell de Vere. Chapter 4 Visions, Part 2. Nothing can here be said, according to the purpose of these sketches, of the long series of visions vouchsafed to martyrs and saints their history belongs to theology but holy men have independent of their religious convictions often been as famous for their visions as for the piety of their hearts and their achievements in the world loyola for instance with his faculties perpetually strained to the utmost and with his thoughts bent forever upon a grand and holy aim could not well fail to rise to a state of psychic excitement which naturally produced impressive visions hence he continually saw strange sights and heard mysterious voices the effect now of extreme despondency and now of restored confidence in god and in himself as the agent of the most high and yet these visions never interfered with the clearness of his judgment nor with his promptness and energy in acting luther also one of the most practical men ever called to act and to lead in a great crisis had visions he saw the devil and held loud discussions with him he suffered by his persecutions and made great efforts to rid himself of his unwelcome guest while engaged in his great work, the translation of the Bible, for he was, after all, and for very great and good purposes, only a man of his age, imbued with the universal belief in the personal existence and constant presence of Satan, and felt, at the same time, that he was engaged in a warfare upon the results of which depended not only the earthly welfare, but the eternal salvation of millions. It is difficult to say whether Mohammed, who had undoubtedly visions innumerable, received any aid from his hallucinations in devising his new faith. Men of science tell us that he suffered of hysteria muscularis, a disease not uncommon in men as well as in women, which produces periodical paroxysms and is characterized by an alternate contraction and expansion of the muscles. When the attack came, the prophet's lips and tongue would begin to vibrate, his eyes turned up, and the head moved automatically. If the paroxysms were very violent, he fell to the ground, his face turned purple, and he breathed with difficulty. As he frequently retained his consciousness, he pretended that these symptoms were caused by angels' visits, and each attack was followed by a new revelation. The disease was the result of his early lawless life, and the freedom which he claimed, even in later years, pleading a special dispensation from on high as a divinely inspired prophet. It is not to be wondered at that the new religion, springing from such a source, and proclaimed amid the mountains and steppes of Arabia, which, according to popular belief, are all alive with jinns and demons, should be largely based upon visions and hallucinations. The important part which visions hold in the history of the various religions of the earth lies beyond our present purpose. We know, however, that the records of ancient temples, of prophets, saints, and martyrs, and of later convents and churches, abound with instances of so-called revelations from on high. They have more than once served at critical times to excite individuals and whole nations to make sublime efforts. One of the best-known cases of the former class is that of Constantine the Great, who told Eusebius of Caesarea, affirming his statement with a solemn oath that he saw in 312, shortly before the decisive battle at Rome against his formidable adversary, Magentius, a bright cross in the heavens, surrounded by the words, in hoc signo vinces. But this vision stood by no means alone. He himself beheld, besides, in a dream during the following night, the Saviour, who ordered him to use in battle, henceforth, a banner like that which he had seen in his vision. Nazarius, a pagan, also speaks of a number of marvellous signs in the heavens seen in Gaul immediately before the emperor's great victory. Nor can it be doubted that this vision not only inspired Constantine with new hopes and new courage, enabling him to secure his triumph, but also induced him, after his success, to avow himself openly a convert to the faith of Christ. 
the visions of that eminent man Swedenborg are only too well known to require here more than a mere allusion. Beginning his intercourse with the supernatural world at the ripe age of forty-five, he soon gave himself up to it systematically, and felt compelled to make his daily conversations, as well as the revelations he received from time to time, duly known to the public. Thus he wrote with an evident air of firm conviction, quote, I had recently a conference with the Apostle Paul, end quote. And at another time, he assured a Württemberg prelate, quote, I have conferred with St. Paul for a whole year, especially about the words in Romans 3, 28. Three times I have conversed with St. John, once with Moses, and a hundred times with Luther, when the latter confessed that he had been taught fidum solum, contrary to the warning of an angel, and that he had stood alone when renouncing the Pope. With angels, finally, I have held constant intercourse for the last twenty years, and still hold daily conversations. End quote. Classic, as well as Christian art, is indebted to visions for more than one signal success. On the other hand, they have as frequently been made to serve vile purposes, mainly by feeding superstition and supporting religious tyranny. We need only recall the terrible calamity caused by a wretched shepherd boy in France who, in 1213, saw, or pretended to see, heavenly visions, ordering him to enlist his comrades and, with their aid, to rescue the Holy Land from the possession of infidels. Thousands of little children were seized by the contagious excitement, and leaving their home and their kindred, followed their youthful leader, unchecked by the authorities, because of the interpretation applied to the words of Jesus, Suffer little children to come to me. Not one of them ever reached Palestine, as all perished long before they had reached even southern France. It is not exactly a magic phenomenon, but certainly a most startling feature in visions, that the minds of many men should be able, by their own volition, to create images and forms so perfectly like those existing in the world around us, that the same minds are incapable of distinguishing where hallucination and reality touch each other. This faculty varies, of course, as much as other endowments. Sometimes it produces nothing but vague, shapeless lights or sounds, in other persons, it is capable of calling up well-defined forms, and of causing even words to be heard, and pain to be inflicted. During severe suffering in body or soul, it may become a comforter, and in the moment of passing through the valley of the shadow of death, it is apt to soothe the anguish by visions of heavenly bliss. But, to an evil conscience, it may also appear as an avenger, by prefiguring impending judgment and condemnation. It is this influence on the lives of men, and their great moral importance, which leads to visions, and in a certain degree, even to hallucinations, additional interest, and makes it our duty not to set them aside as mere idle phantoms, but to try to ascertain their true nature and final purpose. This is all the more necessary, as in our day, visions are considered purely the offspring of the seer's own mental activity, a truth abundantly proven by the simple fact that blind or deaf people are quite as capable of having visions and hallucinations as those who have the use of all their senses. Thus these magical phenomena have, in an unbroken chain, accompanied almost all the great men who were known to history, from the earliest time to our own day. In modern times they have often been successfully traced to bodily and mental disorders, but this fact diminishes in no way the interest which they have for the student of magic. The great Pascal, who was once threatened with instant death by the upsetting of his carriage, henceforth saw perpetually an abyss by his side, from which fiery flames issued forth. He could conceal it by simply placing a chair or a table between it and his eyes. In the case of the English painter Blake, who had visions of historic personages, which appeared to him in idealized outlines, his periodical aberrations of mind were accepted as sufficient explanation. The bookseller Nikolai, of Berlin, on the contrary, who, like Beaumont, saw hundreds of men, women, and children accompanying him in his walks or visiting him in his chamber, found his ghostly company dependent on the state of his health. When he was bled, or when leeches were applied, the images grew pale and disappeared in part or dissolved entirely. A peculiarity of his case was that he never saw visions in the dark, but all his phantasms appeared in broad daylight or at night when candles had been brought in, or a large fire was burning in the fireplace. 
Captain Henry Bell had been repeatedly urged by a German friend of his, Caspar von Spar, to translate the table talk of Martin Luther, which, having been suppressed by an edict of the Emperor Rudolphus, had become very rare, and of which Spar had sent him a copy, discovered by himself, in a cellar where it had lain buried for fifty-two years. Captain Bell commenced the work, but abandoned it after a little while. A few weeks later, a white-haired old man appeared to him at night, pulling his ear and saying, What? Will you not take time to translate the book? I will give you soon a place for it, and the necessary leisure. Bell was much startled, but, nevertheless, neglected the work. A fortnight after the vision, he was arrested and lodged in the gatehouse of Westminster, where he remained for ten years, of which he spent five, in the translation of the work. Even religious visions have by no means ceased in modern times, and more than one remarkable conversion is ascribed to such agency. We do not speak of so-called miracles, like that of the children of Salette in the department of the Isere in 1849, or the recent revelations at Lourdes and in southern Alsace, which were publicly endorsed by leading men of the Church and have furnished rich material even for political demonstrations. The vision of Major Gardiner, who also, just before committing a sinful action, beheld the Savior and became a changed man, has been so often published and so thoroughly discussed that it need not be repeated here. The conversion of young Radisbon in 1843 created at the time an immense sensation. He was born of Jewish parents, but, like only too many of his race, grew up to be a freethinker and a scoffer rejecting all faiths as idle superstitions. One day he strolled into the Church della Frate in Rome and, while sunk in deep meditation, suddenly beheld a vision of the Virgin Mary, which made so deep an impression upon him that it changed the whole tenor of his life. He gave up the great wealth to which he had fallen heir, he renounced a lovely betrothed, and, resolutely turning his back upon the world, he entered, as a novice, into a Jesuit convent, thus literally forsaking all in order to follow Christ. The magic phenomena accompanying visions have, among nations of the Sclavic race, not infrequently a specially formidable and repellent character, corresponding, no doubt, with the temperament and turn of imagination peculiar to that race. The Sclavs are apt to be ridden by invisible men till they drop down in a swoon. They are driven by wild beasts to the graves of criminals, where they behold fearful sights, or they are forced to mingle with troops of evil spirits roving over the wide waste steppes, and they invariably suffer from the sad effects of such visions, till a premature death relieves them after a few months. In Wallachia, a special vision of the so-called prickolich is quite common, and has, in one case at least, been officially recorded by military authorities. A poor private soldier, who had already more than once suffered from visions, was ordered to stand guard in a lonely mountain pass, and forced by the rules of the service to take his place there, although he had begged hard to be allowed to exchange with a brother soldier, as he knew he would come to grief. The officer in command, struck by the earnestness of his prayer, promised to lend him all possible assistance, and placed a second sentinel for his support close behind him. At half-past ten o'clock, the officer and a high civil functionary saw a dark figure rush by the house in which they were. They hastened at once to the post, where two shots had fallen in rapid succession, and found the inner sentinel, the still-smoking rifle in hand, staring fixedly at the place where his comrade had stood, and utterly unconscious of the approach of his superior. When they reached the outer post, they found the rifle on the ground shattered to pieces, and the heavy barrel bent in the shape of a scythe, while the man himself lay at a considerable distance, groaning with pain, for his whole body was so severely burnt that he died on the following day. The survivor stated that a black figure had fallen, as if from heaven, upon his comrade, and torn him to pieces, in spite of the two shots he had fired at it from a short distance. Then it had vanished again in an instant. The matter was duly reported to headquarters, and, when an investigation was ordered, the fact was discovered that a number of precisely similar occurrences had already been officially recorded. The vision is, of course, nothing more than a product of the excited imagination of the mountaineers who lend the favorite shape of a prickolich to the frequent bizarre-looking masses of fog and mist which rise in their dark valleys, hover over gullies and abysses, and, driven by a sudden current of wind, 
fly upward with amazing rapidity, and thus seem to disappear in an instant. The apprehension of the poor sentinel, on the other hand, was a kind of clairvoyance produced by the combined influence of local tradition, the nightly hour, and the dark pass, upon a previously excited mind, while the vision of the two officers was a similar magic phenomena, the result of the impressions made upon them by the instant prayer of the victim, and a hot discussion about the reality of the prickolich. The sentinel probably saw a weird shape and fired. The gun burst and killed him outright, setting fire to his clothes, a supposition strengthened by the statement that the poor fellow, anticipating a meeting with the spectre, had put a double charge into his rifle. The accident teaches once more that a mere denial of facts and a haughty smile at the idea of visions profit us nothing, while a calm and careful examination of all the circumstances may throw much light upon their nature and help, in the course of time, to extirpate fatal superstitions like those of the prickolich. It is interesting to see how harmless and even pleasant are, in comparison, the visions of men with well-trained minds and kindly dispositions. The bookseller Nikolai entertained his phantom guests and was much amused, at times, by their conversations. McNish tells us the same of Dr. Bostick, who had frequent visions, and of an elderly lady whom Dr. Alderson treated for gout, and who received daily visits from kinsmen and acquaintances with whom she conversed, but who disappeared instantly when she rang for her maid. Another patient of Dr. Alderson's, who saw himself in the same manner, surrounded by numbers of persons, even felt the blows which a phantom carter gave him with his whip. Although in all these cases the visions disappeared after energetic bleeding and purging, the phenomena were nevertheless real as far as they affected the patient, and have in every instance been fully authenticated and scientifically investigated. The well-known author, McNish, himself was frequently a victim of this kind of self-delusion. He saw, during an attack of fever, fearful hellish shapes forming and dissolving at pleasure, and during one night he beheld a whole theater filled with people, among whom he recognized many friends and acquaintances, while on the stage he saw the famous Ducrow with his horses. As soon as he opened his eyes, the scene disappeared. But the music continued, for the orchestra played a magnificent march from Aladdin and did not cease its magic performance for five hours. The vision of the eye seems thus to have been under the influence of his will, but his hearing was beyond his control. A very interesting class of visions, accompanied by undoubted magic phenomena, and as frequent in our day as at any previous period, is formed by those which are the result of climactic and topographic peculiarities. We have already stated that the peculiar impression made upon predisposed minds by vast deserts and boundless wastes is frequently ascribed by the superstitious dwellers near such localities to the influence of evil spirits. Such a vision is the regal of northern Africa, which occurs either after fatiguing journeys through the dry, hot desert in consequence of great nervous excitement or as one of the symptoms of typhoid fever in native patients. Seeing and hearing are alike affected. The other senses only in rare cases. Ordinarily, the eye sees everything immensely magnified or oddly changed. Pebbles become huge blocks of stone. Faint tracks in the hot sand change into broad causeways or ample meadows, and distant shadows appear as animals, wells, or mountain dells. If the moon rises, the vision increases in size and distinctness. The scene becomes animated, Men pass by, camels follow each other in long lines, and troops are marching past in battalions. Then the ear also begins to succumb to the charm. The rustling of dry leaves becomes the sweet song of numerous birds. The wind changes into cries of despair, and the noise of falling sand into distant thunder. The brain remains apparently unaffected, for travelers suffering of the regal are able to make notes and record the symptoms, although the notebook looks to them like a huge album with costly engravings. There can be little doubt that the great afflux of blood to the eyes and the ears is the first cause of these phenomena, but the peculiar nature of the visions remains still a mystery. One striking peculiarity is their unvarying identity in men of the same race and culture. Europeans have their own hallucinations, which are not shared by Africans. The former see churches, houses, and carriages— the latter, mosques, tents, and camels, thus proving here also 
the fact that these delusions of the senses are produced in the mind and not in the outer world. Travelers who suffer from hunger or from the dread effects of the Simone are naturally more subject to the regal than others. The visions generally appear towards midnight and continue till six or seven o'clock in the morning, while during the day they are only seen in cases of aggravated suffering. Another peculiarity is the fact that these visions connect themselves only with small objects and moderate sounds. The gentle friction of a vibrating tassel on his camel's neck appeared to the great explorer Richardson like the clacking of a mill wheel, but the words shouted by his companion sounded quite natural. Thus he saw in every little lichen a green garden spot, but the stars he discerned distinctly enough to direct his way by them even when suffering most intensely from the regal. The Fata Morgana of the so-called Great Desert in Oregon, in which the waters of the Pataka, Kansas, and Arkansas lose themselves to a great extent, is a kindred affection. Here also, phantoms of every kind are seen, gigantic horsemen, colossal buildings, and flitting fires. But the absence of heat makes the visions less frequent and less distinct. The Indians, however, like the Moors of Africa, dread these apparitions and ascribe them to evil spirits. These phenomena have, besides, a special interest by proving how constantly, in all these questions of modern magic, facts are combined with mere delusions. The flitting fires, to which we alluded, for instance, are not mere visions, but real and tangible substances, the effects of gaseous effusions which are quite frequent on these steppes. So it is also with the local visions peculiar to mountain regions, like the little gray man of the Grissons in Switzerland, and the gnomes of the miners in almost all lands. The dwellers in alpine regions acquire, or even inherit, it may be, a peculiar power of divination with regard to the weather. They feel instinctively, and without ever giving themselves the trouble of trying to ascertain the reason, the approach of fogs and mists, so dangerous to the welfare of their herds and their own safety. This presentiment is clothed by local traditions and their own vivid imaginations in the familiar shape of supernatural beings, and what was at first, perhaps, merely a form of speech has gradually become a deep-rooted belief handed down from father to son. They end by really seeing, with their mind's eye, the rising mists and drifting fogs in the shape which they have so often heard mentioned, or give to rising gases, far down in the bowels of the earth, the form of familiar gnomes. These visions are hence not altogether produced by the imagination, but have, so to say, a grain of truth around which the weird form is woven. A numerous class of visions, presenting some of the most interesting phenomena of this branch of magic, must be looked upon as the result of the innate desire to fathom the mystery of future life. The human heart, conscious of immortality by nature, and assured of it by revelation, desires ardently to lift the veil which conceals the secrets of the life to come. Among other means to accomplish this, the promise has often been exacted of dear friends that they would, after death, return and make known their condition in the outer world. Such compacts have been made from time immemorial. But so far, their only result has been that the survivors have believed occasionally that they have received visits from deceased friends. In other words, that their state of great excitement and eager expectation has caused them to have visions. It remains true, after all, that from that born no traveler ever returns. Nevertheless, these visions have a deep interest for the psychologist, as they are the result of unconscious action, and thus display what thoughts dwell in our innermost heart concerning the future. End of section 6. Recording by Olivia. Section 7 of Modern Magic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. Modern Magic by Maximilian Schell de Vere. Chapter 5 Ghosts Part 1 Sunt aliquid manes letum non omnia finit. There are few subjects outside of the vexed questions of theology 
on which eminent men of all nations and ages have held more varied views than so-called ghosts. The very term has been understood differently by almost every great writer who has approached the boundary line of this department of magic. The word which is now commonly used in order to designate any immaterial being, not made of the earth, earthy, or perhaps, in a higher sense, the body spiritual of St. Paul, was, in the early days of Christianity, applied to the visible spirits of deceased persons only. In the Middle Ages again, when everything weird and unnatural was unhesitatingly ascribed to diabolic agency, these phenomena, also, were regarded as nothing else but the devil's work. Theologians have added in recent days a new subject of controversy to this vexed matter. The divines of the seventeenth and eighteenth century denied, of course, the possibility of a reappearance of the spirits of the departed, as they were in consistency bound to deny the existence of a purgatory. And yet, from purgatory alone were these spirits, according to popular belief, allowed to revisit the earth heaven and hell being comparatively closed places. As the people insisted upon seeing ghosts, however, there remained nothing but to declare them to be delusions, produced for malign purposes by the evil one himself, and so decided, not many generations ago, the consistory of Basel in an appeal made by a German mystic author, Jung Stille. And yet it is evident that a number of eminent thinkers, and not a few of the most skeptic philosophers even, have believed in the occurrence of such visits by inmates of Sheol. Hugo Grotius and Pufendorf, whose far-famed worldly wisdom entitles their views to great respect, Machiavelli and Boccaccio, Tomasius and even Kant, all have repeatedly admitted the existence of what we familiarly call ghosts. The great philosopher of Konigsberg enters fully into the subject. Immaterial beings, he says, including the souls of men and animals, may exist, though they must be considered as not filling space, but only acting within the limits of space. He admits the probability that ere long the process will be discovered by which the human soul, even in this life, is closely connected with the immaterial inmates of the world of spirits, a connection which he states to be operative in both directions, men affecting spirits and spirits acting upon men, though the latter are unconscious of such impressions as long as all is well. In the same manner in which the physical world is under the control of a law of gravity, he believes the spiritual world to be ruled by a moral law, which causes a distinction between good and evil spirits. The same belief is entertained and fully discussed by French authors of eminence, such as de Mussos, de Merville, and others. The Catholic Church has never absolutely denied the doctrine of ghosts, perhaps considering itself bound by the biblical statement that, quote, 
the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. End quote. St. Matthew 27, verse 52. Tertullian, St. Augustine, and Thomas the Aquinas all state distinctly, as a dogma, that the souls of the departed can leave their home, though not at will, but only by special permission of the Almighty. St. Augustine mentions saints by whom he was visited, and Thomas the Aquinas speaks even of the return of accursed inmates of hell, for the purpose of terrifying and converting criminals in this world. The Encyclopedia of Catholic Theology, 4, page 489, states that, quote, Although the theory of ghosts has never become a dogma of the Holy Church, it has ever maintained itself and existed in the days of Christ, who did not condemn it, when it was mentioned in his presence. End quote. St. Matthew 14, verse 26, St. Luke 24, verse 37. Calmat, the well-known Benedictine abbot of Senon in Lorraine, who was one of the most renowned theological writers of the 18th century, says, 117, quote, Apparitions of ghosts would be more readily understood if spirits had a body, but the Holy Church has decided that angels, devils, and the spirits of the departed are pure, immaterial spirits. Since this question transcends our mental faculties, we must submit to the judgment of the Church, which cannot err. End quote. Another great theologian, the German Bangel, on the contrary, assumed that quote, probably the apparitions of the departed have a prescribed limit, and then cease. They continue, probably, as long as all the ties between body and soul are not fully dissolved. End quote. This question of the nature of our existence during the time immediately following death is, it is well known, one of the most vexed of our day. For while most divines of the Protestant Church assume an immediate decision of our eternal fate, others admit the probability of an intermediate state, and the Catholic Church has its well-known probationary state in purgatory. It may as well be stated here at once that the whole theory of ghosts is admissible only if we assume that there follows after death a period during which the soul undergoes not an immediate rupture, but a slow, gradual separation from its body, accompanied by a similar, gradual adaptation to its new mode of existence. Whether the spirit, during this time, is still sufficiently akin to earthy substances to be able to clothe itself into some material perceptible to the senses of living men is of comparatively little importance. The idea of such an ethereal body is very old and has never ceased to be entertained. Thus, in 1306, already Guido de la Tones who died in Verona, appeared during eight days to his wife, his neighbors, and a number of devout priests, and declared 
in answer to their questions, that the spirits of the departed possess the power to clothe themselves with air, and thus to become perceptible to living beings. Bale also, in his article on Spinoza, note 2, advocates the possibility, at least, of physical effects being produced by agents whose presence we are not able to perceive by the use of our ordinary senses. Even so eminently practical a mind as Lessing's was bewildered by the difficulties surrounding this question, and he declared that here his wits were at an end. Another great German writer, Guers, in his Christian Mystic, 3, page 307, not only admits the existence of ghosts, but explains them as, quote, the higher prototypal form of man, freed from the earthy form, the spectrum relieved of its envelope, which can be present wherever it chooses, within the prescribed limits of its domain. End quote. This view is, however, not supported by the experience of those who believe they have seen ghosts, for the latter appear only occasionally in a higher, purified form, resembling ethereal beings, as a mere whitish vapor or a shape formed of faint light. By far, more generally, they are seen in the form, and even the costume, of their earthy existence. The only evidence of really supernatural or magic powers accompanying such phenomena consists in the ineffable dread which is apt to oppress the heart and to cause intense bodily suffering, in the cold chill which invariably precedes the apparition, and in the profound and exquisitely painful emotion which is never again forgotten throughout life. As yet, the subject has been so little studied by candid inquiries that there are but a few facts which can be mentioned as fully established. The form and shape under which ghosts appear are the result of the imagination of the ghost-seer only. Whether he beholds angels or devils, men or animals, if his receptive power is highly developed, he will see them in their completeness, and discern even the minutest details. Weak persons, on the other hand, perceive nothing more than a faint, luminous, or whitish appearance, mere fragmentary and embryonic visions. These powers of perception may, however, be improved by practice and those who see ghosts frequently are sure to discover one feature after another, until the whole form stands clearly and distinctly before their mind's eye. The ear is generally more susceptible than the eye to the approach of ghosts, and often warns the mind long before the apparition becomes visible. The noises heard are apt to be vague and ill-defined, consisting mainly of a low whispering or restless rustling, a strange moving to and fro, or the blowing of cold air in various directions. Many sounds, however, are so peculiar that they are never heard except in connection with ghosts, and hence baffle all description. It need not be added that the great majority of such sounds 
also exist only in the mind of the hearer, but as the latter is, in his state of excitement, fully persuaded that he hears them, they are, to him, as real as if they existed outside of his being. Nor are they always confined to the ghost-seer. On the contrary, the hearing of such sounds is as contagious as the seeing of such sights, and not only men are thus affected and see and hear what others experience, but even the higher animals, horses and dogs, share in this susceptibility. When ghosts appear to speak, the voice is almost always engastromantic, that is, the ghost-seer produces the words himself, in a state of ecstatic unconsciousness, and probably by a kind of instinctive ventriloquism. To these phenomena of sight and hearing must be added, thirdly, the occasional violent moving about of heavy substances. Furniture seems to change its place, ponderous objects disappear entirely, or the whole surrounding scene assumes a new order and arrangement. These phenomena, as far as they really exist, must be ascribed to higher, as yet unexplained powers, and suggest the view, entertained by many writers on the subject, that disembodied spirits as they are freed from the mechanical laws of nature, possess also the power to suspend them in everything with which they come in contact. The last feature in ghost-seeing, which is essential, is the cold shudder, the ineffable dread, which falls upon poor mortal man at the moment when he is brought into contact with an unknown world. Already Job said, quote, Fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. End quote. Chapter 4, verses 14, 15. This sense of vague and yet almost intolerable dread resembles the agony of the dying man. It is perfectly natural, since the seeing of ghosts, that is, of disembodied spirits, can only become possible by the more or less complete suspension of the ordinary life in the flesh. For a moment, all bodily functions are suspended, the activity of the brain ceases, and consciousness itself is lost as in a fit of fainting. This rarely happens without a brief, instinctive struggle, and the final victory of an unseen and unknown power which deprives the mind of its habitual mastery over the body, is necessarily accompanied by intense pain and overwhelming anguish. Well-authenticated cases of the appearance of spirits of departed persons are mentioned in the earliest writings. Valerius Maximus relates in graphic words the experience of the poet Simonides, who was about to enter a vessel for the purpose of undertaking a long journey with some of his friends, when he discovered a dead body lying unburied on the seashore. Shocked by the impiety of the unknown man's friends, he delayed his departure to give to the corpse a decent funeral. During the following night, the spirit of this man appeared to him 
and advised him not to sail on the next day. He obeys the warning. His friends leave without him and perish miserably in a great tempest. Deeply moved by his sad loss, but equally grateful for his own miraculous escape, he erected to the memory of his unknown friend a noble monument in verses, unmatched in beauty and pathos. Phlegon, also the freedman of the Emperor Hadrian, has left us in his work De Mirabilibus, one of the most touching instances of such ghost seeing. It is the well known story of Machates and Philemion, which Geth reproduced in his Bride of Corinth. Nor must we forget the numerous examples of visions in dreams, by which the Almighty chose to reveal His will to His beloved among the chosen people. A series of apparitions, which the Church has taken care to continue during the earlier ages in almost unbroken succession from saint to saint. Pagans were converted by such revelations. Martyrs were comforted. The wounded healed. And even an emperor, Constantine, cured of leprosy by the appearance of the two apostles, Peter and Paul. The truth, which lies at the bottom of all such appearances, is probably that ghostly disturbances are uniformly the acts of men, but of men who have ceased for a time to be free agents, and who have, for reasons to be explained presently, acquired exceptional powers. Thus, a famous jurist, Counselor Helfeld in Jena, was one evening on the point of signing the death warrant of a cavalry soldier. The subject had deeply agitated his mind for days, and before seizing his pen, he invoked, as was his custom in such cases, the aid of the Almighty through his Holy Spirit. At that moment, it was an hour before midnight, he hears heavy blows fall upon his window, which sound as if the panes were struck with a riding whip. His clerk also hears the blows distinctly, and begins to tremble violently. This apparent accident induces the judge to delay his action. He devotes the next day to a careful re-perusal of the evidence, and is now led to the conviction that the crime deserves only a minor punishment. Ere the year has closed, another criminal is caught, and volunteers the confession that he was the perpetrator of the crime for which the soldier was punished. In that solemn moment, it was, of course, only the judge's own mind, deeply moved and worn out by painful work, which warned him in a symbolic manner not to be precipitate, and the very fact that the blows sounded as if they had been produced by a whip proved his unconscious association of the noise with the cavalry soldier. And yet he and his clerk believed and solemnly affirmed that they had heard the mysterious blows. This dualism, which, as it were, divides man into two beings, one of whom follows and watches the other, while both are unconscious of their identity, is the magic element in these phenomena. This unconsciousness 
proving, as in dreams, the inactivity of our reason produces the natural effect that we fancy all ghostly appearances are foolish, wanton, and wicked. The fact is, moreover, that they almost always proceed from a more or less diseased or disturbed mind, and acquire importance only in so far as it is our duty here also to eliminate truth from error. Thus only can we hope to counteract their mischievous tendency, and to prevent still stronger delusions from obtaining a mastery over weak minds. This is the purpose of a club formed in London in 1869, the members of which find amusement and useful employment in investigating all cases of haunted houses and other ghostly appearances. That the belief in ghostly disturbances is not a modern error, we see from St. Augustine, who already mentions the farm of a certain Hesperius as disquieted by loud noises till the prayer of a pious priest restored peace. The Catholic Church has a St. Caesarius who purified in like manner the house of the physician Elpidius in Ravenna, which was filled with evil spirits and only admitted the owner after he had passed through a shower of stones. Another saint, Hubertus, was himself annoyed by ghosts in his residence at Caymans, and never succeeded in obtaining peace till he died in 958. Wicked or interested men take, of course, but too readily, advantage of the credulity of men and employ similar disturbances for personal purposes. Such was the case with the ghosts that haunted the council house in Constance and the palace at Woodstock in Cromwell's time. The case of a scrupulously conscientious Protestant minister in Germany, which created in 1719 a great excitement throughout the empire, is well calculated to show the real nature of a number of such ghostly disturbances. He had been called to the deathbed of a notorious sinner, a woman who desired at the last moment to receive the comforts of religion. Unfortunately, he reached her house too late. She was already unconscious and died in his presence, as he thought, unreconciled with her God and with himself, whom she had often insulted and cursed in life. Deeply disturbed, he returned home, and after having dwelt upon the painful subject with intense anxiety for several days, he began to hear footsteps in his house. Gradually they became more frequent. Then he distinguished them clearly as a woman's step, and at last they were accompanied by the dragging of a gown. Watches were set, sand was strewn, dogs were kept in the house, but all in vain. No trace of man was found, and still the sounds continued. The unhappy man prayed day and night, and the noise disappeared for a fortnight. When he ceased praying, they returned, louder than ever. He sternly bids the ghost desist, and behold, the ghost obeys. When he asks if it is a good angel or a demon, no answer is given. But the question, Art thou the devil? finds an immediate reply 
in rapid steps up and down the house, for the poor man's mind was filled with the idea that such things can be done only by the evil one. At last he summons all his remaining energy, and in a tone of command he orders the ghost to depart and never to reappear. From that moment all disturbances cease, and very naturally, for the haunted, disturbed man had fully recovered the command over himself, the dualism that produced all the spectral phenomena had ceased, and the restored mind accomplished its own cure. As these phenomena are thus produced from within, it appears perfectly natural also that they should be reported as occurring most frequently in the month of November. Religious minds and superstitious dispositions have brought this fact into a quaint connection with the approach of Advent time, but the cause is probably purely physical. The dark and dismal month with its dense fogs, emblematic of coming winter, predisposes the mind to gloomy thoughts, and renders it less capable of resisting atmospheric influences. A very general belief ascribes such disturbances, under the name of haunted houses, to the souls of deceased persons who can find no rest beyond the grave. The series of ghost stories based upon this supposition begins with the account of Suetonius, and continues unbroken to our day. Then it was the spirit of Caligula, which could not be quiet so long as his body, which had only been half burned, remained in that disgraceful condition. Night after night, his house and his garden were visited by strange apparitions, till the palace was destroyed by fire, and the emperor's sisters rendered the last honors to his remains. Thus, the disposition of modern inquiries to trace back all popular accounts of great events, all familiar anecdotes and fairy tales, and even proverbs and maxims, to the ancients, has been fully gratified in this case also. They were not only known to antiquity, but formed a staple of popular tales. Thus, the younger Pliny tells us one which he had frequently heard related. At Athens there stood a large, comfortable mansion, which, however, was ill-reputed. Night after night, it was said, chains were heard rattling, first at a distance, and then coming nearer, till a pale, haggard shape was seen approaching, wearing beard and hair, in long, disheveled locks, and clanking the chains it bore on hands and feet. The occupants of the house could not sleep, were terrified, sickened, and died. Thus it came about that the fine building stood empty, year after year, and was at last offered for sale at a low price. About that time the philosopher Athenodorus came to Athens and saw the notice. He had his suspicions aroused by the small sum demanded for the house, inquired about the causes, and rented the house. For he was a man of courage, and meant to fathom the mystery. On the evening of the first day, he dismissed his servants, and remained alone in the front room, writing and occupying himself purposely with grave and abstract questions, 
so as to allow no opening for his imagination. As soon as all was quiet around him, the clanking and rattling of chains begins, but he pays no heed and continues to write. The noise approaches and enters the room. As he looks up, he sees the well-known weird shape before him. It beckons him, but he demands patience and writes on as before. Then the ghost shakes his chains over his head and beckons once more imperatively. Now he rises, takes his lamp, and follows his visitor through the passages into a courtyard where the ghost disappears. The philosopher pulls up some grass on the spot and marks the place. On the following day, he appeals to the authorities to cause the place to be dug up, and when this is done, the bones of an old man, loaded with heavy chains, are found. From that time, the house was left undisturbed, as if the departed had only desired to induce some intelligent person to bestow upon him the honors of a decent burial which among the ancients were held all important. Letter to Sarah, 1, 7, 27. The story told by Lucian, Philosudus, 30, is almost identical with that of Pliny. Here also a house in Corinth, once belonging to Eubatides, was left unoccupied, for the same reasons, and began to decay, when the Pythagorean Arignatus determined to ascertain the reality of these nightly appearances. He goes there after midnight, places his lamp on the floor, lies down, and begins to read. Soon a horrible monster appears, black as night, and changes from one disgusting beast into another, till at last it yields to the stern command of the intrepid philosopher, and disappears in a corner of the large room. When day breaks, workmen are brought in to take up the floor. A skeleton is found, and decently interred, and from that day the house is left to its usual peace and quiet. Epistle 1, 7, 27. Plutarch also, in his Life of Simon, states that the baths at Chaeronia were haunted by the ghost of Damon, who had there found his death. The doors were walled up, and the place forsaken. But up to his day, no relief had been devised, and fearful sights and terrible sounds continued to render the place uninhabitable. Nor are eastern lands unacquainted with this popular belief. Egypt has its haunted houses in nearly every village, and in Cairo there are a great number, while in Tunis, whole streets were abandoned to ghostly occupants. In Nanking, a great mandarin owned a spacious building which he could neither occupy himself nor rent to others because of its evil reputation. At last, the Jesuit Riccius, a missionary, offered to take it for his order. The fathers moved into it, conquered the ghosts by some means best known to themselves, and not only obtained a good house, but great prestige with the natives for their triumph over the spirits. See Hazard, Historia Ecclesiasti Sinica, page 4, chapter 3. The same singular belief 
is not only met with in every age and among the most enlightened nations, but even in our own century a similar case occurred, and is well authenticated. The Duke Charles Alexander of Württemberg, of unholy memory, died at the town of Ludwigsburg, perhaps by murder. For years afterwards the palace was the scene of most violent disturbances. Even the sentinels, powerful and well-armed men, were bodily lifted up and thrown across the parapet of the terrace. At other times the whole building appeared to be filled with people. Doors were opened and closed, lights were seen in the apartments, and dim figures flitted to and fro. Large detachments of troops, under the command of officers, specially selected for the purpose, were ordered to march through the palace more than once on such occasions, but never discovered a trace of human agency. Kerner, Bilder, page 143. Even the great Frederick of Prussia, a man whose thoroughly skeptical mind might surely be supposed to have been free from all superstition, was once forced to admit his inability to explain by natural causes an occurrence of the kind. A Catholic priest in Silesia lost his cook, who had been specially dear to him. Her ghost, as it was called, continued to haunt the house, and a most strange of all, not in order to disturb its peace, but to perform the usual domestic service. The floors were swept, the fires made, and linen washed, all by invisible hands. Frederick, who accidentally heard of the matter, ordered a captain and a lieutenant of his guard to investigate it. They were received by the beating of drums, and then allowed to witness the same household performances. When the grim old captain broke out in a fearful curse, he received a severe box on the ears, and retreated utterly discomfited. Upon his report to the king, the house was pulled down, and a new parsonage erected at some distance from the place. The occurrence is mentioned in many historical works, and quoted without comment even by the great historian Menzel. Another striking case of a somewhat different character was fully reported to the colonial office in London. The scene was a large vault in the island of Barbados, hewn out of the live rock inaccessible only through a huge iron door, fastened in the usual way by strong bolts and a lock the key to which was kept at the government house. During the year 1819, it was opened four times for purposes of interment, and each time it was observed that all the coffins in the vault had been violently thrown about. The governor, Lord Combermere, went himself, accompanied by his staff, and a number of officers, to examine the place, and found the vault itself in perfect order, and without a trace of violence. He ordered the door to be closed with cement, and placed his seal upon the ladder, an example followed by nearly all the bystanders. Eight months later, the 28th of April, 1820, he had the vault opened in the presence of a large company of friends, and within sight 
of a crowd of several thousands. The cement and the seals were found to be perfect and uninjured. The sand, which had been carefully strewn over the floor of the vault, showed no footmark or sign whatever. But the coffins were again thrown about in great confusion. One, of such weight that it required eight men to move it, was found standing upright, and a child's coffin had been violently dashed against the wall. A carefully drawn-up report with accompanying drawings was sent home, but no explanation has ever been discovered. Scientific men were disposed to ascribe the disturbance to earthquakes, but the annals of the island report none during those years. There remains, however, the possibility that the examination of the vault was after all imperfect, and that the sea might have had access to it through some hidden cleft. In that case, an unusually high tide might very well have been the invisible agent. Even the Indian of our far west cherishes the same superstitious belief, and in his lodge on the slopes of the rocky mountains he hears mysterious knockings. To him they are the kindly warning of a spirit, whom he calls the Great Bear, which announces some great calamity. That certain localities seem to be frequented by ghosts, that is, to be haunted, with special preference, must be ascribed to the contagious nature of such mental affections as generally produce these phenomena. This is, moreover, by no means limited, as is commonly believed, to northern regions, where frequent fogs and dense mists, short days and long nights, together with somber surroundings and awe-inspiring sounds in nature, combine to predispose the mind to expect supernatural appearances. Thus, for instance, fair Suabia, one of the most favored portions of Germany, sweet and smiling in its fertile plains, and by no means specially gruesome, even in the most secluded parts of the Black Forest, teems with haunted localities. Dr. Kerner's home, Weinsberg, enjoyed ghostly visits almost in every house. The neighborhood was similarly favored, and even in the open country there are countless peasants' cottages and noblemen's seats which are frequented by ghosts. One of the most attractive estates in Württemberg was purchased in 1815 by a distinguished soldier, whose dauntless courage had caused him to rise rapidly from grade to grade under the eye of the great Napoleon. Soon after his arrival, his wife was aroused every night by a variety of mysterious noises, rising from weird, low whinings to terrific explosions. The colonel also heard them, and tried his best to ascertain the cause. Night after night, moreover, the great castle clock, which went perfectly well all day long, struck at wrong hours, and was found all wrong in the morning. The disturbing powers soon became personal, for one night, when the colonel, 
sitting at the supper table and hearing the usual sounds said angrily i wish the ghost would make himself known a fearful explosion took place knocking down the speaker and bringing all the inmates of the house to the room search was immediately instituted and the main weight of the great clock was discovered to be missing a new weight had to be ordered and only long afterwards the old one was found wedged in between two floors above the clock nor were the disturbances confined to the castle at midnight the horses in the stable became restless and almost wild tearing themselves loose and sweating till they were covered with white foam one night the colonel went to the stable mounted his favorite charger who had borne him in the din and roar of many a battle and awaited the striking of midnight instantly the poor animal began to tremble then to rear and kick furiously until his master famous as a good horseman could hold him in no longer and was carried around the stable by the maddened horse so as to imperil his life after an hour the poor creatures began to calm down but stood trembling in all their limbs the colonel's own horse succumbed to the trial and died in the morning a new stable had to be built which remained free from disturbances by far the most remarkable and strange enough at the same time the best authenticated of all accounts of disturbances caused by recently departed friends is found in a memoir written by the sufferer herself and addressed to the famous baron grimm under the pseudonym of mr mize through the latter the story reached gath who at once appropriated it in all its details and merely changing the name of the principal to antonelli inserted it in his conversations of german emigrants the same event is fully related in the memoirs of the margravine of anspach as quote, a story which at that time created a great sensation in paris and excited universal curiosity end quote but even greater authority yet is given to this account by the fact that it was officially recorded in the police reports of paris from which it has been frequently extracted for publication mademoiselle hippolyta clairon makes substantially the following statements Quote, in the year seventeen forty three my youth and my success on the stage procured for me much attention from young fops and elderly profligates among whom however i found frequently a few better men one of these who made a deep impression upon me was a mr s the son of a merchant from brittany about thirty years old fair of features well made and gifted with some talent for poetry his conversation and his manners showed that he had received a superior education and that he was accustomed to good society while his reserve and bashfulness which prevented him from allowing his attachment to be seen made him all the dearer to me when i had ascertained his discretion i permitted him to visit me and gave him to understand that he might call himself my friend he took this patiently 
seeing that I was still free, and not without tender feelings, and hoping that time might inspire me with a warmer affection. Who knows what might have happened, but I used to question him closely, both from curiosity and from prudence, and his candid answers destroyed his prospects, for he confessed that, dissatisfied with his modest station in life, he had sold his property in order to live in Paris in better society, and I did not like this. Men who are ashamed of themselves are not, it seems to me, calculated to inspire others with respect. Besides, he was of a melancholy and dissatisfied temper, knowing men too well, as he said, not to despise and avoid them. He intended to visit no one but myself, and to induce me also to see no one but him. You may imagine how I disliked such ideas. I might have been held by garlands, but did not wish to be bound with chains. From that moment I saw that I must disappoint his hopes, and gradually withdrew from his society. This caused him a severe illness, during which I showed him all possible attention. But my steady refusal to do more for him only deepened the wound, and at the same time the poor young man had the misfortune of being stripped of nearly all his property by his faithless brother, to whom he had entrusted the sale of all he owned, so that he saw himself compelled to accept small sums from me for the payment of his daily food and the necessary medicines. At last he recovered part of his property, but his health was ruined, and as I thought I was rendering him a real service by widening the distance between us, I refused henceforth to receive his letters and his visits. Thus matters went on for two years and a half, when he died. He had sent for me, wishing to enjoy the happiness of seeing me once more in his last moments, but my friends would not allow me to go. He had no one near him except his servants and an old lady who had of late been his only companion. Our lodgings were far apart. His, near the Chaussée d'Antin, where only a few houses had as yet been built, and mine near the Abbey of St. Martin. My daily guests were an agent who attended to all my professional duties, Mr. Pipelet, well known and beloved by all who knew him, and Rosalie, one of my fellow comedians, a kind young man full of wit and talent. We had modest little suppers, but we were merry and enjoyed ourselves heartily. One evening I had just been singing several pretty airs which seemed to delight my friends, when the clock struck eleven, and at the same moment an extremely sharp cry was heard. Its plaintive sound and long duration amazed everybody. I fainted away and remained for nearly a quarter of an hour unconscious. My agent was in love with me and so mad with jealousy that when I recovered he overwhelmed me with reproaches and said the signals for my interview were rather loud. I told him that as I had the right to receive when and whom I chose, no signals were needed, and this cry had surely been heart-rending enough to convince him that it announced no sweet moments. My paleness, my tremor, 
which lasted for some time, my tears, flowing silently and almost unconsciously, and my urgent request that somebody would stay up with me during the night, all these signs convinced him of my innocence. My friends remained with me, discussing the fearful cry, and determining finally to station guards around the house. Nevertheless, the dread sound was repeated night after night. My friends, all the neighbors, and even the policemen who were stationed near us, heard it distinctly. It seemed to be uttered immediately under my window, where nothing could ever be seen. There was no doubt entertained as to the person for whom it was intended, for whenever I supped out, no cry was heard. But frequently after my return, when I entered my room and inquired about it of my mother and my servants, it suddenly pierced the air anew. Once the president of the court at whose house I had been entertained, proposed to see me home in safety. At the moment when he wished me good night at the door, the cry was heard right between us, and the poor man had to be lifted into his carriage, more dead than alive. Another time, my young companion, Rosalie, a clever, witty man who believed in nothing in heaven or on earth was riding with me in my carriage on our way to a friend who lived in a distant part of the city. We were discussing the fearful torment to which I was exposed, and he, laughing at me, at last declared he would never believe it unless he heard it with his own ears and defied me to summon my lover. I do not know how I came to yield, but instantly the cry was repeated three times, and with overwhelming fierceness. When our carriage reached the house, the servants found us both lying unconscious on the cushions, and had to summon assistance before we recovered. After this, I heard nothing for several months, and began to hope that all was over, but I was sadly mistaken. The members of the king's troop of comedians had all been ordered to appear at Versailles, in honor of the Dauphin's marriage, and as we were to spend three days there, lodgings had been provided. It so happened, however, that a friend of mine, Mademoiselle Granval, had been forgotten, and seeing her trouble, I at last offered her, towards three o'clock in the morning, to share my room, in which there were two beds. This forced me to take my maid into my own bed, and as she was in the act of coming, I said to her, here we are at the end of the world. The weather is abominable, and the cry would find it hard to follow us here. At that moment it resounded close to us. Mademoiselle Granval jumped up terribly frightened and ran through the whole house, waking everybody and keeping us all in such a state of excitement that not an eye was closed the whole night. Seven or eight days later, as I was chatting merrily with a number of friends, at the striking of the hour a shot was heard, coming apparently through my window. We all heard it and saw the fire, but the pane was not broken. Everybody thought at once of an attempt to murder me, and some friends hastened instantly to the chief of police. Men were immediately sent 
to search the houses opposite, and for several days and nights the street was strictly guarded by a number of soldiers. My own house was searched from roof to cellar, and friends came in large companies to assist in watchings. Nevertheless, the shot fell night after night at the same hour for three months with unfailing accuracy. No clue was found, and no sign was seen save the sound of the shot and the sight of the fire. Daily reports of the occurrence were sent to the headquarters of the police. New measures were continually devised and applied, but the authorities were baffled as well as all who tried to fathom the mystery. I became at last quite accustomed to the disturbance, and was in the habit of speaking of it as the doing of a bon diable, because he contented himself so long a time with juggler's tricks. But one night, as I had stepped through the open window, out upon a balcony, and was standing there with my agent by my side, the shot suddenly fell again, and knocked us both back into the room where we fell down, as if dead. When we recovered our consciousness, we got up, and after some hesitation, confessed to each other that our ears had been severely boxed, his on the right side and mine on the left, whereupon we gave way to hearty laughter. The next night was quiet, but on the following day I was riding with my maid to a friend's house, where I had been invited to meet some acquaintances. As we passed through a certain part of the city, I recognized the houses in the bright moonlight, and said jestingly, This looks very much like the part of town where poor S. used to live. At the same moment, a near church clock struck eleven, and instantly a shot was fired at us from one of the buildings which seemed to pass through our carriage. The coachman thought we had been attacked by robbers, and whipped his horses to escape. I knew what it meant, but still felt thoroughly frightened, and reached the house in a state little suited for social enjoyment. This was, however, the last time my unfortunate friend used a gun. In place of the firing, there came now a loud clapping of hands, with certain modulations and repetitions. This sound, to which I had become accustomed on the stage by the kindness of my friends, did not disturb me as much as my companions. They would station themselves around my door and under my window. They heard it distinctly, but could not see a trace of any person. I do not remember how long this continued, but it was followed by the singing of a sweet, almost heavenly melody, which began at the upper end of the street and gradually swelled till it reached my house, where it slowly expired. Then the disturbance ceased altogether. The only light that was ever thrown upon the mystery came from an old lady who called on me on the pretext of wishing to see my house which I had offered for rent. I was very much struck by her venerable appearance and her evident emotion. I offered her a chair and sat down opposite to her, but was for some time unable to say a word. At last she seemed to gather courage, and told me that she had long wished 
to make my acquaintance, but had not dared to come so long as I was constantly surrounded by hosts of friends and admirers. At last she had happened to see my advertisement and availed herself of the opportunity in order to see me and to visit my house, which had a deep, though melancholy, interest in her eyes. I guessed at once that she was the faithful friend who alone remained by the bedside of poor S., when he was prostrated by a fatal disease and refused to see anybody else. For months, she now told me, he had spoken of nothing save of myself, looking upon me now as an angel and now as a demon, but utterly unable to keep his thoughts from dwelling uninterruptedly upon the one subject which filled his mind and his heart alike. I tried to explain to the old lady how I had fully appreciated his good qualities and noble impulses, finding it, however, impossible to fall in with his peculiar views of society, and to promise, as he insisted I should do, to forsake all I loved for the purpose of living with him in loneliness and complete retirement. I told her also that when he sent for me to see him in his last moments, my friends prevented my going, and that I felt myself that the sight of his death under such circumstances would have been dangerous in the extreme to my peace of mind, besides being utterly useless to the dying man. She admitted the force of my reasoning, but repeated that my refusal had hastened his end, and deprived him at the last moment of all self-control. In this state of mind, when a few minutes before eleven the servant had entered and assured him, in answer to his passionate inquiry, that no one had come, he had exclaimed, The heartless woman, she shall gain nothing by her cruelty, for I will pursue her after death as I have pursued her during life. And with these words on his lips, he had expired. End quote. End of section 7section 8 of modern magic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rick vena modern magic by maximilian shell de Vere. Chapter 5 Ghosts Part 2 The impression produced by this thoroughly authenticated recital is a strong argument in favor of a continued connection after death of the human soul with the world in which we live. There was a man whose whole existence was absorbed by one great an all-pervading passion. It brought ruin to his body and disabled his mind from correcting the vagaries of his fancy. He died in this state, with a sense of grievous wrong and intense thirst of revenge uppermost in his mind. Then follow a number of magic phenomena witnessed for several years by thousands of attached friends and curious observers, defying the vigilance of soldiers and the acuteness of police agents, these disturbances, at first bearing the stamp of willful annoyance, gradually assume a milder form, as if expressive 
of softening indignation. They become weaker and less frequent and finally cease altogether, suggestive of the peace which the poor, erring soul had at last found by infinite mercy and goodness when safely entering the desired haven. On the other hand, for contrasts meet here as well as elsewhere, these phenomena have been frequently ascribed to purely physical causes, and in a number of cases the final explanation has confirmed this suggestion. A hypochondriac artist, for instance, was nightly disturbed by a low but furious knocking in his bed, which was heard by others as well as by himself. He prayed, he caused priests to come to his bedside, he had masses read in his behalf, but all remained in vain. Then came a plain, sensible friend who, half in jest and half in earnest, covered his big toe with a brass wire which he dipped into an alkaline solution, and behold, the knockings ceased and never returned. Dupotel, Animal Magnetism In another case, a somnambulistic woman frightened herself as well as others by most violent knockings whenever she was disappointed or thwarted. Her physician, suspecting the cause, finally gave her antispasmodic remedies, and it soon appeared that in her nervous spasms the muscles had been vibrating forcibly enough to produce these disturbances. Since these discoveries, it has been found that almost anybody may produce such knockings, which stand in a suspicious relationship to spirit wrappings by exerting certain muscles of the leg. Some men who have practiced this trick for scientific purposes, like Professor Schiff of Florence, are able to imitate almost all the various knockings generally ascribed to ghosts and spirits. The public performances of Mr. Chauncey Burr in New York gave very striking illustrations of this power, and a Mr. Shadrach Barnes wrapped with his toes to perfection. In a large number of cases, such phenomena appear in connection with persons who suffer of some nervous disease, and then the knockings are, of course, produced unconsciously, and may be accompanied by evidences of exceptional powers. It need not be added, however, that the two symptoms are not necessarily of the same nature. Generally, the mechanical knockings precede the development of ecstatic visions. A girl of eleven years, the child of humble Alsatian parents, presented, in 1852, this succession of symptoms very strikingly. The child had a habit of falling asleep at all hours. At once, mysterious knockings began to perform a dance or a march, and continued daily for more than an hour. After some time, the poor girl began, also, to talk in her sleep, and to converse with the knocking agent. She would order him to beat a tattoo, or to play a quick step, and immediately it was done. The directions of bystanders, even when not uttered, but merely formed earnestly in their mind, were obeyed in like manner. Finally, the child, getting no doubt worse, and unmercifully excited by the crowds of curious people who thronged the house, 
began to admonish her audience and to preach and pray. During these exhortations, no knockings were heard, but she became clairvoyant and recognized all the persons present, even with her eyes closed. She fancied that a black man with a red shawl produced the knockings and delivered the speeches. Her clairvoyance became at last so striking that her case excited the deepest interest of persons in high social position, and several physicians examined it with great care. Her disease was declared to be neurosis celiaca. Magicon, 5, 274. A very peculiar and utterly inexplicable phenomenon belonging to this class of ghostly appearances is the complete removal of persons by an unseen power. The idea of such occurrences must have been current among the Jews, for when, quote, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. End quote. Second Kings, two eleven. The sons of the prophets did not at once resign themselves, but sent fifty strong men to seek him, quote, lest peradventure the Spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. End quote. Verse 16. In the New Testament, the same mysterious removal is mentioned in the case of Philip, after his interview with the Ethiopian, whom he baptized. Quote, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and Philip was found at Azotus. End quote. Acts eight, thirty nine and forty. What in these cases was done by divine power is said to be occasionally the work of an unknown and unseen force. Generally, no doubt, men or children lose themselves by accident, either when they are already from illness or other cause in a state of semi-consciousness, or when they become so bewildered and frightened by the accident itself that they fancy they must have been carried away by a mysterious power. The best authenticated case is reported in Beaumont, page 65. An Irish steward, crossing a field, saw in it a large company feasting, and was invited to join their meal. One of them, however, warned him in a whisper not to accept anything that should be offered. Upon his refusal to eat, the table vanished, and the men were seen dancing to a merry music. He was again invited to join, and when he refused, all disappeared, and he found himself alone. He hurried home, thoroughly terrified, and fainted away in his room. During the night he dreamt, or really saw, that one of the mysterious company appeared at his bedside and announced to him that if he dare leave the house on the following day, he would be carried away. He remained at home till the evening, when, thinking himself safe, he stepped across the threshold. Instantly his companions saw him with a rope around his body, hurried away so fast that they could not follow. At last they meet a horseman, whom they request by signs to arrest the unhappy victim. He seizes the rope and receives a smart blow, but rescues the steward. 
Lord Orrery desired to see the man, and when the latter presented himself before the earl, he reported that another knightly visitor had threatened him as before. He was, thereupon, placed in a large room under the guard of several stout men, a number of distinguished persons, two bishops among them, went constantly in and out. In the afternoon he was suddenly lifted into the air. A famous boxer, Greatrice, who had been specially engaged to guard him, and another powerful man seized him by the shoulders, but he was dragged from their grasp, and for some time carried about high above their heads, till at last he fell into the arms of some of his keepers. During the night the same apparition stood once more by his bedside, inviting him to drink of a grey porridge, which would cure him of all ills and protect him against further violence. He suffered himself to be persuaded, when the visitor made himself known as a former friend who had to attend those mysterious meetings in punishment of the dissolute life he had led upon earth, and who now wished to save another unhappy fellow-being from a like sad fate. At the same time, he reminded him of his neglect to pray, and then disappeared. The steward speedily recovered from his fright, and was no further molested. There can be little doubt that the man was ill at ease in body and in conscience, and that this double burden was too heavy to bear for his mind. His thoughts became disordered till he felt an apparently external power stronger than his own will, and thus not only imagined strange visions, but actually obeyed erratic impulses of his diseased mind, as if they were acts of violence from without. A favorite pastime of these pseudo-ghosts is the throwing of stones at the buildings, or even into the rooms, of those whom they wish to annoy. Good Cotton Mather loved to tell stories of such perverse proceedings, and states at length the sufferings of George Walton at Portsmouth in 1682. Invisible hands threw such a hailstorm of stones against his house that the door was burst open, although the inhabitants, when hit by the stones, only felt a slight touch. Then the stones began to fly about inside, and to destroy the window panes from within. When picked up by some of the witnesses, they proved to be burning hot. They were marked and placed upon a table, whereupon they commenced to fly about once more. It is characteristic of the whole proceeding that the only person really injured by the operation was the owner of the house, a Quaker. The learned author delights also in recitals of children who were plagued by evil spirits, having forks and knives, pins and sharp scissors stuck into their backs, and whose food, at the moment when it was to be carried from the plate to the mouth, flew away, leaving yarn, ashes, and vile things to reach the palate. At other times, the disturbance assumes a somewhat more dignified form, and appears as the ringing of bells. Thus, Baxter tells us of a house at Colne Priory in Essex, where, for a time, every morning at two o'clock, a large bell was heard, 
while in the parish of Wilcott a smaller bell waked the vicar night after night with its tinkling, and yet could not be heard outside of the dwelling. Physicians know very well how readily the pressure of blood to certain vessels in the head produces the impression of the ringing of bells, and experience tells us how easily men are made to believe that they see or hear what others assure them is seen or heard by everybody. Even the great John Wesley seems not to have been fully convinced of the purely natural character of such disturbances, when they annoyed his venerable father at Epworth Rectory, and Dr. Priestley, a calm and cautious writer, says of these phenomena, quote, It is perhaps the best authenticated and the best told story of the kind that is anywhere extant, on which account, and to exercise the ingenuity of some speculative person, I thought it not undeserved of being published. End quote. It seems that in 1716 the rectory became the scene of strange disturbances, which were at first ascribed to one of the minister's enemies, Geoffrey. The inmates heard an incessant walking about, sighing and groaning, cackling and crowing. A handmill was set whirling around by invisible hands, and the amen with which Wesley's father ended the family prayer was accompanied by a noise like thunder. Even the faithful watchdog was disturbed, and his instinct overawed, for he sought refuge with men, and barked furiously, till his excitement rose to a state resembling madness. He even anticipated the coming of the disturbance, and announced it by his intense agitation. The subject is one of extreme difficulty, because of the large number of cases in which all such disturbances have been clearly traced to the agency of dissatisfied servants, hidden enemies, or envious neighbors, whose sole purpose was a desire to drive the occupant from his house, or to diminish its value. It is characteristic of human nature that the cunning and the skill displayed on such occasions, even by ignorant servants and awkward rustics, are perfectly amazing, a fact which proves anew the assertion of old divines that the devil is vastly better served than the Lord of Heaven. Even the best authenticated case of such mysterious disturbances, Kerner's so-called Seeress of Preverst, is not entirely free from all suspicion. Mrs. Hauff, a lady of delicate health, great nervous irritability, and a mind which was, to say the least, not too well balanced, became the patient of Dr. Justinus Kerner in southern Germany. Besides her mysterious power to reveal unknown things, to read the future, and to prescribe for herself and others, of which mention has been made before, she was also pursued by every variety of strange noises. Plates and glasses, tables and chairs were violently thrown about in the house in which she lived. A medicine file rose slowly into the air and had to be brought back by one of the bystanders, and an easy chair was lifted up to the ceiling but came down again quite gently. 
the suffering woman was the only one who knew the cause of these phenomena. She ascribed them all to a dark spirit, Balon's companion, who appeared to her as a black column of smoke with a hideous head, and whose approach oppressed even some of the bystanders, especially the patient's sister. He was not content with disturbing Mrs. Hauff only, but carried his wantonness even into the homes of distant friends and kinsmen. A pious minister, who frequently visited the poor sufferer, was contagiously affected by the ill-fated atmosphere of her house. Night after night he was waked up by a bright spirit who coughed and sighed and sobbed in his presence till a fervent prayer drove him away. If the poor divine, however, prayed only faintly or entertained doubts in his heart, the spirit mocked him with increased energy. Later, even the minister's wife succumbed, saw the same luminous appearances and heard the same mysterious noises, till the whole matter was suddenly brought to an end by an amulet. To this class of occurrences belongs also the experience of the Rev. Dr. Phelps of Stratford, Connecticut. One fine day he found, upon returning from church, that all the doors of his house which he had carefully locked, were open, and everything in the lower rooms in a state of boundless confusion. Nothing, however, had been stolen. In the upper story, a room was found to be occupied by eight or ten persons diligently reading in an open Bible, which each one held close to his face. Upon examination, these readers were discovered to be bundles of clothes, carefully and most cunningly arranged so as to represent living beings. Everything was cleared away, and the room was locked, but in three minutes the clothing, which had been put aside, disappeared, and when the door was opened, the same scene was presented. For seven long months, the house was haunted by most extraordinary phenomena. Noises of every kind were heard by day as well as by night. Utensils and window panes were broken before the eyes of numerous witnesses by invisible hands and the son of the house, eleven years old, was bodily lifted up and carried away to some distance. The most searching inquiry led to no result, until at last Dr. Phelps, almost in despair, applied to some spiritualists, and in consequence of the hints he received, was enabled to bring the disturbances to a speedy end. Reckenberg, page 58. Stone throwing seems to be a favorite amusement with eastern ghosts also. At least we are told that it is quite frequent in the western part of the island of Java, where the Sunda people live amid gigantic mountains and still active volcanoes. They believe in good and evil spirits and are firmly convinced that constant intercourse is kept up between earth-born men and heavenly beings. The whole Indian archipelago is filled with the latter and hence the throwing of stones sand and gravel 
by invisible hands, has a name of its own. It is called Gunda Rua. Some thirty years ago, a German happened to be assistant resident at Suma Dang in the service of the Dutch government. His wife had taken a fancy to a native child ten years old, who was allowed to go in and out the house at will. One morning, during the German's absence, the child's white dress was found to be soiled all over with red betel juice, and at the moment when her patroness made this discovery, a stone fell apparently from the ceiling at her feet. The same phenomenon was repeated over and over again, till the lady, in her distress, appealed to a neighboring native sovereign who promised his assistance. He sent immediately a large force of armed men, who surrounded the house and watched the room. Nevertheless, the red spots reappeared, and stones fell as before. Towards evening, a Mohammedan mufti of high rank was sent for, but he had scarcely opened his Koran to read certain sentences for the purpose of exorcising the demons, when the sacred book was hurled to one side and the lamp to another. The lady took the child to the prince's residence to spend the night there, and no disturbance occurred. But when her husband, for whom swift messengers had been sent out, returned on the following day, the same trouble occurred. The child was spit at with betel juice, and stones kept falling from on high. Soon the report reached the governor-general at Breitensorg, who thereupon sent a man of great military renown, a Major Michiels, to investigate the matter. Once more the house was surrounded by an armed force, even the neighboring trees were carefully guarded, and the major took the little girl upon his knees. In spite of all these precautions, her dress was soon covered with red spots, and stones flew about as before. No one, however, was injured. They were gathered up, proved to be wet or hot, as if just picked up in the road, and at night filled a huge box. The same process continued when a huge sheet of linen had been stretched from wall to wall so as to form an inner ceiling under the real ceiling, and now not only stones but also fruit from the surrounding trees, freshly gathered, and mortar from the kitchen, fell into the newly formed tent. At the same time, the furniture was repeatedly disturbed, tumblers and wine-glasses tossed about, and marks left on the large mirror as if a moist hand had been passed over the surface. The marvelous occurrences were duly reported to the home government, and the king, William the Second ordered that no pains should be spared to clear up the matter. But no explanation was ever obtained. Only the fact was ascertained that similar phenomena had been repeatedly observed in other parts of the island also, and were considered quite ordinary occurrences by the natives. Certain families, it may be added, claim to have inherited from their ancestors the power to make themselves invisible, a gift which is almost invariably accompanied 
by the Gunda Roa. As these native families gradually die out, the symptoms of the latter also disappear more and more. There is no doubt that here, as in the Russian Pogan, cursed places which are haunted by ghosts, the belief in such appearances, bequeathed through long ages from father to son, has finally obtained a force which renders it equal to reality itself. Reason is not only biased, but actually held bound. The mind is wrought up to a state of excitement in which it ceases to see clearly, and finally visions assume an overwhelming force, which ends in symptoms of what is called magic. The same law applies, for instance, to the ancient home of charmers and magicians, the land of the Nile, where also the studies of the ancient magi have been assumed by a succession of learned men till they were taken up by fanatic Mohammedans, whose creed arranges invisible beings, angels, demons, and others in regular order, and assigns them a home in distinct parts of the universe. It is not without interest to observe that even Europeans, after a long residence in the Orient, become deeply imbued with such notions, and men like Bale St. John, in his account of magic performances which he witnessed, do not seem able to remain altogether impartial. One of the most remarkable phenomena belonging to this branch of magic is the appearance of living or recently deceased persons to friends or supplicants. The peculiarity in this case consists in the constantly changing character of the appearance. The double, as it is called, is the vision of the dying man which appears to others or to his own senses. The former class of cases was well known in antiquity, for Pythagoras already had, according to popular report, appeared to numerous friends before he died. Herodotus and Maximus Tyrius state both that Aristeus sent his spirit into different lands to acquire knowledge and Epimenides and Hernestinus from Claromenae were popularly believed to be able to visit, when in a state of ecstasy, all distant countries, and to return at pleasure. St. Augustine also states, Sermon 123, that he himself had appeared to two persons who had known him only by reputation, and advised them to go to Hippons in order to obtain their health there by the intercession of St. Stephen. They really went to the place and recovered from their disease. At another time his form appeared to a famous teacher of eloquence in Carthage and explained to him several most difficult passages in Cicero's writings. De cura pro mortuis, chapter 2. The saints of the Catholic Church, having possessed the gift of being in several places at once, apparently so very generally, that the miracle has lost its interest, except where peculiar circumstances seem to suggest the true explanation. Such was, for instance, the last-mentioned case, recited by St. Augustine, De Sive Dei, 1, 8, chapter 18. Prystantius 
requested a philosopher to solve to him some doubts, but received no answer. The following night, however, when Prystantius lay awake, troubled by his difficulties, he suddenly saw his learned friend standing by his bedside, and heard from his lips all he desired to know. Upon meeting him next day, he inquired why he had been unwilling to explain the matter in the daytime, and thus caused himself the trouble of coming at midnight to his house. I never came to your house, was the reply, but I dreamt that I did. Here was very evidently a case of magic activity on the part of the philosopher, whose mind was, in his sleep, busily engaged in solving the propounded mystery, and thus affected not himself only, but his absent friend likewise. The story of Dr. Don's vision is well known, and deserves all the more serious attention, as his candor was above suspicion, and his judgment held in the highest esteem. He formed part of an embassy sent to Henry the Fourth of France, and had been two days in Paris, thinking constantly and anxiously of his wife, whom he had left ill in London. Towards noon he suddenly fell into a kind of trance, and when he recovered his senses, related to his friends, that he had seen his beloved wife pass him twice, as she walked across the room, her hair disheveled and her child dead in her arms. When she passed him the second time, she looked sadly into his face, and then disappeared. His fears were aroused to such a degree by this vision, that he immediately dispatched a special messenger to England, and twelve days later he received the afflicting news that on that day and at that hour his wife had, after great and protracted suffering, been delivered of a stillborn infant. Beaumont, page 96. In Magnish's excellent work on sleep, we find page 180, the following account. Quote, a Mr. H. went one day, apparently in the enjoyment of full health, down the street, when he saw a friend of his, Mr. C., who was walking before him. He called his name aloud, but the latter pretended not to hear him, and steadily walked on. H., hastened his steps to overtake him, but his friend also hurried on, and thus remained at the same distance from him. Thus the two walked for some time, till suddenly Mr. C. entered a gateway, and when Mr. H. was about to follow, slammed the door violently in his face. Perfectly amazed at such unusual conduct, Mr. H. opened the door and looked down the long passage, upon which it opened, but saw no one. Determined to solve the mystery, he hurried to his friend's house, and there, to his great astonishment, learnt that Mr. C. had been confined to his bed for some days. It was not until several weeks later that the two friends met at the house of a common acquaintance. Mr. H. told Mr. C. of his adventure, and added laughingly that having seen his double, he was afraid Mr. C. would not live long. These words were received by all with hearty laughter, but only a few days after this meeting, the unfortunate friend was seized with a violent illness, to which he speedily succumbed. 
End quote. What is most remarkable, however, is that Mr. H. also followed him, quite unexpectedly, soon to the grave. Whatever may have been the nature of the event itself, it cannot be doubted that the minds of both friends were far more deeply impressed by its mysteriousness than they would probably have been willing to acknowledge to themselves, and that the nervous excitement thus produced brought out an illness lurking already in their system, and rendered it fatal. A very remarkable case was that of a distinguished diplomat, related by A. Moritz in his Psychology. He was lying in bed, sleepless, when he noticed his pet dog becoming restless, and apparently disturbed to the utmost by a rustling and whisking about in the room, which he heard but could not explain. Suddenly a kind of white vapor rose by his bedside, and gradually assumed the outline and even the features of his mother. He especially noticed a purple ribbon in her cap. He jumped out of bed and endeavored to embrace her, but she fled before him and as suddenly vanished, leaving a bright glare at the place where she had disappeared. It was found afterwards that at that hour, ten o'clock a.m., the old lady had been ill unto death, lying still and almost breathless on her couch. She had felt the anguish of death in her heart, and had thought so anxiously of her son and her sister that her first question when she recovered was whether she had not perhaps been visited by the two persons who had thus occupied her whole mind. It was also ascertained that, contrary to a life's habit, she had on that day worn a purple ribbon in her nightcap. A German professor once succeeded in establishing the connection which undoubtedly exists between the will of certain persons and their appearance to others. He had only been married a year in 1823, when he was compelled to leave his wife and to undertake a long and perilous journey. Once, sitting in a peculiarly sad and dejected mood, alone in a room of his hotel, he longed so ardently for the society of his wife that he felt in his heart as if, by a great effort of will, he should be able to see her. He made the effort, and behold, he saw her sitting at her work-table, busily engaged in sewing, and himself, as was his habit, on a low footstool by her side. She tried to conceal her work from his eyes. A few days later, a messenger reached him, sent by his wife, who was in great consternation and anxiety. On that day, she also had suddenly seen her husband seated by her side, attentively watching her at work and continuing there till her father entered the room, upon which the professor had instantly disappeared. When he returned to his house, he made minute inquiries as to the work he had seen in the hands of his wife, and this was of such peculiar character as to exclude all ideas of a mere dream on his part. Here also the supreme will of the professor must have endowed him for the moment with exceptional powers, enabling him, 
to make himself visible to his wife, while the latter, with the ardent love which bound her to her husband, was at the same moment sympathetically excited, and thus enabled to second his will, and to behold him as she was accustomed to see him most frequently. Owen, in his Footfalls on the Boundary of Another World, reports fully a remarkable case here repeated only in outline. Robert Bruce, thirty years old, served as mate on board a merchant vessel on the line between Liverpool and St. John in New Brunswick. When the ship was near the banks, he was one day about noon busy calculating the longitude, and thinking that the captain was in his cabin, the next to his own. He called out to him, How have you found it? Looking back over his shoulder, he saw the captain writing busily at his desk, and as he heard no answer, he went in and repeated his question. To his horror, the man at the desk raised his head and revealed to him the face of an entire stranger, who regarded him fixedly. In a state of great excitement, he rushed to the upper deck, where he found the captain and told him what had occurred. Thereupon, both went down. There was no one in the cabin, but on the captain's slate an unknown hand had written these words, Steer Northwest. No effort was spared to solve the mystery. The whole vessel was searched from end to end, but no stranger was discovered. Even the handwriting of every member of the crew was examined, but nothing found resembling in the least degree the mysterious warning. After some hesitation, the captain decided, as nothing was likely to be lost by so doing, to obey the behest, and ordered the helmsman to steer northwest. A few hours later, they encountered the wreck of a vessel fastened to an iceberg, with a large crew and a number of passengers, in expectation of certain death. When the unfortunate men were brought back by the ship's boats, Bruce suddenly started in utter amazement, for in one of the saved men he recognized, by dress and features, the person he had seen at the captain's desk in the cabin. The stranger was requested to write down the words, Steer Northwest, and when the words were compared with those still standing on the slate, they were identical. Upon inquiry, it turned out that the shipwrecked man had at noon fallen into a deep sleep, during which he had seen a ship approaching to their rescue. When he had been waked, half an hour later, he had confidently assured his fellow sufferers that they would be rescued, describing even the vessel that was to come to their assistance. Words cannot convey the amazement of the unfortunate men when they saw, a few hours afterwards, a ship bear down upon them which bore all the marks predicted by their companion, and the latter assured Robert Bruce that everything on board the vessel appeared to him perfectly familiar. Cases in which men have been seen at the same time at two different places are not less frequent, though here the explanation is much less easy. A French girl, Emilie Saguier, 
had even to pay a severe penalty for such a peculiarity. She was continually met with at various places at once, and as she could not give a satisfactory excuse for being at one place when her duties required her to be at another, she was suspected of sad misconduct. She lived as governess in a boarding school in Livonia, and the girls of the institute saw her at the same time sitting among them and walking below in the garden by the side of a friend, and not unfrequently two Miss Sagays would be seen standing before the blackboard, looking exactly alike and performing the same motions, although one of them only wrote with chalk on the board. Once, while she was helping a friend to lace her dress behind, the latter looked into the mirror, and to her horror saw two persons standing there, whereupon she fell down fainting. The poor French girl lost her place not less than nineteen times on account of her double existence. Owen, Footfalls, etc., page 348. Occasionally, this double appears to others at the same time that it is seen by the owner himself. Thus, the Empress Elizabeth of Russia was seen by a Count O and the Imperial Guards, seated in full regalia on her throne, in the throne room, while she was lying fast asleep in her bed. The vision was so distinct, and the terror of the beholders so great, that the Empress was actually waked, and informed of what had happened by her lady-in-waiting, who had herself seen the whole scene. The dauntless Empress did not hesitate for a moment. She dressed hastily, and went to the throne room. When the doors were thrown open, she saw herself, as the others had seen her, but so far from being terrified like her servants, she ordered the guard to fire at the apparition. When the smoke had passed away, the hall was empty, but the brave Empress died a few months later, B. L. Aus Prevost, 5, page 92. Jung Stilling mentions another striking illustration. A young lieutenant, full of health and in high spirits, returns home from a merry meeting with old friends. As he approaches the house in which he lives, he sees lights in his room and to his great terror, himself, in the act of being undressed by his servant. As he stands and gazes in speechless wonder, he sees himself walk to his bed and lie down. He remains for some time dumbfounded and standing motionless in the street, till at last a dull, heavy crash arouses him from his reverie. He makes an effort, goes to the door, and rings the bell. His servant, who opens the door, starts back, frightened, and wonders how he could have dressed so quickly and gone out, as he had but just helped him to undress. When they enter the bedroom, however, they are both still more amazed, for there they find a large part of the ceiling on the bed of the officer, which is broken to pieces by the heavy mortar that had fallen down. The young lieutenant saw in the warning a direct favor of providence, and lived henceforth 
so as to show his gratitude for this almost miraculous escape. Genseitz, page 105. Not unfrequently, the seeing of a double is the result of physical or mental disease. Persons suffering of catalepsy are especially prone to see their own forms mixing with strange persons, who people the room in which they are confined. Insanity also very often begins with the idea that the patient's own image is constantly by his side, accompanying him like his shadow wherever he goes, and finally irritating him beyond endurance. In these cases, there is, of course, nothing at work but a diseased imagination, and with the return of health, the visions also disappear. Perhaps the most important branch of this subject is the theory, cherished by all nations and in all ages, that the dying possess at the last moment, and by a supreme effort, the mysterious power of making themselves perceptible to friends at a distance. We leave out, here also, the numerous instances told of saints, because they are generally claimed by the Catholic Church as miracles. One of the oldest, well-authenticated cases of the kind occurred at the court of Cosmo de' Medici in 1499. In the brilliant circle of eminent men, which the great merchant prince had gathered around him, two philosophers, Michael Mercatus, papal prothonotary, and Marsilius Ficinus, were prominent by their vast erudition, their common devotion to Platonic philosophy, and the ardent friendship which bound them to each other. They had solemnly agreed that he who should die first should convey to the other some information about the future state. Ficinus died first, and his friend, riding early in the morning near a window, suddenly heard a horseman dashing up to his house, checking his horse and crying out, Michael, Michael! Nothing is more true than what is said of the life to come. Mercatus immediately opened the window and saw his bosom friend riding at full speed down the road on his white horse until he was out of sight. He returned full of thought to his studies, but wrote at once to inquire about his friend. In due time, the answer came that Ficinus had died in Florence at the very moment in which Mercatus had seen him in Rome. Our authority for this remarkable account is the Cardinal Baronius, who knew Mercatus and heard it from his own lips. But the dates which he mentions do not correspond with the annals of history. He places the event in the year 1491. But Michel de Mercati was papal prothonotary under Sixtus V, 1585-90, and could, therefore, not have been the friend of Ficinus, the famous physician and theologian, who was one of Savonarola's most distinguished adherents. Nor can we attach much weight to the old ballads of Roland, which recite in touching simplicity the anguish of Charlemagne 
when he heard from afar the sound of his champion's horn imploring him to come to his assistance, although the two armies were at so great a distance from each other that when the emperor at last reached the ill-fated valley of Roncival, his heroic friend had been dead for some days. Calderon depicts in like manner, but with the peculiar coloring of the Spanish devotee, how the dying Eusebio calls his absent friend Alberto to his bedside to hear his last confession, and how the latter, obeying the mysterious summons, hastens there to fulfill his solemn promise. A well-known occurrence of this kind is reported by Cotton Mather as having taken place in New England. On May 2, 1687, at five o'clock a.m., a young man called Beacon, then living in Boston, suddenly saw his brother, whom he had left in London, standing before him in his usual costume, but with a bleeding wound in his forehead. He told him that he had been foully murdered by a reprobate who would soon reach New England. At the same time, he described minutely the appearance of his murderer, and implored his brother to avenge his death, promising him his assistance. Towards the end of June, official information reached the colony that the young man had died on May 2nd at five o'clock a.m. from the effects of his wounds. But here also several inconsistencies diminish the value of the account. In the first place, the narrator has evidently forgotten the difference in time between London and Boston in America, or he has purposely falsified the report in order to make it more impressive. Then the murderer never left his country, although he was tried for his crime, escaped the penalty of death by the aid of influential friends. It is, however, possible that he may have had the intention of seeking safety abroad at the time he committed the murder. End of section 8